Good morning, everybody. I welcome you all to uh, the first session of the second day of international conference uh, held at uh, Nalanda University. We have very interesting line of presentations uh, uh, linking uh, the Indian philosophy literature with that of the world literature. Uh, in this row, we have, uh, we have our first presenter, Ms. May Thu Thu Chao. She is a postgraduate scholar uh, of world literature in her third semester at School of Languages and Literature Humanities at Nalanda University. She's going to speak on Kalidasa's works in conceptualizing world literature, a study of Abhigyan Shakuntalam and Ritu Samhara. Uh, each speaker will get about 10 minutes and we leave about five minutes for discussion. Good morning. To date, I would like to present about Kalidasa's work in conceptualizing world literature. At there, Hang Shakuntala West Foundation is a myth of eco-criticism in world literature, and Hang Ritu Samharad West portrait in environment and humanities. Kalidasa's work significantly impacted on world literature through the depiction of nature as a valuable cultural reference. In his works, nature was portrayed as a powerful symbol which transcends cultural and linguistic boundaries by translated into many languages and making cross-cultural literary exchange. In his way, he contributed to the development of eco-critical thought in literature in conceptualizing world literature from an Indian perspective. Kalidasa got a unique position in not only in Sanskrit literature, but also in world literature as a significant poet and playwright in the ecology aesthetics. Kalidasa's contribution of the ecology, ecology aesthetic impacted on the other writers and poets' experience on ecology aesthetics also. As the advocate, it can be observed in their arts. At first, I want to discuss about Kalidasa's idea of the eco-sensibility in world literature. He is well known for his greatly poetic, beauty, and mastery of Sanskrit language in his poetry, dramas, and literature. He is one of the figures who created that nature has been celebrated as a powerful thing in literature since the ancient time. Therefore, he is also regarded as the naturalist poet, as his influence in Indian literature and culture. Therefore, Thakur referred to him as the Shakespeare of India. By portraying nature as metaphor, source of inspiration, and patron of the narratives, he depicted nature as a theme in his works. Another fact is his portrait of ecosensibility were not limited in a particular time and space. Therefore, he were, those were relevant to all the readers across the world. In fact, though the concept of eco-criticism in literature was articulated in later, since the ancient time, Kalidasa's idea of ecology started had reflected on his works. And the other part is eco-criticism in Shakuntala. Shakuntala debated love and romance and nature and environment by associating with the cultural and mythological elements. These elements mirror the plate in the engagement with the eco critical themes. In the story, the will of the depiction of natural beauty of the Hamidish highlighted the bestial equipped environment with the engagement of blooming flowers, sweet scents, breeze, and melodious bird scene. Therefore, those were focused on the beauty of nature set with the eco critical themes of appreciating the nature. And Kalidasa portrays Shakuntala as a daughter of nature by striking a symbiotic relationship with nature. In Kalidasa's portrait, Shakuntala was like a goddess of forest and her dwelling place. And she was spiritually attached with the trees, creepers, and blackbirds. In at one, Shakuntala said Anushura that she is my sister. Why shouldn't I give her water? In this sense, she watered the flowers because she considered the flowers as her sister. In this way, Kalidasa revealed the nature aesthetically and romantically by associating Shakuntala with nature. In addition, the portrait of flowers and trees supported as metaphor for, for the feeling of the Kalidasa's character and the beauty of their life. For instance, 
Lotus was represented as the purity and beauty of Shakuntala, and the deer symbolized innocence and vulnerability. In this way, nature was represented as metaphors and symbols that mirror the spiritual and thematic elements of the story by Kalidasa's eco-sensibility. And the other part is eco-criticism in Ritu Samharat. It's in English version, it is called the cycle of seasons. Kalidasa was the first poet who describes about all six Indian citizens in a poetry. It was Ritu Samharat that was completely based on the ecological aspect in the changing of the season. The cycle of seasons always bring different beauties of the environment. At the end of each season, both living beings and non-living beings' lifestyle change in a unique way. Moreover, his choices of language can reflect his unique perspective on the changing seasons and ecosensibilities. For example, in summer, the results of the extreme heat, the forest is fire wide lit. At that time, the wild animals run away from the forest to the bank of the river with their panning bodies. He pointed out the fact that even being the wild animals know how to, how to do in their situation, and they can be friends even to their enemies in a certain situation. It was portrayed not only the interconnection with the living beings and also represented the ecological perspectives through the elements such as lotus in the bone friendliness of flowers. In the rainy season, he compares the world with a kind, and he also appreciated autumn as the bride of all season. In this way, Kalidasa used metaphor and personification by interpreting each season of their natural beauties. And throughout the entire poem, there are numerous elements which are significantly described based on ecology. Kalidasa's uh, was are uh, also translated into numerous languages. Actually, it's not only into English, but also translated into French, German, Russian, Spanish, and many other languages. This translation helped introduce his works to the international audience and contributed to the broader interest of in the oriented themes in the Western literature in 19th century. In fact, Shakuntala was translated into several languages around the world. A man then, Sir William Tom, firstly translated it into English language and published in 1789. It was regarded as the faithful translation without engaging any foreign idioms. Shakuntala was the very Sanskrit literature that was translated for the literary aesthetic to the international readers. Through the translation, Shakuntala was significantly brought and influenced the Western country, and the European readers are transported to the Indian culture through their European sensibilities. And Sir Monier William also translated Shakuntala with the title of Shakuntala or the Lost Ring. Moreover, George Foster also translated Shakuntala into German in 1791 based on Sir William's English version, and it has a strong impact on the recession of non-Western culture in Germany. And Yakov Poloskins, a Russian poet and translator, also brought Kalidasa to the Russian readers. With the support of translation, Kalidasa's influence on Russian literary circles and intellectuals. Through those translations, Kalidasa's literary works go to a larger cross-cultural exchange. In this way, Shakuntala liked Sanskrit literature and world literature. Sir William John also translated Ritu Samharat in 1792 with the title of the season's a descriptive poet. Besides him, the other translators also translated it in English version. By this translation, non-European literature and philosophy were introduced to the Western subcontinent and bridged the gap between non-European and European literary traditions. In addition, the other scholars also translated it by putting their diverse perspectives into different languages. Through those translation of Kalidasa's literary works to the West, Kalidasa's poetic tone and ecosensibility greatly impacted on the creative writers in Europe. It is also a kind of influence on world literature because world literature is mainly dominated in Europe through Eurocentric literary system. Literary system, as the evident. Godit even published an epigram about it and appreciated Kalidasa's lyrical language and depiction of nature by revealing deep emotion through nature. A German geographer and naturalist, Alexander von Humboldt, 
appreciate that, that his description of nature is greatly influenced on the mind of the people who love nature. Moreover, Kalidasa remarked ever effort that on William was what idea on literary words. The tint of nature and human's emotional reaction to nature in William was what's words were the evident of Kalidasa's influence. In his poems, lines compose a few minds above Tintil Abir. As, a, as is a landscape to a blind, blind man's eyes, fed off in lonely rooms amid the dim. It mirrors the appreciation that's drawn in the connection between emotion and nature by revealing the power of nature in the human spirit. Then his philosophical elements were also produced in Samuel Taylor College metaphysical poetic idea. From this effort discussion, Kalidasa was a great figure who contributed the Eastern literature to world literature through his profound conceptualization of human experience. Moreover, his usually depiction of the human emotion to nature in his literary beauty, and this depiction of seasons, landscapes, and human feelings on nature enhanced the holistic awareness of the reader, and it was the reasons to come into world literature. In this context, in my perspective, Thought that did not emerge the concept of world literature as Kalidasa's age. Kalidasa had the concept of universal themes with a unique perspective that offered insight on the diverse human experience to conceptualize world literature. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so we will take questions for uh, May. Um, if uh, there are questions in the audience, we may go ahead with that. Well, uh, yeah, uh, it is certainly a good paper, uh, and you have worked well on the uh, translation of uh, uh, Kalidasa's text, uh, Abhijan Shakuntalam. Uh, but somewhere, I would like to know also that, see, Kalidasa is from an Indian background. He's from India. So what about the reception of Kalidasas in the societies around India? Was there any? Because, see, there is a particular colonial situation in which people get interested into the texts of Kalidasa, and they want to translate it, and they translate it incidentally uh, in a certain situation that whether they wanted to explore the Indian theater. But what about Kalidasa's rendering of his plays, etc., uh, in the countries and the cultures nearby Indian subcontinent? For example, your own culture. Yes. Uh, would, would you explore that also? Mm -hmm. Or have you explored? Or Actually, I response? didn't explore, sir. But uh, in my country, there are so many writers also discuss about nature in their literary words. It can be influenced. They can be influenced by Kalidasa was because Kalidasa have already discussed about these things in since Asian time. Yes, sir. It can be influenced. So maybe you can work on that also because these other facts are very important. You have presented them in a new light, but. Uh, those facts are not so well known, and that is also part of the world literature. And we need to bring the marginalized discourses into the center. The margin has to come on the center. So please, uh, you may incorporate later. This is uh, just a suggestion and a com minor comment for, that, for your paper. Thank you. Yes, Maybe other questions are there? Oh, uh, hi. Uh, it was a nice presentation and very uh, beautifully presented. All the facts were there. I would just have just a small question. So you have mentioned that Kalidasa has been represented by other writers from the world in different ways. What are the arguments that you have, argumentative similarity that you have found, you know, on the basis of which you claim that he has been quoted? Uh, My argument is, uh, how uh, Shakuntalat and Rita, Sam uh, Rita Samharat uh, conceptualized world literature. And uh, because of uh, the ideas portrayed in Shakuntalat and Ritu Samharat, William was what uh, Coleridge also take his idea and put uh, in their literary words. What are those ideas? Yes, uh, meant uh, in William was what literary words uh, in his uh, 
people went to line compose a few minds affecting their orbit. He mentioned landscapes and blind men is interconnected with each other. Uh, in the line number 24 to 27, he mentioned as is a landscape to a blind man's eyes, but often in lonely rooms and mid the dim of towns and cities, I have owned to them in hours of weariness and sensation sweep. Uh, when he mentioned about the nature feature of the blind man, he cooperated with the nature's elements. This idea is came from uh, maybe it came from the Kalidasa's idea. That's why uh, I explored that uh, Williams Wordsworth's Wordsworth idea of their connection with nature is impacted by Kalidasa. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so uh, to, uh, anyone else who has questions? <coughs> I have a couple of observations regarding your presentation and also possibly a line of thought to what other people have been asking you from the audience. So you talk about, uh, uh, I mean, uh, let me ask you, you talk about a lot of translations. Uh, can you give me a timeline of those translations? Yes, it's around uh, 19th century, man. No, so see, uh, when you say 19th century, uh, aren't there any 20th century translations that you talk about? I didn't talk about 20th century. Only 19th century. Yes. So in that case, you know, when you choose a particular timeline, uh, concentrate on that. Like, why was it that Kalidasa was being translated at that point of time? What was the impetus? Uh, because of, at that time, uh, in 19, so 1791, Sir William John firstly translated Kalidasa. Mm -hmm. From this uh, translation test, it impacted on the European literature. Uh, from this uh, translation that is separate uh, to the other European languages. So you talk only about one translation? No, man. More translations? Yes. So they must be in different uh, uh, decades, or they are in the same decade? It is a little uh, different, uh, but uh, near uh, around uh, at the beginning of 18th century. Okay, so what Sorry, I man. primarily want to suggest to you that you take into uh, account the timeline of these translations, right? The first is always very important, and I agree with that, but what was the need for others to translate it further? Now, when you talk about, you somewhere spoke about Eurocentric literary system. So, do you think it was more like uh, confirming the canon kind of a process when they were translating this to fit into the broader category of world literature and world literature actually meant Western literature? Madam, can you ask me one time more? Uh huh. Can you repeat it one time? Yeah. More? So I want to say that at some point of time in your presentation, you spoke about European literary tradition. Yes. So when we take up these translations uh, of Kalidasa, which is primarily from the Indian context, uh, and translate them into a language that can belong to European literary tradition. Do you think it is a process of conforming to the canon, uh, a very desperate attempt to belong to that world literature? Uh, yes. So what is your opinion on that? Because uh, uh, even the root of world literature is came from the European literature because of the colonial effect. Uh, no, so when you say that, uh, you are automatically creating a hierarchy between literatures, right? So uh, if that hierarchy is created, then the whole colonial mindset prevails. Now, uh, especially in the 21st century, the way it is looked at is the decolonial model. So if you, um, if you read some of the decolonial theories, they will talk about non-hierarchical model between the world literature. So that might help you kind of decode your paper uh, in, uh, with better arguments, okay? So you, when you finalize it for your uh, I mean publication, so t take uh, this point also into consideration. So other uh, point that I had in mind, I, you spoke about space and time in ecology. 
can you tell me what are the theorists that you look into uh, while talking about space, while talking about uh, time? Because I did not certainly find it in your paper. Yes, sir. I, uh, at first, I write it, and later, I think it is the, the, the other, the one fact is it is too long. And the other fact is, I think it is not directly uh, related with the mind topic. That's why I remove it. No, but when you are talking about the concept, you see, uh, you say that uh, your, the literature of Kalidasa pretty much transcends uh, the boundaries of time and space. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when we talk about world literature and the nuances of it, this is one of the key elements. Mm -hmm. However, the concept of space and time has been utilized differently vis-a-vis -vis ecological concerns which I, I think you are also taking up in Kalidasa. So maybe, you know, uh, you can take up examples. Uh, so when they are talking about nature, you pick up some uh, events, you pick up some examples. But on what ground are you kind of theorizing that? Like wh why is it that you pick a particular scene from Kalidasa? and not some other scene? Why do you think you find it relevant? And what is your binding theory? Because in the absence of theoretically bad arguments, uh, it all appears like a story. So uh, when you s want to publish it, then it will be a problem. So uh, on that note, I just want to ask one more question to you, uh, or maybe two. So why do you think uh, Shakuntala is identified with nature in the context of Kalidasa? And uh, despite all the translations, this element remains that uh, Shakuntala is metaphorically uh, uh, kind of translating her image with nature. Yes, because. Uh, throughout the story, there are so many uh, about the nature. For example, forests, uh, trees, flowers are discredited. How many translated into other languages? This is the main theme of the main thing, the main elements in the story. That's why it's the but debated in other translations. Can you link it with ecofeminism? Yes. Can you? Uh, I write on my paper, but I didn't discuss men because okay. it would be too long. Sure, sure. I sure. That so that is one point because see, ecofeminism talks about uh, the connect between nature and women, yes. where they kind of become identical. So I think these are some of the points also uh, in in terms of uh, you know universality quotient. That also is something that you should highlight on. So just one quick question and last. So when you say that you want to uh, talk about Kalidasa's work in conceptualizing world literature, why do you do that? Because as far as I understand, he is the very first person who uh, contributes uh, about the nature in literature, about the nature and interconnection with the characters in literature. He is the very first person uh, in the literary world. But most of the literature produced at that point of time uh, have a lot of uh, ecological concerns. Yes, but he was the first, very first person, as far as I know. That also is an argument you will have to substantiate if you plan to publish. Okay. So I think uh, uh, those are uh, sufficient uh, inputs that I can give you. If others have any input that they want to add in uh, her paper, Anyone else who wants to add something on May's paper and make a contribution? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next paper. Okay, thank you so much, May. Thank you. Uh, I will now invite Singe uh, Dema, who is also a postgraduate student uh, in world literature in the School of Languages and Literature Humanities at Nalanda University. She's going to talk about Bhutanese perspectives on world literature, a cultural and GNH philosophy perspective. Uh, 
good morning, good sangpo, and namaste. And if I briefly say this, uh, the way I introduce myself is, can also be considered as world literature. And I can also say this room is itself a world literature because there is diverse uh, culture people present here. It's like I'm from Bhutan, I'm representing Bhutanese, and here ma'ams are wearing saris, they're representing Indian culture, and my friends are like from Indonesian, Malaysian, America, they're also presenting their own culture, so this is also considered as world literature. But my paper basically will focus more on Bhutanese perspective on world literature from culture and GNH philosophy. And before that, uh, it's very important to know the context because there are many people who don't know what is world literature. If I directly move towards the perspective uh, given by Bhutanese, then they won't know if uh, it's not, it's not used, uh, useful because the people who don't understand the concept of world literature. So if I briefly say, uh, uh, talk about the world literature, li uh, wo literature itself is like uh, divided into two concepts. First, literature in its literary meaning, it uh, means any lit uh, written text is considered as literature. It's like novel poems and all. But when we come to the world literature perspective, world literature which are produced, uh, world literature is like, it's not, uh, world litera literature is never simply a given, but performatically and metrically instituted by authors, translator, publisher, academic, critic, and readers. The example can be based on Pessoa and uh, James Coetzee's work, whereas James Coetzee's work is well known because he is like novel earned person. So he is like, before his work are published, he's well known and famous person. Whereas Pessoa's work is like less known because he, before he became famous, he died. And his work are like known to the world because uh, help of the publisher, critic, and translator who combine all his manuscript and uh, formed into a book, uh, like uh, one of the book is the book of discourse. So it is not uh, when he, uh, it's not basically Pessoa who produced the book, it is the system who, uh, which produced the book. So it is uh, one kind of difference. Then if I move directly into world literature, here I, before I went into my own pr uh, Buddhist perspective, I have brought Duration who talks about the world literature. Uh, uh, here, these are the four Duration who have talked about the world literature. First, was, uh, first one is Gothi. He talks, uh, he says that world literature is in making and it's in process. He, say, uh, he never said the world literature is fully performed. When, uh, this is when he was alive. It was during his era, time period, when he says world literature is making because he was uh, reading uh, this Chinese literature translated into other forms or the French literatures. And whereas H.M. Postnet says that world literature is evolving, uh, Evolving theory, along with uh, he uh, mainly focuses his world literature concepts and says that it is in the middle stage in evolving of literature parallel to social evolution from tribe to city to empire and finally to the modern nation. Here he brings his theory, uh, uh, this concept of world literature with the help of the uh, Daiwan uh, theory of this evolution and political theory of Herbert uh, economic political theory of Herbert Spencer, where he relate it and said that world literature is being exists because of the humans, uh, human civilization getting involved. World literature exists because it shows how he, uh, human civilization are getting involved in parallel way. Whereas Zen Zendo uh, basically con concept, uh, conceptualizes world literature based on the theory that translation is the main reason that world literature exists. And for that, he says that uh, we need a common lingua franca. For him, he says that English can be one of the lingua franca because English is basically used mostly around the world. But he questioned whether the English can be world literature because the, uh, this lingua franca, because other languages are also as important as English because the Eurocentric views are uh, uh, mostly influ influencing the other part of the world. So he just said English can be one of the lingua franca which will unite the literature around the world and which can consider as the world literature. Whereas here, 
Rabindranath Tagore is like, I will relate it more into how it's like related to the Buddhist concept because world, uh, world literature for Rabindranath Tagore is mostly like related to spiritual being. How the holistic well-being of the people are connected and shown into the literature. And some of the similarities between Tagore and Buddhist conceptualization of world literature is uh, they share the, quite the same views, emphasizing the literature importance as a tool that transcends national boundaries and grows sense of unity between various culture. Yesterday, ma'am also presented her paper saying that world literature or literature is not binded by the boundary or the nation. It's beyond like, like Atma who travels soul, which travels beyond its body. So uh, Zen Zendo and Buddhist conceptualized towards the world literature is quite similar. They talk about the spiritual being, like the texts are like a spiritual which transfer beyond the boundary of the national. And they also, uh, Tagore also encouraged towards the search for external and universal man through literature, aligns with the Buddhist belief in the power of literature to pass universal human experience and values. And they also uh, recognize both of the concepts, also recognize the value of incorporating foreign thoughts and ideas. Both of the concepts says that they should take foreign ideas, but it shouldn't be just taken. Like if, if Europe, Eurocentric theory are saying this is potato, we shouldn't just say it's as potato. We should conceptualize it into different way and form into in our own, uh, own thoughts and values in a form of cultures. They also share the same notion of moving beyond narrow-minded nationalism and open-minded towards the broader uh, perspective that world uh, view as humanity within the spiritual, uh, national spiritual of the culture. Here it says that like a nation should not be confined into the concept that it is nationalism. We should protect our culture and we shouldn't bring the foreign invention or foreign idea into our literature. They both talks that they should borrow the idea from the foreign but it should be molded into our own culture or how the tradition works and it will like uh, help our own nation to develop and further enhance our idea on that concept towards the world now if i move towards the concept of uh, gross national happiness uh, which in short is gnh what is gnh GNH is gross national happiness. It is like adopted as a state policy in our country by our fourth uh, king, uh, Jimmy Singh Wanchu, in 1970s. And here, our king's vision was to, uh, first, before that, we have to know what is happiness. Happiness is associated with mental and emotional state of well-being, recognized by the positive emotion at achieve from the contentment of the intense joy. But when in our country, when we uh, our king introduced gross national happiness, GNH, uh, king, uh, he mostly focused on the gross. Gross means the collective one as a whole, not as one. Because happiness is the intense or the value given, uh, shown through the individual one. But when we talk about GNH philosophy, it look out whole of the nation or the in, uh, whole of the peoples in collective. So that is the, how uh, gross national philosophy is used or adopted at the state policy in our country. And when, when it was introduced, as I told, it was introduced in 1970s by our fourth king and how it's like, how it affect or give uh, a way through into world literature. Because world literature mostly talk about the culture, universalism, tradition, being, uh, shown through the literature, but when gross national uh, philosophy, we talk about gross national philosophy, the pillars and the nine domains also talk about how uh, like human beings, like uh, the well-being of a human beings, the mental health, and this should be uh, uh, like given more importance. And through literature, uh, the Buddhist philo uh, this authors are supposed to take that and show that to the world. For example, GNH can be integrated into literary, uh, this is like a possible uh, a way out which G, uh, GNH can give to world literature. Firstly, the philosophy of GNH can contribute to world literature by providing a framework for exploring theme related to well-being, happiness, sustainable development in Buddhist society. Then next, GNH principles can influence the way character interact with each other and their environment emphasizing the importance of holistic well-being and pursuit of happiness 
here I'm not saying that happiness doesn't exist around the world, but I'm talking about the gross national happiness which is adopted as the state uh, policy in our country. Then literature can uh, re uh, reflect the revolving nature of GNH which is happening in our country and showcase the dynamic aspect of country's socio-economic development and potential alternative it offers for the higher well-being and sustainability. Then also it can also look to as to integrate into the literary narrative to explore the tension and conflict that arise when trying to align policy outcome with the principle of GNH. Here, uh, uh, GNH and the when G, uh, world literature can also look into the subjective well-being of character, the role of goodness, happiness, and the nine romans of GNH providing a deeper understanding of happiness, well-being in goodness society and other society across the world, which is aligned with how the GNH concept is uh, look up into our uh, in goodness context. Then uh, I have uh, brought the Buddh uh, Buddhism and folklore as the topic under the Buddhist uh, culture. Here, Buddhism, as we know, is like a religion. But here, I won't go into the religion aspect of Buddhism because it's talked yesterday itself. Here, I will just focus on how Buddhism as whole is focused on like well-being of the people. Uh, well-being of the people and emphasize on the culture and tradition which is uh, which should be preserved and folklore in in this in my paper is talked uh, basically on how the stories stories uh, produced into Buddhist culture have affected mostly on to producing the identity preservation of the identity happiness and like aligned with the GNH philosophy like sustainable uh, 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 this stability. Here I have given examples of four harmonious friends or the legend of Pema Lingpa, which aligns and shows the unique culture insights of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist insight and the moral lesson given to the global audience or it is possible to give a, a, a global insight to the global audience and novels such as Circle of Karma by Kinsang Choden and the Hero with Thousand Eyes by the Karma Aura because these two authors are well known among the world. And if I also, I have also brought the idea of uh, minimalistic in context of this because minimalistic, con uh, this exists before the concept of mi uh, minimalistic from the West came. Because in Buddhist philosophy, it says that the people shouldn't run after the mat materialistic well-being of, uh, of the individual because material, materialistic uh, this uh, possession is bring the suffering to us. So we should try to get this like a peace of mind. We should leave uh, leave this possession or the greed of wanting more, which is like also similar to the minimalistic because they said having less in our life will give peace of mind. But before that, when it's uh, seen through the Buddhist religion perspective, it was not given so much importance. But when it was brought in from the Western uh, Europe-centric view as minimalistic or the new form, then it is given as like, wow, it's like a bright, big, big great, great notion that it's coming and we are like open-handedly... Sangye, if I may interrupt, you have a minute to conclude. We have already exceeded your time. When uh, I would say the when a concept which is like given or brought in from the Europe centric perspective, like other part of the world uh, think that it doesn't exist, uh, exist in their culture or tradition. They say they think that it is a new concept that we have to welcome. Just like a potato which is produced from our country and give to other country and it's like packaged and brought into like a lace or the chips, then we think, wow, this is a great product, but when it is in the state of potato, we doesn't care. So, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was indeed a very well conceptualized paper and I wish we had more time to listen to you, Sange. Uh, can I have questions for Sange, please? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, um, your, um, 
you know, uh, presentation is very strong, I thought. Um, I would like to make a comment, because uh, you were talking about Buddhism, right, and its connection to world literature. You had a, a chart you showed, which was kind of explaining the landscape of world literature. Um, and you mentioned um, what Goto, Tagore, Poznet, and Zidao. Um, oh, and I was, I, I'm a, s a second year Buddhist studies, and I, I would just, I want to make kind of a suggestion. You might want to look a little more deeper into the, 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 the Buddhist philosophy in and of itself. Um, in the Buddhist uh, point of view, there's two truths, uh, relative conventional truth and absolute truth. And in terms of the chart that you showed, that kind of represents the relative truth of the concept of literature or world literature. Um, but on the absolute truth, and I know many people in the world literature department here, and I've discussed this about the whole idea of English being the, I think the main pillar of this concept of world literature. And I think in the absolute level, as a Buddhist point of view, all languages would be the same, right? And that um, it's the English, is, it's like, it's the way you translate, right? From one language to another. And the translations go both ways. Um, and we have a phrase in English, uh, lost in translation. Um, so I think it might be helpful to look at some of these terms in terms of you know, your yeah. presentation on Buddhism um, from a Buddhist philosophical point of view. Yeah, if you have anything you know, to comment on that. Buddhist philosophy is going to work on. I'm just taking the concept of Buddhist philosophy, which, uh, which is built around the spirituality, the happiness, well-being of a person or uh, of the individual. Uh, because if I go deeply into it, it's like very vast for me. So I'm just touching on the surface level. Yeah, it is true that while translating, the spirit of that book or the text is lost, and it is also discussed into uh, world literature. But I'm not going deep into it because my paper mainly focus on how the GNH or the culture of the Buddhist philosophy have conceptualized the world literature in making. But yeah, uh, it's true that while translating, the spirit of that uh, text is lost. But it's like translation is the only way the world literature can work the, uh, till now. And world literature, as I stated, is in process of making. It's not complete yet. It is like just half or like in molding shape. Mm -hmm. We take another question, yes. Thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation. Sorry, I'm slightly late for your presentation. Uh, you talked about gross national happiness, right? So there's something called GDP. Now there are people who are working on coming up with similar metrics like GNH, gross national happiness. I, I know a couple of people, uh, but they're, they're trying to quantify these metrics. Because at the end of the day, quantification matters, right, in today's time. My question to you is, OK, am I audible? OK, so I'm trying to understand whether you are quantifying this metric as well, just like GDP or any number that is very important in today's time. Quantification, I'm, ta I'm talking about the, are you only looking at this number, gross national happiness qualitatively? Or is there, is there any quantitative aspect to this metric? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. As GNH philosophy, I'm looking from the Buddhist perspective, as GNH is adopted at the state policy. And when, if you look deeper into GNH philosophy, or there are nine domains and four pillars, uh, it's like it's mainly f uh, aligned with the sustainability, like uh, what, 16? No, no, Singh, he's asking no, about yeah. the quantification aspect of GNH. Qualification. I will, quantification. Uh, yeah. not only I'll, like, I'll give you. You can give one, like happiness is an abstract idea. So if you are to measure happiness, like say, for example, if I have a TV, I am happy. So how are you going to measure? Are there indicators like that is what uh, he's asking? As of now, it is just abstract one, but in our country, mostly it's 
seen as there is no beggar or the poor people living there and like uh, it 60 percent of the forest coverage it's uh, shown as that people are like happy in our country and it's considered as gnh philosophy or the state policy is being fulfilled in con uh, in our country but uh, in bigger or larger index it's like there is no uh, qualif uh, qualification or like index to measure in the world so that's why i'm proposing that this can be one of the unexplored topic for the world literature thank you ma'am very well one presentation from your side uh, you said in part of your uh, paper that uh, we shouldn't just adopt whatever came to us but we should take what is good for our society so according to you my question is what is like what uh, what actually bhutanese culture can give to uh, world literature uh, apart from gross national happiness thank you oh, from apart from that i think it can give like like the mindset of preservation of the forest is in our country is like 60 percent of the forest coverage is needed 60 percent of the forest coverage shouldn't be touched if it's even if it's touched then we have to replace it's like double the amount if we cut thousand trees today then like two thousand trees are to be planted more because like in bhutan it's not that the development or the idea of development is not uh, like brought in it's brought in but we are uh, uh, we are keeping it as a secondary uh, se secondary aspect and primary aspect is focusing on the uh, conservation of nature being to us nature how nature give us and we are also uh, protecting is like give uh, give and take relation if we take nature as our uh, like parent figure but we are also Jema. accepting Question is how culture is transformed in the literature so that you address. How the culture, the Bhutanese culture, is found in the literature, in the perspective of world literature. Then it, uh, I, I will cite one uh, novel, it's like Circle of Karma, where the author tried to bring up all the Bhutanese perspective, like how the Bhutanese, like women are treated in the society and how the men are also tre treated. And the uh, circle of the concept of the marriage, there is like no ritual or custom of the marriage being uh, like brought in is like if men and women are together they are considered uh, like a married couple this can be also shown because in other parts of the world the like marriage ceremony is elaborated celebrated in india there is like sun sangeet haldi uh, this uh, ring ceremony and everything is happening but in our culture this kind of uh, is like limited it's not it doesn't exist at all so this can be like a new perspective. How the marriage ceremony in one part is like uh, uh, celebrated in a vast or like in wow festival kind of thing, but in Bhutan it's like a silent or it doesn't exist at all. If the man and woman are together and if they are love love each other, it's like they are married uh, the next day. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think uh, uh, we'll c close it there because uh, uh, what you are saying is not about just Bhutanese perspective. When you say that two people who love can stay together and can consider themselves married, uh, nobody in this world will def differ from, from that, especially now when Supreme Court also says that uh, single women are okay with abortion, single women can stay, they can um, have surrogacy, all those issues. So I, I think it's a, a very debatable thing to say, but uh, I have just one quick uh, observation and then you can uh, take it into history. So whenever we talk about, you're saying about gross national happiness and everybody's happy. So it creates a very utopic kind of a picture. Uh, the, the baseline of utopia is that it always embarks on homogenization. However, any kind of society does not operate on homogeneity. I, that aspect you will have to bring. So when you say everybody is happy, everybody is good, maybe uh, that, that's a very utopic imagination to kind of think about. Uh, so that aspect, I think what Deepak was also trying to say, that when you say this gross national happiness, it's not a very simple con concept when, it's tra when it translates into culture and literature. And that variation you have to bring in when you are talking about Bhutanese perspective on Rosh national happiness vis-a-vis -vis world literature. Am I right? 
Yes, so maybe those considerations you should take while framing your paper, but otherwise uh, we absolutely enjoyed your presentation. It was very good. Thank you so much. We will go ahead with the third presentation, and I request uh, the presenter to only take 10 minutes. Uh, he is Prince Kumar, and he is ex-postgraduate student of world literature in School of Languages and Literature and Humanities at Nalanda University. And his presentation is about uh, Akira Kurosawa's cinematic adaptations, analyzing the impact of his films on world literature and storytelling. Over to you, Prince. Respected Chair Professor Priyanka Tripathi, ma'am, respected professor, or scholars, and my dear friends, have a good morning. My topic for today's seminar is Akira Kurosawa's cinematic adaptation, analyzing the impact of his films on world literature and storytelling. Akira Kurosawa stands as one of the most influential and revered filmmakers in the history of cinema. A Japanese film director, a screenwriter, Kurosawa's career spanned over five decades, during which he created a body of work that not only defined Japanese cinema, but also had a profound impact on the global film industry. While deeply rooted in Japanese culture, Kurosawa's film often explored universal themes that resonated with audience worldwide. His narrative touched on the topics such as human nature, morality, justice, and the complexities of human condition, the universality, contributed to the international acclaim and appeal of his work. Here are few of his adaptation, famous adaptation of Akira Kurosawa. Rosoman, which is adapted from the two short stories by Runsuke Akutagawa, the idiot based on the Fyodor Dostoevsky, throne, throne of Blood inspired by William Shakespeare's plays Macbeth, The Lower Depth adapted from Maxim Gorky's The Lower Depth, the Hidden Fortress, influenced by William Shakespeare play Henry IV. While not every Kurosawa film is a direct adaptation, these examples showcase his diverse range from transporting, transposing Shakespeare, Shakespearean classics to reimagining crime novels and drawing inspiration from various literary sources to create cinematic masterpieces. Akira Kurosawa's adaptation were marked by significant changes and innovation that not only showcased his directorial vision, but also transformed the source material to suit the cinematic medium. Here is an analysis of the changes and innovation he brought to some of his not notable adaptations. So first uh, adaptation I am talking about is Rasoman. The Innovation which he did in this is Kurosawa innovation in Rosomon lies in the narrative structure. By presenting the same story from multiple conflicting perspectives, he challenged conventional linear storytelling. This technique added complexity to the narrative and explored the subjective of the truth. While the core narrative remains faithful to Akutakawa stories, Kurosawa's adaptation focused on the exploration of human psychology, emphasizing the impact of perspective on perception of truth. The second adaptation is Throne of Blood. The Throne of Blood, in Throne of Blood, the transport, transposition of Shakespeare's Macbeth into feudal Japan. This adaptation involved a meticulous cultural reimagining, incorporating samurai tradition and Japanese aesthetic into the narrative. Kurosawa streamlined the narrative, emphasizing the psychological descent of the main characters, the atmospheric and the minimalist approach to certain scenes added a unique intensity to the film. The third adaptation is Yozumbo. Kurosawa innovated by adopting Dashiell Hammett's detective novel Red Harvest into a samurai film. The concept of a lone hero playing two rival factions against each other showcased Kurosawa's creativity in adapting 
adapting diverse source material. The shift from a 1920s American setting to a feudal Japan involved significant cultural and thematic changes. Kurosawa transformed the narrative to fit the samurai genre while preserving, preserving the essence of Hammett's tale of manipulation and betrayal. The fourth adaptation is High and Low. Kurosawa's innovation in High and Low lies in the adaptation of Ed McBain Crime's novel King's Ransom into Japanese context. He explored social issues and class division, adding depth to the narrative. By retaining the kidnapping premise, Kurosawa shifted the setting from a typical crime genre context to a corporate boardroom. Addressing socioeconomic disparities, this change elevated the film beyond a traditional crime thriller. The fifth adaptation which I have chosen is Red Beard. Kurosawa innovated by adopting Sugaru Yamamoto's short stories into a medical drama. He explored the relationship between a stern doctor and his apprentice, intro introducing elements of mentorship and the personal growth. Kurosawa's adaptation broadened the scope of Yamamoto stories, infusing them with humanistic theme. The medical setting allowed for a profound exploration, exploration of empathy, compassion, and the doctor-patient relationship. These analysis highlights Kurosawa's ability to innovate and transform source material. His adaptations were not mere translation. They were reinterpretations that reflected his unique cinematic language, cultural sensibilities, and thematic interest. Kurosawa's willingness to take creative liberties with the source material contributed to the enduring if impact of his films and their significance in the history of cinema. Kurosawa also introduced, introduced samurai genre to the world. Kurosawa's samurai film, particularly Seven Samurai and Yuzumbu, not only revitalized the Japanese film industry, but also introduced the samurai genre to a global audience. His portrayal of the samurai as complex conflict figure challenged traditional genre convention and left a large, lasting impact on both Eastern and Western cinema. Akira Kurosawa film had a profound influence on literature globally, transcending the boundaries of cinema and inspiring writers across the culture. Here are several ways in which Kurosawa's cinematic work have left an in, uh, indelible mark on literature. So here are few techniques which I will talk about. Here are several ways in which Kurosawa's cinematic work have left an indelible mark on literature. The first one is narrative, innovation, and multiple perspective. Kurosawa's groundbreaking narrative structure in Rosomon, which presented a single story from multiple perspectives, influenced literary work. Authors began experimenting with similar narrative techniques, exploring the subjectivity of truth and em embracing multiple viewpoints to tell a single story. The second one, second one is cross, uh, cultural cross-pollination. Kurosawa's ability to adapt a stories from diverse cultural backgrounds and transpose them into Japanese context showcase the possibilities of cross-culture storytelling. This approach inspired authors to explore the fusion of cultural elements in their work in reaching narratives with a global perspective. The third is humanism and moral complexi complexity. Kurosawa's humanistic approach to a storytelling where characters grapple with moral dilemmas and the complexities of the human condition has influenced literature. Authors have been inspired to create characters with greater psychological depth exploring the gray areas of morality in their narrative. The fourth one is existential themes and philosophical inquiry. Kurosawa's exploration of existential theme and profound philosophical question has resonated with writers. His film have encouraged authors to delve into existential inquiries addressing the meaning of life, the nature of existence, and the consequences of individual choices in their literary works. The fifth is character complexity and development. Kurosawa's nuanced characterization where protagonists and antagonists are not, are not merely black and white figures, but poses intricate psychological depth, have impacted literature. Writers have sorted to create more complex and multidimensional characters mirroring the depth found in Kurosawa's film. Visual storytelling and descriptive prose. Kurosawa's mastery of visual storytelling a storytelling, vivid imagery, and cinematic poetry has influenced 
descriptive prose in literature, authors have adopted a more visual and evocative style in reaching their narratives with detailed imagery and symbolic languages. Exploration of the human condition. Kurosawa's profound exploration of the human con condition often centered around themes of life and death, and search for meaning has inspired many literary works. Writers have drawn from these thematic elements to create narrative that resonate with the universal aspect of the human experiences. Uh, impact on adaptation culture. Kurosawa's success in adapting literary works into cinematic masterpieces has contributed to bo broader adaptation culture. Authors and filmmakers globally help, have drawn inspiration from Kurosawa's adaptation, recognizing the potential for transforming literature into compelling visual narratives. Akira's Kurosawa's film have not only entertained and captivated audience, but have also served as a source of inspiration for writers seeking to push the boundaries of a storytelling in literature. His impact on global literature lies in the ability to transcend cultural barriers, ex explore universal themes, and provide a visual and narrative language that resonate with the creators across the di across diverse literary landscape. Akira Kurosawa's storytelling has left an enduring impact on literature. These are few writers who have, inspi who have inspired from Kurosawa's and his work and have created similar works. The first one is David Mitchell and his, he, uh, his book, Claude Atlas. Connection to a Kurosawa, David Mitchell has expressed admi admi admiration for Kurosawa's film, particularly Rasomon in Claude Atlas. Mitchell employs a narrative a structure reminiscent of Kurosawa's multiple perspective. The novel weaves together multiple stories across different time periods and exploring the interconnectedness of human experience. Haruki Murakami, which is quite famous these days, his novel Kafka on the Shore, connection to Kurosawa, Haruki Murakami has cited Kurosawa as an influence on his work, Kafka on the Shore, reflect Kurosawa's exploration of the surreal and the blending of ordinary with fanta fantastical. The novel also incorporates elements of Japanese culture and mythology akin to Kurosawa's engagement with Japanese tradition in his film. Akira Yasumura Shipwreck. Connection to Kurosawa, Akira Yasumura, a Japanese author, drew inspiration from Kurosawa's Rosomon for his novel Shipwreck. The narrative revolves around a group of shipwreck survivors each recounting their vision of events, echoing the theme of subjective truth explored by Kurosawa. The New York Trilogy by Paul Auster. An American author has acknowledged Kurosawa's influence on his writing. In New York Trilogy, Auster explored identity, existential themes, and the interplay between reality and fiction, themes that resonate with Kurosawa's work. Kazu Isugoro, an artist of the floating world, a uh, novel laureate in literature has uh, spoken about the influence of Japanese cinema, including Kurosawa's work on his writing, An Artist of the Floating World, explores the aftermath of the World War II in Japan, a theme reminiscent of Kurosawa's post-war narratives. While these examples may not be direct adaptation of Kurosawa's films, they illustrate how the thematic deep depth, narrative innovation, and exploration of the human condition in Kurosawa's uh, storytelling have influenced a diverse array of authors, inspiring them to incorporate similar elements into literary works. Akira Kurosawa's innovative techniques in filmmaking have transcended the boundaries of cinema, leaving a lasting impact on a, sto a storytelling in various other mediums. Here, how his techniques have influenced and inspired a storytelling beyond the films. Narrative a structure and subjectivity. Kurosawa's use of multiple perspective in Rasomon has become a literary device, inspiring authors to explore the subjectivity of truth in novel and short stories. The Rasomon effect has been replicated in literature to create narratives with unreliable narrators and conflicting viewpoints. Visual composition in graphic novels and comics. The meticulous visual composition and framing seen in Kurosawa's film have influenced graphic, graphic novelist and comic book artist. Attention to visual details, use of symbolism, and dynamic panel layouts in graphic storytelling often reflects Kurosawa's emphasis on visual storytelling. Dynamic storytelling in animation. Kurosawa's dynamic camera movement have had a profound effect on animated storytelling. Animators, particularly in Japanese anime, 
have drawn inspiration from his technique incorporating dynamic camera angles and expressive movements to enhance the visual narrative. Cross-cultural storytelling in literature. Guru Sova's ability to adapt a stories from diverse cultural background have influenced uh, the Prince, literary you have about a minute to yeah, conclude. Yeah, sure. Has influenced the literary world. Authors now engage in cross-cultural storytelling, transposing narratives to different settings while preserving the essence of the original story similarly to Kurosawa's adaptation. Uh, I would like to conclude. Uh, in conclusion, Kurosawa's technique uh, have become a source of inspiration for storytellers in literature, graphic novels, animation, theater, and other mediums. His innovative, uh, his innovative approach to storytelling, coupled with his exploration of universal themes, continue to shape and enrich narrative form across the diverse artistic expressions. Akira Kurosawa's film have not only shaped the landscape of cinema, but have also significantly impacted world literature and storytelling. His innovative approach, explore, exploration of universal themes and cultural adaptability continue to inspire storytellers, ensuring, uh, ensuring that his legacy endures as a source of creative inspiration across diverse narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prince. We now invite questions for him. Yeah. It was a very good paper, and you sparked so many questions when you talk about Kurosawa and Murakami, Ishiguro, and comics. <laughs> I like love ma manga comics like that. So, my question is on like, have you seen all these movies you have referred here? Uh, I have seen like, uh, I have extensively worked on Throne of Blood for my dissertation, and I have seen four or five movies of Akira Kurosawa, which I have chosen for this. Uh, so for all dissertation. the movies you have shown here, you have seen them? Uh, I think I have three, four movies I have seen out of uh, five. What about Seven Samurai? Uh, yeah, I have seen Seven Samurai. Oh, seven Samurai you have seen. So you have talked about the gray area of morality in your paper and in, in the context of Akira Kurosawa. So uh, if you have you, see, have you have seen Seven Samurai. So if we could ask about the ending of Seven Samurai, it would be a very specific question. The ending of Seven Samurai is when the bandits have been washed away and the peasants have uh, gone back to their fields and they just start uh, going on there with their uh, usual life and they start pay like they were not paying any uh, heed or they were not seeing them, the samurais who have just helped them as a very helping hand or important anymore. What's your takeaway on that? Like how do you feel like the gray area of morality have been portrayed in the movie? Uh, I think it's life when people, when farmers needed them, they were like the, of the utmost importance. But when everything was done and dusted, they forget about them and they are started, uh, they yeah. That's what they have depicted. I'm taking your take. Like yeah. the gray area of morality has said. So what's the gray area? How does it make a gray area? Like we are all think that they were helping hands, so they were quite affectionate towards them. That yeah, the, yeah. The, the moment they were done, they were like, okay, you are gone. You are to be gone now. So what's your take? Is what's what's according to you the more uh, gray area of morality here? Uh, I think uh, it's uh, basically what we uh, see in uh, life. People tends to, in my pers uh, from my perspective, if you say, I think when people need, they, they appreciate the thing. But when people don't need anything, they, they are just neg uh, negligible towards those things. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's the, uh, I, the, there is the, uh, people don't uh, really critically think about those things. They basically f went to maybe the flow of their life. When they need something, then they start questioning or they start having these thoughts. But when they are having easy life, they don't care about these things. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe someone would you like to ask. No? Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, well, it was a good presentation with some subtle points, but uh, that needed further elaboration, which you may do it later. But uh, one important point, whenever I think of uh, authors uh, like Murakami and we have uh, cineasts like 
Akira Kurosawa that comes to my mind that why suddenly Akira Kurosawa is being received in a particular manner in certain societies of Europe and US. What is the reason for that? And why in the Japanese society, in the Japanese filmmaking industry, Akira, Akira Kurosawa takes up the themes which are not necessarily Japanese. They might reflect some realities of the Japanese society, but those realities are also not depicted in the way Japanese have done it or have been doing it, which we see today. You have yourself presented manga, for example, and there are lots of elements in manga uh, which uh, represent somewhere the continuous symbolic elements and the uh, society, the pagan society of Japan, etc., that get represented. But in Akira Kurosawa, why these aspects are missing? Or do you find some pagan aspect which is very natural? Shintoism is very natural and Buddhism is very natural. And Shintoism more so is very natural to Japan. Why these elements appear to be missing at least uh, uh, in his movies? I will start with uh, uh, the uh, Kurosawa's have impact of Buddhism on him when uh, while I was researching for Throne of Blood. Uh, in that movie, he has shown uh, the law of karma that whatever you do, it will come back to you. So No, no, but law of karma is very much accepted in European discourse or American yeah. discourse. Yes. So the American management discourse, etc., it is there. What are, that's why I'm asking, what are, what are the Shintoic elements, which is very natural to Japan? Hmm. Yes. Okay, and related diverse, divergent representation that we find in iconography in, in, in all symbolic ways. Why are these aspects missing in Kurosawa? Mm. Sorry, sir. Right now, I cannot think about it. Maybe you can think on those lines. Yes, sure. uh, also, when you talk about very diverse theme, uh, what is your central argument of binding those themes? Because each theme in itself can be uh, a paper. <laughs> yeah. So in that sense, when you take up a presentation like this, I believe that you should have just picked up one theme and dealt with that particular theme, its reflection, its adaptation. Uh, I mean, I think that was that is something that I would like to say. I mean, I'd, I'm sure you may not have a central argument right now, but you can think it over, or if you have, you can go ahead and tell me. Basically, uh, I was looking more towards uh, adaptation and the storytelling and impact of a story, visual storytelling of Kurosawa's have on uh, present-day directors and a few writers. I was looking through that lens. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, when you were saying that, uh, that is where uh, Professor Mishra's question came into account, that when you're talking about these representations, uh, they, ca they are not very simplistic. Yeah adaptations. Uh, why do you think an author chooses a particular kind of storytelling method or a filmmaker chooses to make a story like that? All those variations you have to bring in. And in that context, I think society plays a very important role. So you have to bring in what is uh, very indigenous to Japanese society and in its reflection what has been lost or found. So okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, Prince. I now invite the next presenter, uh, Niluka and Madhu Shami, uh, who, who are uh, also uh, postgraduate students in world literature at School of Languages and Literature and Humanities at Nalanda University. Uh, they are going to talk about an, an exploratory study of Sri Lankan identity impacted on Europe in the fabric of wealth literature. Yes, please make sure that you don't exceed the time limit of 10 minutes. From the very beginning, you can plan your presentation like that. Okay, uh, very good morning, uh, my dear uh, audience. Uh, my dear professors and colleagues. So today we are going to talk about something very interesting and it represents our, our country. So my name is Niluka and she is my partner, 
uh, Madhushani. So we both are talking about an exploratory study on Sri Lankan identity impacted on Europe in the fabric of world literature. So uh, I will give a brief introduction to the uh, presentation. Uh, Pearl of Asia, we know that Sri Lanka and India had a very close relationship. We call that we are friends, we are neighbors. We know that our ancient history, which was uh, flourishing uh, towards uh, Buddhism, it was started from India and transmitted to Sri Lanka, but preserving Buddhism is especially done in Sri Lanka. That's why the location Sri Lanka is important in the context of Buddhism. I'm telling this because our presentation more concerned about Buddhism and how Buddhism has become a part of world literature in the uh, canon of world, li world literature in Europe or the West. So the Pearl of Asia is a maritime country in South Asia that is geographically surrounded by the Indian Ocean. I don't want to explain this much because you know how it is situated. So uh, you can see the invaders, merchants, and colonizers identified the country by different names such as Taprobane by Greek, Selao by Portuguese, then Ceylon by British, Serendip by Arabs, and uh, Ceylon by Dutch. So this also implicate how this uh, diversity, how this importance has been gone towards the world. It was not only one part. It was not only the Europeans or the Westerners have uh, focused on the country. So uh, this context influenced Westerners to dig into the Sri Lankan heritage. Uh, and as a result, Sri Lankan identity was transmitted to the West. So this presentation focuses on how the Sri Lankan thought process inspired the Westerners to produce literature in the canon of world literature. For example, if I simplified, we are going to talk about what they have taken from us towards Westerners, West, and how they have used those uh, cultural elements, maybe uh, literature, especially literature, how they have taken that to the West and they have inspired to write something about us. Moving towards, it was the time of Renaissance uh, and it was the time of enlightenment. Uh, in that context, many voyages came towards Asia. So uh, you can see how Bradfield understood the background of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So the main objective was to protect the religion uh, of the government. Government means the king at that time. So Sri Lanka had this core point, Buddhism. In that scenario, when the Western Enlightenment project happened, thinkers started to travel and explore the world, and gradually people were moving towards Asia. That's how Europe wanted to explore us, not only Sri Lanka, but the whole Asia. So um, even though they were enlightened, in many ways, there was a controversy regarding their religion, Abrahamic religion, Christianity, because at that time, they understood that uh, uh, the monarchy, monarchy is governing them, controlling them. That's how Renaissance, Enlightenment, and uh, some sort of war started. Actually. Uh, the first voyages come after the French Revolution. When the French Revolution going on, they started to travel towards Asia. So in that scenario, we can say that these uh, ex exploring, uh, sea explore, uh, exploring happened because they wanted to find something new, the knowledge system. Uh, and also, uh, one point, at that time in West, uh, the God was diminishing. They, they don't want to believe on God, so they understood something uh, different, unique was happening in Asia. So I will talk about this aspect, the stream of consciousness. It comes from the uh, background of Buddhism. You know the vultures part. Uh, there, with Lord Buddha, uh, with uh, Thero Kashapa, happened this mind-to-mind -mind transmission. That is what we call uh, mind process. It was mindfulness. Uh, later, we understand this concept has been taken from West, and they have uh, taken this to uh, the context of literature. Especially in 20th century, uh, when modernist period comes up, they use this technique to write uh, their writing. So this uh, core point of Buddhism, how mind should we practice? How uh, mindfulness is relevant to our day-to-day -day life and our uh, writings in literature? So that was focused on Buddhism, and it was taken from uh, Asia, especially in Sri Lanka, towards uh, West. That happened with uh, William James. So William James is a psychologist who is a 
a close friend of uh, Sigmund Freud, that person had to uh, find out what exactly happening in Asia, especially in Sri Lanka. So he invited Anagarika Dharmapala Dutero monk to deliver some uh, lectures regarding uh, mindfulness, uh, stream of consciousness. In that scenario, you can identify uh, these uh, things happen and how it was leading to towards um, West. These are the, uh, the contribution of Pali literature uh, can, uh, to the world literature canon, Tripitaka, Dhammapada, and uh, Terigata, Teragata, Jataka stories, Mahavamsa. So I would like to invite my friend to talk about Mahavamsa, which is very important and relevant to our world literature canon. Thank you. Mahavamsa uh, is a Sri Lankan non-stop epic, so it was written in the 5th and 6th century AD, and it was considered as the oldest epic chronic record about 2,300 years of Sri Lanka. Uh, so this was written by Mahanama, and we can identify this is actually, it's not a religious text, but it's a poem, and that poem written in Pali language. And uh, this Mahavamsa, it was translated into English and German in the 19th century. According, I think you can come to the main points of uh, what you want to say, the main arguments. Okay. So we want to uh, build up an argument that uh, in the context of world literature, the translation, circulation, and reprinting, those are the main techniques that uh, uh, one text can be translated or transmitted into another nation. So according to that uh, argument, we can say that the British civil server, uh, servant George Turnover in 1837 did the English translation of Mahavamsa. And in 1912 also, uh, the German translation Mahavamsa was prepared by Wilhelm Geiger. And again, that book was translated into English by Marble Henian Boards. And there were 38 chapters. And uh, Douglas Bullis also wrote uh, a commentary book regarding the Mahavamsa, and it was published in Fremont, California. So uh, Mr. Geiger and Guruge were the people who were inspired by Mahavamsa, and this Pali text, uh, through the Pali text society, this book was translated around the world. So when we talk about Anand Kentish Kumar Sami, he's a Sri Lankan, and uh, he contributed the idea of aesthetic theory that focus on the utilitarian. So um, according to that, the, his theory was several uh, American thinkers, orators, uh, John Cage, Walter Andrew, Henry Smee, Stella uh, Kramerich, they were influenced by this aesthetic theory. If I take one example, John Cage, he was motivated to prepare his sonatas and interlude after reading the book of Dance of Shiva written by Kumar Swami, and it's based on rasa and Hindu perspectives of art and beauty. And um, the another person uh, we considered this Colonel Henry Steele Alcott, he's an American, and he's the co-founder uh, of the Theosophical Society. Before creating this Theosophical Society, he get a chance to uh, read a uh, report taken from Sri Lanka to America, which was uh, based on the Panadura Vadaya. So from that, he got the inspiration, and he uh, he started to uh, make the foundations to a Theosophical Society uh, with Blavatsky. And he once he mentioned like, I pass among ignorant Western people as a thorough, well-informed man, and but in comparison with the learning process by my brothers and in the Oriental priesthoods, I am ignorant as the last of their uh, neophytes. And to you, as you must return, further he says that Western world is dying, come and help rescue it. Come and missionaries as teachers, as deputants and preachers. This idea uh, highly shows us that how he was influenced by Sri Lankan culture and Buddhism and how he wanted to translate, uh, taken that into the American society. And Madhushani, you have one minute to complete. Uh, another person is Robert Knox. And we know that uh, he was a sea captain, and uh, he has written a book called An Historical Relations of the Island of Ceylon in the East Indies. And uh, we uh, found that 
the person who wrote the Robinson Crusoe, that is the Daniel Defoe, he got to a uh, chance to go through this book and he got the inspiration to write his Robinson Crusoe uh, based on that and historical relations of the islands of Ceylon. So I will invite my friend to continue. Okay, very sorry we are exceeding our time, but Voltaire also important philosopher who comes from French background. Let me explain that a bit. So no, how no, you his, please uh, conclude. Okay, I'm going to conclude. The uh, idea of uh, serendipity has come from uh, Sri Lanka towards the West. That is what Voltaire has taken up, taken up. So uh, to conclude my presentation, uh, this paper wanted to uh, identify what sort of uh, uniqueness, uh, unique literature artifacts have gone towards West and those uh, uh, literature pieces have inspired Westerners to write their own literature. Mostly we are talking about how Westerns, uh, what are the things Westerners have given to us, but this is the other way around. So these are the things that Sri from Sri Lanka, from South Asia, they have taken to uh, write their own literature. Uh, considering their inspiration. Thank you so much. We are concluding our presentation. You are welcome to ask any question. Thank you. Can we have some questions? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Brenda from School of Buddhism. Uh, your presentation related to what I'm going to present <laughs> later on at 12 o'clock. But I'd like to ask you, is this directly, really, the Sri Lankan literature really impact on the Western directly? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, ma'am. I uh, really appreciate for that question. Actually, they have inspired uh, the uh, Buddhist writings. Uh, the text come in uh, the world literature, can sorry, Pali literature canon. Those writings have inspired Westerners. That's why they have translated it many times. When it comes to Theri, Theragatha, it has been translated over uh, 60 times. Am I, uh, did I answer your question, ma'am? Uh, no, <laughs> not directly. I'm you, sorry. You, you have part of it. But from the Western, uh, Western country, the impact by the Eastern culture, uh, before they come to Sri Lanka, they already got a different direction as well from other part of the world, that is the Southeast Asia. Yeah. And so that's why, and Sri Lanka has a big impact on the Southeast Asia before they come to Sri Lanka. So uh, that is my point that I'd like to, uh, to point to you, that Sri Lanka already have a connection with the Southeast Asian countries. And before the Western come to the Sri Lanka, they already associate with the Southeast Asian. Uh, and they already know that there is a literature Tipitaka, uh, which is existing in Sri Lanka. So that's why I said that it's not directly, but they got it, of course, they got it as a Sh Sri Lankan literature, of course, but then it to verify the Sri Lankan literature, they have to also search all the part of the country as well in order to verify this is authentic from the Buddhism that has been reserved in the Sri Lanka. Yeah. That, that's my comment to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, ma'am. And also, uh, I forgot to tell the preservation of Buddhism happened in Sri Lanka when it was decaying in India. So uh, how this Pali literature canon is important for us is uh, it was orally transmitted in India and it was formally written down in Sri Lanka. That is how this connection happened and that is how it was traveling towards West with these literary uh, writings. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. We have. Yeah. Okay, maybe sir. Um, it's a very brief comment. You said that serendipity um, was used by the Arabs. Sorry, okay. sir? Serendipity was used by the Arabs. Yeah. Okay. Us, yeah. Uh, serendipity is Pashyans. an Indo Aryan word which is derived from Swarna Deepa, Golden Island. So they are, it cannot be Arabic. It must have originated in, you know, Sri Lanka or somewhere, then they must have used it. Other things we'll discuss later. Okay, sir. Thank you so Thanks. much, sir. Uh, there is one question, Iluka, I would like to put forth. Thank you for the presentation, though. Um, um, I, uh, I, there were too many angles to your paper. Could you please uh, 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 mention what was the central idea where, uh, I mean? Yeah. 
the central idea of our paper was uh, how Sri Lankan literature, uh, whether it is devotional, whether it is uh, literature which was written in 19th century, how those writings impacted on Westerners to take up points included in those writings and write their own literature. Okay, you mentioned Mahavamsa. How has this been interpreted in the literature from the world? I mean, how do you connect? You did mention some, I think, uh, one American writer or some American writers, but uh, I didn't get the idea. So could you please elaborate? So, uh, ma'am, Mahavamsa was really written in the uh, Pali language. So when it was trans uh, translated and uh, uh, that person, uh, he was uh, highly influenced by Pali language and he has written a paper to the Bengali uh, Literary Society and in uh, uh, mentioning how the Pali language, the importance of it and uh, the importance of grammatical structure of Pali language. So that is uh, one point that uh, they were, I, to mention that they were inspired by the Pali language that was written in there. And uh, so we know that in the war literature canon, there should be translations, circulations, and publications. So that is how it goes beyond the peripheries to the, the other countries. So based on that idea, we took the Mahavamsa. Yeah, I would like to suggest one point here. If you could do some sampling from the world literature, you know, some text or something and find out connections to uh, establish this, what you're saying right now. That would make your paper Yeah, better. thank you so yeah. much, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what I was going to ask, uh, madam has already asked here, but uh, uh, if I can say that just, it's not just translation, publishing and circulations which makes a, a text part of world literature. It has so its own something, a true essence or true, true thing, pratipadya, what we call in Sanskrit, what it gives. So have you, uh, are you familiar with the contents of Mahavamsha? Uh, Mahavamsha is a very long, there are 2,300. Yeah, still, yeah. but any part of it, but have you ever read any yeah. commentary or um, like, okay, no. so like which thing you think that makes it eligible or worthy? That it's not like just that a book has been translated and circulated and published in and so many languages and it's been circulated around the world that it can become the part of world literature. It, ha it has to have something its own unique, true essence of it. So what do you think what Mahavansha has it? You have, you, you have already Yeah, in Mahavansha, uh, it focused on Buddhism as well as how the uh, rulers of our country has ruled the country and not only that, even the uh, cultural, yeah, it's an epic chronic and it was uh, written in uh, Tika also. So these are the uh, literary perspectives of that uh, text. And uh, not only that, our culture, our uh, society, everything is depicted there, everything was written in there. So literature, as, you, uh, as we mentioned, it's not only the written thing, it, uh, it gives the kind of cultural uh, value, it upholds the culture. Uh, that is how they inspired by Mahavamsa. So to answer your question, that is true, I agree with that, that it's not only the circulation and publication, there are several issues, but here we focus only that aspect, and we will uh, look into more uh, about Mahavamsa, and we'll go more about that. Thank you. You were going into the direction I was asking what, what my question asked is, but what you said, like, sorry for my words, but it was all general. There was no concrete or specific thing. So you must like look for something like if you talk about Ramayana, Mahabharata, anything, any of those epics. Yeah, Deepak, uh, I would appreciate, yeah, I appreciate your uh, comment. Uh, let me give some uh, uh, internal studies which we have done, okay? Uh, it was not from uh, Mahavamsa, of course, but it comes in the Tripitaka. Okay, Tripitaka, I agree with you, it's not only translation and whatever it is comes in the system, right? World mm. literature, it has another surface. We cannot uh, combine uh, what exactly this world literature is. So in that case, we find in uh, Sutta Pitaka, we have three baskets, you know the Tripitaka. So in that Sutta Pitaka, we uh, come across with this Tera Teri Gata if you have heard. So these Tera Teri Gata uh, and Dhammapada, those two are Buddhist devotional poetry, 
Pali poetry. So in that case, uh, even though the translations happen, the translation translators and the readers have understood the echo, the aura that original text is giving is not producing by the translations because of the uh, literary liturgical uh, language uh, essence. I mean, so in that case, we understood not only the mechanical things, but also the abstract concepts also matters in uh, this context of world literature to give a sort of uh, uh, taste towards the people. That is how uh, this, uh, in the con uh, when conceptualizing world literature in the modern world, uh, we find that. Uh, yeah. Little magazines, right? Little magazines, which was brought by James Joyce and some other uh, a group of people like uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, T.S. Eliot. So that small group with the same mindset, they are putting this uh, little magazine idea because they wanted to make sure that once they write something, the uh, audience or the readers, the society should uh, approachable, the read, uh, it should be readable for them. That's why this uh, little magazine thing uh, comes ma to make them understand the text. It was a uh, pre activity. I'm, I'm going to compare these two how this Teratiri Gata and Dhammapada face the problem with its transla translations, and uh, that point I can justify translations sometimes not practical. So sometimes we have to. Uh, do some uh, surface level projects to make sure that uh, to uh, make the audience comfortable in uh, reading and uh, uh, taking the text. So I think I put a sort of effort to uh, give some kind of idea to you, Deepa. Thank you. Uh. Yeah, just one, one, one line only. See, since you talked of translation, and uh, something that our translation theorists, whether in India or abroad, they, don't, they have not worked, that what kind of translation procedures were adopted by the translators of Southeast Asian countries, including Sri Lanka and such others. This is not studied at all. So when you look at that aspect of translation, mm -hmm. because you said giving importance to the audience, sometimes this approach is not accepted at all in this context. So that's why you may look at the aspect also how texts are being translated in the context of your country. So just please don't look at the Western theories. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one last question we are taking, but please be very quick because we are already running very late. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, you talked about William James Sigmund Freud, right? Uh, so you talked about, in this context, you talked about the transmission of knowledge from Sri Lanka to the West. Did you also look at the, the so you talked about distortion, right? Did you also look at uh, the assimilation or uh, assimilation of this knowledge into Western framework, repackaging, and exporting back to countries like Sri Lanka. Now, why I'm asking this question is, when you look at Sigmund Freud, right, uh, his psychology, is, uh, psych psychology focuses on, say, childhood upbringing without focusing on the law of karma, because the Christianity does not focus on the law of karma in the true sense, while Buddhism does focus on the law of karma. So did you look at this distortion? This distortion is very important because if you bring the law of karma, the, the psychology will behave in a different, altogether different way. But if you remove the law of karma in the true sense, the, the psychology that Sigmund Freud is, is propounding will behave in a very different way. This is one question. The second question, I'm just building on this. Yeah. So if you look at uh, India, right, the, the Hindu philosophy or the Buddhist philosophy, they, they, they go together. So today we are realizing that while they are presented as two, they are not actually two. Uh, there's, there, there are a lot of similarity between the, these two. Similarly, when you look at Sri Lanka, uh, there, there's a, uh, I mean, there's a series that has come on discovery by Amish Tripathi. He talks about uh, many places in Sri Lanka that 
have linkage to Ramayana, the Valmiki Ramayana. So did you come across any transmission of knowledge that, that uh, is at the, what do you call, it? is at the, the mixture of these two actually, the, the, the Hindu philosophy and the Buddhist philosophy, so these two questions. Uh, thank you for your question and uh, actually it was uh, two sort of questions. Let me answer. Um, I will uh, start from the second one. Yeah, uh, India, Sri Lanka, we are uh, very close in culture and uh, devotional sect. So uh, for example, uh, Jataka stories, Jataka tales, it was the folklore in uh, India. Uh, which was catering uh, Varanasi, right? Uh, in that case, uh, it was not written so that it was transmitted orally to Sri Lanka and uh, Sri Lankan monks in monasteries, they started to written down it. And uh, always make sure that these uh, Pali literature canon specially, giving the uh, first, uh, I mean, acknowledgement towards India. Because if India doesn't get the focus uh, on this Pali literature, uh, we would not have written it down in Sri Lanka. So always we have this connection uh, from India to Sri Lanka. Why Sri Lanka at a point is important is it brings literary canon, which we can materially identify. But we know that the source, the roots, are belongs to you all, India. So always these two are interconnected. In my presentation also, if they can show the slides, I have mentioned that this was brought from India to Sri Lanka. But from Sri Lanka only, they have gone towards West. The reason is it was written down. So the Westerners could approach it. That is uh, one aspect. Mm, Shankar Bhaiya, actually I forgot the first question. Uh, assimilation, right? Oh, oh, I got it, I got it, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, stream of consciousness is a focal point of Buddhism, Buddhist teaching, uh, especially in all Theravada, uh, Theravada Buddhism. So uh, in that case, uh, this um, mindfulness theory, it was not actually a theory that we understand a theory today, right? It comes from a culture where Buddhist, uh, Buddhism was focused. The, the guiding force in the society in Sri Lanka was Buddhism at that time. So Anagarika Dhanmapala was a prominent uh, character who wanted to preserve Buddhism and also at the same time who wanted to give this Buddhist perspective towards West, the reason is at that time, the God was diminishing from the Europe, okay? So uh, James, William James, who is a psychologist and philosopher from West understood this while he uh, going through the text and the, uh, while he talking to the monks in Sri Lanka. So uh, Sigmund Freud come to that context because I wanted to highlight this person is a psychologist if I tell the uh, Sigmund Freud, everybody will understand, oh, this is William James also, a uh, prominent psychologist. That's why I wanted to uh, give this uh, Sigmund Freud in that uh, speech, but Sigmund Freud's karma, uh, law of karma, exactly that was uttered in uh, Oxford University in a lecture by Anagarika Dhanmapala, and you know what, what that William James has told to the students? James said, Dharmapala, you are better equipped to lecture on psychology than I am. But make sure that Dharmapala didn't have any background of psychology. This comes from bottom of Buddhism, all Theravada is Buddhism. Uh, I think uh, we are going very far with the discussion. We can take it all in the tea time. Uh, <laughs> Shall I complete this quickly, ma'am? No. I think that you better go back and research again. You keep saying that Theravada. I already said at the beginning, the Western people already encounter with all the part of Asian already. They already encounter with China and other countries which have the 
Yogacara in 7th century and 8th century B, 4th, 19th century, they come to Sri Lanka. They already encounter with other parts of the country. They already have include the consciousness in those Yogacara and Nalanda. Nalanda tradition already talking about the consciousness. Not until they reach to Sri Lanka and they, they know the consciousness. So whatever you quote, I, I, I'm sorry, I disagree with you that they encounter in the 19th century. You need to research about that again. You keep saying that uh, the, the, they already encounter with other part of the country before they come to Sri Lanka. But of course, when they come to the Sri Lanka in 19th century or 18th century, they verify from the Theravada as the Asian text, much older than the uh, Mahayana in China and all the Japan and all the countries. But like I said, if you keep focus on that, Sri Lanka is the one that they, they borrow the, the concept of consciousness into the psychology. I'm sorry, I disagree with that. Yeah, uh, thank no, you, ma'am. I think there is no need to respond to that, what okay. she's saying that. A little more research with a little more of reference should have gone into your presentation. Yeah, yeah thank okay. you so much for your inputs. You. And I'm so sorry I get, got some time. Uh, and I yeah. beg your pardon if I do misspell no, it's anything. it's fine, it's fine, okay. it's fine, it's fine. Just a little okay. bit of more research so is much. what the professor is highlighting. Uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much, both of you. Let's move on to the next presentation by Arunava Das, who is also a postgraduate student in uh, World Literature at uh, School of Languages and Literature and Humanities, Nalanda University. Uh, and he's going to talk about the conceptualization of world literature, a critical study from the perspective of Global South. And I request, Arunava, you please maintain time. You have a huge uh, uh, sheet with you, but please make sure that uh, in the process of reading the entire thing, your main points are not lost. So good morning, uh, the honorable chair of this session, uh, honorable dean sir and professor uh, Mohanti and professor Sushant Misra and all of my friends, delegates and uh, the guests. Uh, very good morning to all. I am Oruna Podash. Uh, today my presentation topic is the conceptualization of world literature, uh, a critical study from the perspective of Global South. So this is the abstract of my uh, paper, but I am not going to read it out. Rather, uh, I would uh, like to uh, describe the aim, uh, aim of my study. So <coughs> uh, the discipline, uh, uh, before starting, so I, I am saying that we have already known that what is oil literature. So I don't need to go to what is oil literature, rather than I will skip so many parts what I have written in my paper. Uh, uh, but I will, I will give the touch that what I have uh, written. So the discipline of all literature has gained substantial momentum in the 19th century. The intellectuals and scholars spanning the globe, including in figures such as Goethe, Tagore, Damros, uh, Pascal Casanova, Gayatri Chakraborty, Spivak, and Amir Mufti, have not merely articulated their individual perspectives to delineate the emerging discipline, but have also expanded the scope of world literature. These dialogues have not only defined world literature, but also brought about a revelation of the concept of national literature and world literature. This paper provides a comprehensive examination and of the origin and development of world literature covering various aspects of theoretical uh, foundation, counter arguments, existing theories and contemporary trends, and the structure of this paper is organized in two main sections. The first section initiates with an explosion of evolving theories and counter arguments concerning the critic of Eurocentric view of current theories and trends and the study of world literature provided uh, pr uh, pioneered by Gattes uh, world literature and Tagore's Vishesh uh, Aitha. Uh, this establishes the foundation for the subsequent analysis by the presenting of the intellectual landscape uh, and scholarly discourse surrounding the subject. The paper is dedicated to more focused inquiry. It attempts to comprehend the fundamental concept within the realm of all literature by David, uh, the uh, ongoing debate between uh, in, uh, David D'Ambrose and Pascal Casanova, um, and uh, in fact, Emily Apters as critic of 
of David D'Ambrose and Amir Mufti's critic of Pascal Casanova. Uh, so the first concept involves the hostilistic examination of Eurocentrism in world literature and the production and the publication to circulation and reception in the global literary market. This suggests a keen interest and the dynamics of the mechanisms that govern by the presence in and reception of literary works on a worldwide scale. The second concept deals into the position that the recognition of Bengali literature, that where I have uh, focused more into my own culture are, are in the global literary arena, uh, suggesting a concern for the representation and, and influence of a specific regional literature in the arena of all literature. So this is the uh, critique of Eurocentricism in the theoretical paradigm I'm of the world literature. The uh, conflict between Emily Apter's monograph against world literature is a reaction to David D'Ambro's book, What is World Literature? But I will not go to this, this theoretical aspects, but rather I will give some insights. Like the complexity of world literature has been debated uh, debated in several ways in the forum of scholars, including the limitations of literary and cultural traditions. The challenges models uh, offered for its study and the role of economic and extra literary pressures in the field emergence. Critics, on the other hand, have uh, recently shifted towards the politics and questioned whether world literature are really necessary or possible. The irony of the development is that at the same time, I am the nationalism is growing around the world effort in literary studies to combat nationalism frequently appear to have their roots in non-literary concerns. So after wishes to execute the re-philosophization of world uh, in her <coughs> book against world literature, page nine, which translates as the re-philosophization of literary history through the history of translation. And it is also necessary to consider untranslatability uh, while paying attention to translation, the concept that Demros completely overlooked. Uh, words that cannot be translated into another language are the consecutive in the world forms of literature after arrives the hypertranslation, a source text uh, of alternation via the examination of translatability. And, but the, 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 this is one of my uh, uh, foundational theoretical arguments by uh, Amir Mufti's uh, uh, argument on Pascal Casanova and Orientalism. Um, uh, so in Pascal Casanova's The World Republic of Writers, the author argues that throughout the previous four centuries, the international literary space has expanded beyond Europe and other parts of the continent. It began in the early modernist Mufti list, the three turning points in the history, that global literary arena that appears mostly adhered to the timeline by Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. The first is the long and unequal process of vernacularization in rising European nations from the nine, uh, 14th to 17th century, following Anderson's periodization and more once Casanova uh, contends that the widely diffused formation of national tradition that followed the philological lexiographic revolution that began in the late 18th century represents the next turning point of the immense development. Uh, Mukti begins his formulation with uh, with what he considers the most fundamental misconception. According to Casanova, uh, non-Western literary cultures that effectively arose in the global literary space in the middle of the 20th century during the decolonization process, Casanova is unable to fully appreciate the true character of philological revelations, enlargement, and recognition of this up to the point of mostly European spaces. Mukti suggests that the a uh, suppressed element in the concept of world literature in its conception, namely a far-reaching refashioning of the cultures and societies of the world in the new place of colonial expansion that accompanied and followed in the industrial revelation. Uh, in industrial revelation. Mufti is concerned here with the consequences of the changes of the social, uh, colonized societies themselves, which are the objects, strictly speaking, and the orientalist endeavor, and he states that regal regardless how of this define world literature with Franco Muruti as a conceptual structure rather than collection of literary works, or with David D'Ambrose as a unique form of writing transcendence its cultural origin? We cannot ignore the global relation of force that the term both reveals and obscures. This tension is inherent in the term itself. Uh, so in the realm of literature, Mukti emphasizes the notion of India uh, as a singular cultural entity that distinct civilization with origins that Sanskritic culture was first proposed uh, through the creation of Indian literature. The India uh, evolved from a, a geographical area 
uh, with several overlapping cultures and completed complicated history uh, to uh, to recognize the civilization and then through the literary and cultural uh, transmission rules the concept of india as a country is spread throughout europe this occurred prior to the subcontinent as a whole being under the british imperial authority and prior to the emergence of pan subcontinental nationalist class in initiated in the independence movement so uh, there is an, uh, another foundational uh, uh, discourse by uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Vishwasahitya and Gattes uh, World Literature or World Literature, but I will not go into that because I think if we all are know about these things. Uh, rather, I will directly go to the next uh, chapter of my uh, uh, paper, the contribution of English, uh, uh, contribution of uh, Indic uh, uh, literature in World Literature. Uh, so uh, the uh, the term wall literature was first used by uh, uh, Gatte in the last year of his life in 1820s. He refers to the res retrospective look that what he has just said at a Chinese novel and his reading of William Jones' translation on Shokuntala. Uh, so we can see the uh, uh, William, uh, William Jones' first translation of Shokuntala and the title itself is a bit different. The, uh, uh, the spelling Shokuntala we can see uh, on the screen. In which is in, in wholeheartedly a very old story that feeds into the historical account of the bourgeois accent to prominence as a multinational social force. The epic play Shokuntala uh, had a profound effect on German and later other European writers and intellectuals. It could be among the first instances of the Indian text entering Germany through Sir William Jones, recalling the enthusiasm with the Germans. Uh, welcomed this translation of Shokuntala. So we have already uh, known about it uh, by the presentation of our friends and in, in the evening we also uh, have a, uh, a session on Shokuntala and we will uh, deep, uh, uh, truly know about it. But I will not go into it right now. But I will talk about Bengali literature in the arena of all literature. Bengali literature distinct, uh, distinctive connections with the West is a significant component of global reference. Following an extensive duration of Romindonath's influence, the reaction of Bengali authors in the post colonial era are being shaped by the new generation of poets and intellectuals. Bibhuti Bhushan Bandopadhyay, Jivanarandu Dash, Mohashreta Devi, Tarashankar Bandopadhyay, Johir Rahin in Bangladesh, Shohidul Johir and Molay Rai Chaudhuri are the writers who have focused on narrative philosophical concepts and political realities in India and Bangladesh during the post-independence era in 1947 and after in 1971. In addition, Buddhist thought impacted on Allen Ginsberg movement in the United States. Because of Mola Rai Chaudhuri's friendship with Ginsberg, the Hungry Movement in 1960s got international recognition and influenced the writers in the West and especially in the United States. The, and, <coughs> and the translation of Vokti literature, a, a literary movement in India. Yes, ma'am, just can I get two minutes? Yeah, sure. Thank you, ma'am. The translation of Vokti literature and the poetry of mystic poet by COVID uh, translated by Rabindranath Tagore, uh, uh, Mirabai and Akka Mahadevi also aided the worldwide development of devotional literature. Madhusudam Dattas epic Meghnathbhat Kabbo was translated by Radice, William Radice and uh, Jivanandu Dash was uh, translated by uh, Clinton B. Sealy. And one of the greatest collection of short stories by Mohashreta Devi was uh, translated by Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. Uh, in addition to their caliber, all of these translations have drawn the large number of readers from throughout the globe and since released the reputable publishers, as who is provides the excellent distribution all over the world. Uh, Spivak uh, contended that studying world literature in translation uh, tames the linguistic complexity of uh, uh, linguistic, com uh, linguistic complexity of the uh, original as well as the potential political impact of a work may have in its original setting. The idea of shared world literature continues to spark discussion in the book Can Subaltern Speak? Spivak addresses the idea that the subaltern and expands on this by claiming the imperialist project com uh, complicates the subaltern phase growth. The portrayal of Draupadi in the main character in Mahashrata Devi's, <coughs> uh, Mahashra Devi's novel I'll, I'll aware that the translation have made the work, uh, uh, made the work, and the uh, and the other translations like uh, from Bengali literature, Sohid Waliullah, Sohid Mustafa Ali are also very prominent because uh, Sohid Waliullah 
uh, who lived in Paris in the 1940s and was the uh, part of a group of existential philosophers. Uh, uh, and at that time, his works also translated into several European languages like French, English, and uh, other, other European languages. And the, uh, in the present day, uh, from India, Omitabh Ghosh is also a very prominent writer, though he writes in English, but his con contents and context are, are coldly in Bengal, especially in the uh, Sundarban region. So, can you please <coughs> conclude now? Yes, ma'am. So the growth of Indian literature is threatened by the English language monopoly. Studying Indian literature from the non-Eurocentric viewpoint is now extended to it. And the one language monopoly in the global literary market is known as cultural imperialism. Gatri Chakraborty Spivak's concept that the threat of monolingualism overtaking the comparative literature will result in language textbook being ubiquitous internationally is another indication for our fear over expanding the command over English language. Just one paramount. Oh. Few, uh, few seconds. Although the idea of Indian literature was first introduced to the West through the writings of Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, this does not imply the spirit of Indian literature is lost in writing in other Indian languages. It is biased, incomplete, and Eurocentric assessment of Indian literature to assume the contemporary Indian literature is miserable and insignificant. The chronicling of history of global literature, Harish Trivedi has cautioned against the uh, becoming apath uh, apathetic about the problem and avoiding the recurrence. No language, including English, should be given greater room for overrepresentation in all literature conception than any other language, regardless how dominant it is. So this is all of my presentation. Thank, Thank you. you have you have any question? Please ask me. Thank you so much. I will take only one question in the interest of time, if there is one. Please go ahead. Uh, Aruna, uh, I just have one small thing. Again, uh, I'll go back to the previous presentation also. Uh, there are too many facts that you have written. Actually, it's an observation more than a question. Too many facts that you have written. You have mentioned about Bhakti movement. You mentioned so many writers also. Instead of that, if you could just look, if you could have looked up just one aspect and try to find out the connection of that aspect in literatures from the world, maybe one writer for, for speaking up here. Later on, you could have developed it talking about several writers from the world, how that one aspect is seen over there. You have mentioned it has been translated, it has been translated, it has been mentioned by the other writers. But how? What are those points on, on the basis of which you claim that uh, the, lit the Indic literature or like last pre presentation, Southeast Asian literature, in whatever way do they help us, or do, do, like, may they help us to conceptualize uh, a concept of world literature. That was missing as I felt. So this was one observation, you can work on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Arunava. We look forward to your more concrete paper when it gets published. Uh, I now invite uh, Laura Magdalena, uh, who's also a postgraduate student in world literature uh, in the School of Languages and Literature and Humanities at Nalanda University. Uh, she is going to talk about Buddhism's influence on the literary work of Georges Louis Borges. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. How is it pronounced? Borges? In Spanish, Borges. Borges. Uh -huh. okay. Jorge Thank Luis Borges. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure everybody called him Borges only. Yeah. <coughs> well, uh, good morning. Um, I request you to stick with time, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Thank think you. I'm going to just uh, pick up some brief idea of what is the influence of Buddhism in Borges' works. 
Okay. Uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure you, you know Borges for world literature, but well, he's a, an Argentinian writer. He, he wrote uh, poetry, he wrote short stories and essays, um, and also he was a translator. He's uh, well known for two books. One of them is uh, Fictions, and an another one is The Aleph. And, well, he explored um, many themes like uh, labyrinth, dreams, uh, different uh, motives. Um, in this paper, uh, I will examine the intersection, you know, the idea, how the idea of self and reality in Buddhism helped Borges to build his own idea of uh, literature. Not only, of course, not only uh, Buddhism uh, idea um, help Borges, but among other philosophies and literatures, how uh, we can see uh, some resemble of Buddhism in uh, Borges' interest. Also how uh, Borges, um, you know, view uh, Buddhism as a literature, uh, the poetic of Buddhism, and also um, how if we select some uh, specific text, we can see, uh, you know, the mythology of Buddhism, the philosophy and the cosmology of Buddhism, how influence the narrative of Borges. Uh, Borges, Borges wrote uh, two books. Did you hear me good or? Yeah? Okay. Um, Borges wrote two books about Buddhism. One is uh, Que es el Budismo, that uh, is uh, in Spanish. Uh, it never was translated to English. And then there are another book that is called Siete Noches or Seven Night. Uh, in this, uh, this seven night, uh, collect seven lectures. One of the lectures is about Buddhism. Um, so with this, uh, with this uh, paragraph, I, I want to present how Borges, uh, you know, um, read Buddhism. When he's talking about Mahayana, he said, the universe continually presents us with shapes, colors, smells, sounds, thermal and spatial sensation, but behind those appearances, there is nothing. The universe is illusory, to live is precisely to dream. Shakespeare would say much later, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. So Borges is always uh, reading not, not only Buddhism, but every philosophy or any literature in comparison with others. He always is making this kind of uh, interconnection. It's his way of uh, reading. These are the books that I mentioned. Uh, que es el budismo is not, is not translated yet in, in English, but Siete Noches yeah, is translated to English. Uh, it is uh, called Seven Nights. And these seven lectures were titled, as you can see there, the, the, you know, their interest of uh, his lectures. The Divine Comedy, Nightmares, The Thousand and One Night, Buddhism, Poetry, The Kabbalah, and Blindness. After this book was published, uh, Borges said that these uh, topics were uh, topics that obsessed him, so that he considered the bo this book as his testament. So, if we see if we see uh, the three the seven topics, we can see that he was very interested in East culture, what what we can uh, understand as a you know broad Eastern culture because we see the thousand and one night, we see also Kabbalah and, and Buddhism. You know, there are three topics that he was very interesting in. 
Uh, I want to share with you just uh, three ideas that Borges said in the, in the book of uh, Buddhism, um, what he think about it. So Buddhism, beside being a religion, is a mythology, a cosmology, a metaphysical system, or more exactly, a series of metaphysical systems which do not recognize each other and which dispute among themselves. Then he talked uh, about uh, the historical figure of, of Buddha and the Buddha as a legend. Um, I think he was more interested uh, because he was a writer, he was a, a poet, and for him everything could be a fiction. Uh, he was interested in the legend of Buddha and all the mythology and all the painting sculptures and poems that were created around the idea of Buddha and Buddhism. So, um, in the first paragraph he said, he has reached nirvana and he continues to live for another 40 odd years dedicated to teaching. He could have remained immortal, but he chooses the moment of his death after he g has gathered many disciples. So um, he also uh, see the idea of Buddha as, the, as a historical figure uh, that um, give you know his teaching to humanity. Um, well, um, in 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 some uh, interview, he said that he studied uh, Buddhism for a long time, like uh, like. 10 years of studying uh, about Buddhism, and um, if you see, if we, you know, uh, try to search when he started knowing about Buddha, it's from his seven years old until uh, his, you know, uh, finish of, of, his, of his life. So he was very interested in Buddhism, even though he don't know Sanskrit, he don't know Pali, so he was influenced by translation in English, in Spanish, in German. Um, so you know he he was not looking the 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 text, the original text. Um, to see uh, how how he. He uh, approached Buddhism. I want to know. I want to share with you the kind of framework from which Borges is uh, reading, writing, and you know, thinking. In one of the lectures that he delivered in Harvard about poetry, he said, "Every time I'm faced with a blank page, I feel that I have to rediscover literature for myself." But the past is of no avail whatever to me. I have only my perplexities to offer you. I'm near 70. I have given the major part of my life to literature. And I can offer you only that. And then he said, and yet, why need I worry about this? What is a history of philosophy but a history of the perplexity of the Hindu, of the Chinese, of the Greeks, of the schoolmen, the scholastics, of Bishop Berkeley, of Hume, of Schopenhauer, and so on. In this paragraph, he is kind of enumerate, uh, enumerating the, you know, the literary tradition that he, and the persons that he really admired. Because uh, we are also discussing about, uh, debating about world literature, um, there are uh, some conceptualizations of Borges that for, I think could be interesting. Because um, Borges con conceptualized translations, every trans translation as a new artwork with the same validity in literature as the original version. So uh, I bring this paragraph because I think it's very, you know, 
it uh, gave us the idea that uh, he construct about not only about translation but only but also about uh, world literature. He say Quixote, that is a novel in, in Spanish, because of my inherited exercise of Spanish, is an uniform monument with no other variation than those provided by the publisher, the bookbinder, or the type, typewriter. And he said, the Odyssey, thanks to my opportune ignorance of Greek, is an, is an international library of works in prose and verse, from Chapman, Couples, to Andrew Lack, authorized version, or Berard, classic French drama, or Morrison, vigorous saga, or, Sam, or Samuel Butler, ironic bourgeois novel. So, in that sense, he said that he preferred this kind of, you know, translation uh, or interpretation of um, original uh, work. And he said that it is a kind of an international library in prose and verse. So this is, I think, um, a concept that we can debate about what is translation and uh, how to think about that in, in the framework of world literature. The other uh, thing that I, I think it is interesting to, to think about, uh, and it's related with the, the idea of translation, is that he says, literature is a single, infinitely variable text, and none of its many fragments can aspire to the name of original text. He said that in 1937, and it was uh, translated to English in 1972, when this kind of conversations and this kind of, uh, you know, question about what is literature and what happened with translation uh, start, but from the beginning of his writing, he was always uh, having this idea of literature as a space of no boundaries, um, because uh, in, also for him the the idea of library as a as a world in which any of us can you know. Uh, read and reread and uh, rethink literature uh, is the idea that Borges has about uh, world literature. Uh, uh, Laura, you have about a minute to finish. Minute? Okay. okay, I'm just um, talk about uh, how uh, specifically in the case of um, the definition of Borges of fantastic literature, um, some Buddhist concept help him uh, to talk about again real, against realism in literature and the idea of fantastic literature. In, uh, in the early 1992, he he wrote an article that is about the nothingness of personality. Uh, he took some I took some paragraph. He says that there is no whole self. Grimm, in an excellent presentation of Buddhism, and a German author, the Lered des Buddha, described the process of elimination where we the Indian arrive at the certainty. Here is their millennial effective present. Those things of which I can perceive the beginning and the end are not myself. And then, uh, he developed kind of his own question and idea, and he said, I'm not my own activity of seeing, hearing, smelling, testing, touching, nor am I my body, which is a phenomenon among others. Are desire, thoughts, happiness, and distress my true self? The answer, in accordance with the preset, is clearly in the negative, since those conditions expired without annulling me with them. The self, 
is a mere logical imperative without qualities of its own or distinction from individual to individual. So I just want to, uh, you know, share with you that there are some texts from the beginning of his uh, writing in 1992 to 1995 that uh, he, he wrote and he reflect about the idea of personality uh, and I, about the idea of the nothingness of personality and Buddha. And also it helped him to criticize the idea of a psychological novel. He didn't like, uh, you know, the, the novels and the, especially the psychological novels. He, he tried to develop uh, idea of literature that is a fantastic uh, literature and he said um, from Chaucer to Marcel Proust the subject of the novel is the non-repetitive singular flavor of souls for Buddhism there is not such flavor or it is one of the many vanities of the cosmic simulacrum then well, I think I'm, I'm not come, have time, but uh, because he is uh, especially, he's a writer, but uh, he's a poet and then a writer of story, short story. He likes very much words. He, um, uh, the, not just the meaning, but the sound and the etymologies. So he, um, he have a, a very interesting uh, for, you know, from a literary point of view, analysis of the world of nirvana uh, and how uh, Buddhism, um, you know, use metaphors related with the state of nirvana and how if you consider this poetic as a mystical poetic, if we compare with another uh, image, poetic image uh, of mysticals, um, it's very different, uh, the metaphor that uh, in Buddhist literature we can find. So, well, thank I you think so thank much. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, I go to the next presentation. So maybe uh, because there is hardly any time and we have two more presentations to go, we'll take up these questions during the day time. Uh, I invite now Abhay Kumar Lal, uh, who is a postgraduate student in Hindu studies, uh, to talk about Southeast Asian perspectives in Marguerite Duras. Please uh, stick with time. Uh, that I would really appreciate that. Ten minutes. Very good morning to all of you. And it is a great day for me. I am a Hindu studies first semester student. And uh, my topic is not, it does not sound, you know, to be related with this uh, in the, uh, India, Brahm, Dharma and all. I am taking a writer who is French writer, but as he was brought up in Indochina, she grew up with Indic and Southeast Asian sensibilities. So when we try to define the world literature, we have to take con into consideration the universal elements and the essentials of the cultural manifestation which is a literature for us and that's why we have to strike for the themes which, which is expressed beyond language and all. Like we can, we can say that instead of talking sociology, we have to talk of anthropology of literature and there in this context we find that Marguerite Duras, though she is writing in French, but she strikes, she, she, her quest is for the, you know, the thing which is essential 
for all human beings. And we have chosen a woman writer in this context because women also it is said to be that they are more inclusive in nature and as she had also. So that inclusiveness, you know, which is need of the hour and it becomes very crucial when we define the world literature. So that the point of inclusiveness, the point of humanity, the point of universality, so these are the things which we have very surreptibly tried to find out in two of her works. One is Hiroshima Mon Amour and another is The Malady of Death by, by her. So as it is a, a French uh, novel and uh, cinema, uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, it is my love. So, and, and here we define, you know, even the war, war, war is always has been, we have been seeing that war is a war, death, these are the themes around which the, our pro, uh, poetry is revolving, you know, because the humanity has always witnessed them and it has given us the, you know, like opportunity for the creation for creativity, because you create something just, you know, above the destruction. And in that context, she creates her, one of the finest novel of these days, that Hiroshima Mon Amour means Hiroshima, my love. Because we all know that it was the Hiroshima which was bombed. And that was the worst demonstration of our, this contemporary culture which has resulted into that. But she tries to thrive out, you know, to make love out of it. So in that context, I would like, because that is the, the great Indic civilization which talks of, you know, union. Union but the, with the greater self of ourself and through what do we achieve that, that is the only thing which remains that love. So love is the only thing that we can, you know, uh, start our journey. We can start our process of, of you can say, the world literature. Hmm. In that context, I will just read out very quickly, though we don't have much time and that he is waiting for us, but even then I will try to do that. So Marguerite Dusa, Duras, in her writing in modern times, especially after the Second World War, explore the nature of love and existential conflicts of the individual. She is one of the most original contemporary writers in France and considered as one of the pillars of new novel writers who experiment with expressions and literary forms. But in our context, Indic and South Asian perspectives, she becomes more important because she writes in French, but her literary sensibilities are more Asian than European. Her themes and point of views are more accommodative in nature than assimilative. First, she was born to French parents, but later she was brought up in uh, various Indochina's abodes of Cambodia and Vietnam. Secondly, she witnesses the richness of culture and civilization of this region, these regions, which she finds more affluent as compared to her unitary, monolithic, and monopolistic European culture. And moreover, as a female writer and representing the feminine Asian and Oriental culture opposed to the masculine European colonial power. In that context, I am calling this, you know, masculine and feminine. So here is the intervention we are going to talk about. You know, the, the um, uh, things which uh, she writes, she has, if, if I can name three, four, more, she, the first novel she writes, Lama, like, uh, not first, but she writes among her novels, Lama, the lover. Uh, then you have the lover from Indochina. Then you have Hiroshima, my love. So all these, you know, it is full of, she tries to thrive out, you know, the concept of love out of this war and out of this, you know, chaos which we are living now. 
So I, I, I just quote from uh, this. Hiroshima, My Love is a novel in which we find the story of a French actress who comes to Hiroshima to shoot a film on place and as a chance finds a Japanese architect to express her love. Knowing that she has to leave following day, the both openly confess that they are happily married, highlighting the forbidden nature of their encounter and the impossible future. The intensity of this brief love affair allows her to revisit the trauma of her first love at the age of 18. Again, she, she recalls that in another frame of that, that she, 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 she was actually that side of France which was affected more by the German occupation during the Second World War. And there she, 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 she falls in love with the German army officer. And there that army officer was shot dead one day. You know, and uh, she was almost imprisoned. The affair set against the backdrop of place which was witnessed the worst ever devastation caused by man-made device, the nuclear power has become the symbol of peace and in the beginning of the film we do not get the chance to see couple, neither him nor her. Instead, what we see, we see mutilated bodies, the heads, the lips moving in the throes of love or death and the covered successively with the ashes, the dew of atomic death and sweat of love fulfilled. So you know, prompted by the man, the woman tells the story of her first uh, love affair with a German soldier that took place in the town of Nevers during the German occupation of France. The woman recalls that on okay. the day of uh, France liberation... I'm sorry to interrupt. Instead of like telling us the narrative, the, if you can directly come to the South Asian perspective, uh, key elements of yes, that... Yes, yes, uh, certainly, better. certainly. So, you know, uh, the another, just I will finish in two minutes. Like, what, what uh, just I wanted to highlight just two points. One is the Hiroshima, my love, like she creates love out of that, you know, at the place of that war. Because war is perpetual in human history, as even we see Mahabharat or Ramayana, or for that matter, the Greek and Troy, uh, this. So that gives the, you know, for when she recalls her, you know, German occupation, she said that the moment the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, the war ended with that. The war ended with that, and that day she was set free. So it is one point. The another, in the malady of death, see the, the protagonist tries to, you know, buy love, the eternal love, through the sexual desire and lust. She hires a woman who is not even a prostitute, but he does not, you know, finally finds the love. So her main concern is, I want to say, in that context, she becomes very Indian, South Asian, that the lust, love, and desire does not satisfy neither the self of human being nor the being itself. So that is the point I want to make. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. We'll take up discussion during tea. Uh, we have come to the end of this uh, session with the presentation by Mr. Roshan, who is also a postgraduate. Okay. Okay. Roshan, uh, who is going to talk about thematic content of Zahir Rahman's For Thousand Years and You Are Anant Murthy's A Right for a Dead Man. Uh, but I am sorry, Ro Ro Roshan, you will have to finish it in about eight minutes. You. Okay. <laughs> Maybe then you can just talk about your main points. We started at nine.
the honorable chair of the session, uh, my respected vice chancellor of the university, my respected dean of the school. I am, I don't know, actually I am feeling very nervous because today uh, the honorable, the decorated on an honorable respected professors are sitting in front of me and very good, very good morning to all of you. I, I am feeling myself very lucky to be here and I am grateful to my university and my professors that they have given me the opportunity where such professors are present and I am talking. Dear audience, we all know that today's theme is uh, Indic and Southeast Asian perspective in conce conceptualizing world literature. As a running student of world literature, I'm still uh, learning about the concept and th uh, theories of the world literature. So, but while going through a text, uh, that's a very prominent writer in India, you are Ananda Murthy. The text is Samskara, translated by A.K. Ramanujan as a right for a dead man. I have found that I have similar thematic text in my own literature, in Bangladesh literature, I'm from Bangladesh. And I found that it is not only one, there are several other literatures where the similar theme is there. I have figured out, or I have chosen one from there, the right author's name is Hajar Bach, uh, Johi Rahan, and the text is Hajar Bachur Dhore. I think that all the Bangladeshi students are sitting here, they're very much aware of it because it is one of the text of us. Every uh, higher, uh, high school students and intermediate students must read about it. Mr. Johi Rahan, who is also an intellectual martyr uh, regarded in our country. So, uh, uh, I have chosen these two texts uh, I need to show, and rather going to the literary debate or world literature debate, I have come with this topic that actually share my hypothetical thought with all of you that I have not actually, I am still here to learn research. I don't know if it's a proper research paper or not. I will just focus upon some theoretical concept thematic context and my hypothetical thought that how the two persons from two different places are writing almost similar uh, concept, uh, almost similar storyline. So this is, these are the two texts I, I have taken. Uh, one is uh, written in Kannada, actually Kannada language uh, by uh, Mr. Ananda Murthy that was later translated in 1976 by Mr. A.K. Ramanujan. He is also a very prominent person. And uh, it was basically published in 1965. And in Hajar Bachur Dhore, the Bangladeshi literature I am talking about, uh, sorry, I am going a bit fast, <laughs> you know, for the time. Uh, uh, that is uh, the Bangladeshi literature that published in 1964, just one year earlier than the text of Mr. Ananda Murthy. So uh, my primary objective that what is I am going to show is showing the surprisingly comparative features between the chosen text that I have chosen and the literary ecosystem, the work, behind the preparation, publication, and reception of the similar work by the two different persons in, two, two, uh, two in the same time span, and exploring the notions in the text that constitute the idea of human and humanity as a whole. So if I want to ju just give you the basic details of the book, Hajar Bachur Dhore, uh, I, am, I am sorry that the, there is no trans English translation of that uh, book. Uh, so the probable English title I have chosen is for 1,000 years. And that year of publication was 1964. And about the book uh, of Samskara, that was in Kannada language, uh, that was basically published in 1965 and then translated in 1976. And these are the author and translator I am talking about. Uh, and if you, if you look at their lifespan, that they also live the same time in the civilization. They, ha they even born at the similar time. They even died at the same time span. Yes, in the case of Jahid Rayhan, it was a not a natural death. He was taken away by uh, the then uh, Pakistani armies, and that was a different story I'm not going to tell here. So these are the basic, some of the notions of the Jahid Rayhan that uh, he was an alma mater of University of Dhaka, and that before it, he was also studied in uh, Kolkata Aliyah Madrasa, and his notable work is Stop Genocide, I think we all know about. That was also uh, established and approved by United Nations. And about you, Mr. Ananda Murthy, I think I should not say much about it because you all know about it. And as far as I know, there are, uh, my, he is also my uh, professor of my teachers here. So I think he is very well known. I shouldn't say much about him. So about the, I, I will briefly explain the basic uh, development of the plot. In Hajar Bachur Dhore, Mr. Jahi Rayhan has figured out uh, a day-to-day -day life of a village people who are living in a Bangladeshi village in Komilla, if you are uh, known about. 
and they all are Muslim community, but it's a very village life, how they're connected to the nature, how they're attached to the agricultural activities, and how life goes on through this. But in the meantime, an epidemic occurs, and that is cholera in our case. And this cholera, how this cholera has changed the village life, how it impacted them, how the people got separated. Some people are dying and some people are trying to help, but the society is not accepting them or society is not uh, allowing them to go to that, to that village, that, that, uh, that house, because though they are relatives or neighbors, because they are thinking that it, it will spread and if anyone goes there, then they will be affected also. But the very surprising issue is love goes on in between. In between, people fall in love. In between, marriage happens. In between, life continues. That is the ultimate theme of the text. And if we go to the samskara, that is a right for a dead man, we will see the similar structure in a Karnataka village where a Brahmin community is living. I think we all know about the text. It's very a very popular text in India. That where it, it, there is also an epidemic attack here. In this case, the epidemic is uh, plague. And this plague, uh, uh, change their lifestyle. This plague happens also that how their, how their life has been changed, how the new, they're facing the modernity, the new life, the new concept, and how it changes. And here also we see that love goes in between. Here also we see that life goes on. Life never stops. So while actually I'm not going much about the narrative, because I have something others to say, I have f featured some major issues that day-to-day -day life in rural settings Though in Bangladesh village, in Karnataka village, Muslim community, Brahmin community, but fear is common. Fear of death, fear of afterlife, fear of social images, fear of distressed situations. The epidemic crisis and the belief system are very much together. None of the... Madam? Two minutes. Okay, ma'am. None, none of the community is taking the disease as disease. Rather, they are taking the disease as a curse from the supernatural belief. Some in, in, in Bangladeshi community, they are naming it Ola Bibi. That is also a transformation of Ola Chondi. That is, they be the Ola Otha. I think this is very common term in India. That this Ola is not a term of, it's not a disease. It comes as a form and then it destroys. In the case of plague, uh, in Ananda Murthy's samskara, we see that they are also not taking it as a disease. Rather, they are taking it as a car. That they, they have done something wrong to some people. No, there is a character called Naranappa. They have not yet proper right to the dead man. So now they have been cursed with this. Then the love and, uh, love and uh, nature relation, humanity versus inhumanity has been shown. Very common theme. As they are, some of the people are showing humanity, some people are reacting as much as inhuman. They are not even touching, they are not even going to the dead body. Re recites hunger, need, death. Death rights and greed are very common here. But why I am showing this? Because I have got this similarity in two texts, but my, my question is, if I ask any of my uh, uh, friends from Bhutan or Malaysia or Indonesia or any other places, I think they will come up with similar texts. So why is the difference we are bringing up? Why this literature debate? Why this world literature debate? Why we are not being touched to that? Why the Westerners are saying that they are figuring out some of their texts to the world literature and they are not taking us or considering our literature as literature or as a part of our literature? Why? How we are different? Some probable context I am giving that, I, I mean, my, my studies goes on to the venture that why these two persons living in two places thinking similarly, I have found out that the political and literary condition of early and mid 20th century was they were got affected by the academic background because Mr. Anandamurti was studying in Birmingham at that time, 1947 when the plague came out, he was there. He was very much touched about some of the text I have shown here. Uh, if you show this storyline, in 1947 the plague uh, comes out, and in 1964, the uh, 4,000 years before the 1947, there is a pale horse, pale rider, 1939. These all are pandemic literature. I think this might be another reason. The basic characteristics I have found also in 1930s literature: the individualism, symbolism, experimentation, formalism, absurdity, and maybe they have been touched by the utopian, dystopian literature emerging at that time. Rise of trans. Totalitarianism in that uh, you know about the German, Russian, and Spanish. Spanish in Franco, in Russia it's uh, the Russian jar, and in German Hitler, that they, they were evolving at that time. And the apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction was also rising, and the epidemic literature was rising, and a new world order starts after World War II. So these all things I have uh, touched these two, uh, prof uh, two writers, and they have come up with such 
uh, similar uh, context. Madam, I will just finish with one question and my observation. That is, is it an Indian culture I'm talking about or Bangladeshi? Is it the Muslim culture or Sanatana culture I'm talking about? Is it the poor or rich or the urban and the rural? I am talking about what? That is human. That is ultimately human. That is universal. So why are we differentiating ourselves in between? Because in core, maybe we all are same. We all are similar. So this is not an individual question. A greater part of the world is trying to know the answer. And the more work of this will specify the notions which really constitutes human. I have some more slides. I am uh, stopping here. Thank you, thank you very much. If Madam allows some questions, then I may take. No, no, maybe we will take up questions later, but Roshan, very uh, good presentation, and I think if you develop it into a paper, it will be a very good one. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, sir. So we take up the last presentation, and we will give you only five minutes. Noor Khayani and Lukman Hakim, both are students of World Literature in School of Languages and Literature. Humanities at Nalanda University. They are going to talk about Arjun Vivah in Indonesian and Indian epic tradition. Five minutes because you were late. Just talk about main points, that's it. Okay, uh, good morning. Thank you for coming, my respected teachers, and then my respected guests, and my respected friend. Uh, I do apologize for the delay. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, present uh, my presentation with my partner, Lukman Hakim. Uh, we are going to present about Arjuna Wiwaha in Indonesian and Indian epic tradition. So uh, Arjuna Wiwaha text known as D1, the one of traditional records of Japanese literary texts written by Empu Kanwa. He has devoted his life to serve King Erlanggarin. In the title of Arjun Wiwaha uh, or Arjuna Matrimony is a fame for all the old Japanese, uh, for the old Japanese by Robson. Uh, Arjuna became a protagonist on the epic rather than his sibling. Main part of this text is highlighting the precondition before Bharata Yuda was happened in, like in Mahabharata story, until the war was over. In this text, Arjuna practices meditation under the mound in Dracula in order to get a bow from the god to restore his family fortunes and glory. So, uh, because of this uh, colonization happened in uh, our country, so uh, the Dutch uh, took uh, the original version uh, to their country in Holland. And then, uh, but the English translation, it is uh, available now. Uh, because of this story is inspired by uh, Mahabharata story, it is also available, the version in English. And then the historical background of Arjuna Vivaha and Mahabharata. 
So uh, the Arjuna Vivaha was the second poem of its sort to survive. The first was the old Javanese translation of the Indian epic Ramayana, which was written around the middle of the 9th century in central of Java, while the Arjuna Vivaha was composed around two centuries later in East Java. Following the Majapahit period, Hindu Buddhist culture in Java deteriorated and the torch was carried to Bali, where the classics were carefully conserved and much new literature in the form of Kakawin and Kidung was written. Manuscript of the Arjuna Vivaha can be found in this manner on Bali, but others were stored for a long time in Java as well. The palm leaf manuscript must have been recopied several times so that the text could be transmitted down to the current day, and it has survived in such a good condition that we discovered little major alteration. So uh, the different uh, Arjuna in Mahabharata and then the role of Arjuna in Arjuna Vivaha is uh, the role the role of Arjuna in Mahabharata. So he is, uh, I think all of we know uh, in this part, I will uh, go directly what is his role in Arjuna Vivaha. So Ar Arjuna Vivaha is a Javanese epic that tells a story of Arjuna's love journey with the goddess Suprabha. The story focuses more on Arjuna's quest to win Suprabha heart. Arjuna Vivaha focuses more on Arjuna's love story with uh, Supraha. This epic describes Arjuna's quest to win Supraha hand through a series of trials and battles. Although, uh, although Arjuna Vivaha is not as focused on spiritual aspects as the Bhagavad Gita, the story also includes some mystical elements and the existence of gods and goddesses who play an important role in Arjuna's testing and search for love. Arjuna in Arjuna Vivaha is better known as a romantic hero who tries to win Suprabha heart. This story highlights Arjuna's emotional and romantic side. So the theme and significance in Arjuna Vivaha. So in the Canto first, four lines explain that the traits of a person at a specific level of spiritual development. This individual is an Paramartha Padita or scholar who comprehends the highest truth. The poem will describe the action of Arjuna who is doing something similar. He is straining himself in ascetic practices in order to trim the combat. Indeed, he is tried by the deity Indra in the shape of an elderly sake. To no, eliminate you have two more minutes to go. Okay, I will directly go with my partner. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to continue about, uh, I want to skip this one, about analysis and discussion about the story of Arjuna itself. How then Arjuna's story is crossing time, crossing culture, and crossing continents, and until now. Because Arjuna having a long, long story in Indonesian traditions, from the Hindu era, Buddhism, until Muslim tradition now. Arjuna, Mahabharata, and Ramayana now is belonging a part of Muslim society and Muslim cultures in India. So we are able to classify through structuralist uh, perspective, like from paradigmatic and syntagmatic. And Indonesian people, especially uh, to all of the hosts of Indonesian uh, islands, even though they are Muslim, Hindu, or Buddhism, or Christian, we have a belief, the society have a belief that the world, it consists of vertical. Verticals, it means with the upper world, where the God, goddess, or supernatural beings is living there, or namely with heavens. And our world here is with lower worlds. It, from paradigmatic perspective. And from syntagmatic perspective, it means it's horizontal living. So that's why, at the time, well, if we refer to the Arjuna story, Arjuna is not only a human, human is physically, but his dimension or non-physically, he is also having a supernatural uh, power inside of his, uh, in his body. Uh, so that's why at the time, Pukanwa, the writers of this story then uh, personified Airlanga, the first Hinduism kingdom in Javanese island, as Arjuna. Because at the time, Arjuna, 
are able to defeat it. We call it with Raksasa, namely is Niwatak Charaka with his arose from Indra, from Betara Indra, um, from the God of Indra. So, because of this stories, spiritual stories then, Pukanwa writings about Arjuna Vibaha texts to personify the glory of uh, Air Langa. And uh, from historical study student who would like to know about the prasasti of how Air Langa becomes the Japanese king, uh, it's available on uh, Kolkata Stone now in uh, Kolkata Museums. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Uh, with this, I think we have come to the uh, close of this particular session. I thank all the paper presenters who put forward their ideas and everybody else for being a wonderful audience. Uh, I thank Mr. Shashant Mishra for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, especially thank you, ma'am, for uh, you know accepting our invitation to chair the session and giving your full uh, beautiful insights to these students in order to develop their paper. I'm sure they must have learned a lot from their mistakes or from the maybe uh, the loopholes that they have in their papers. Uh, with this, uh, we close for the session right now, and there is tea outside waiting for all of you. We resume our session again. What time? So you have 20 minutes to finish your tea. Enjoy. 12.20, 12.15. OK, so you have just 10 minutes to finish your tea, discuss your questions with the presenters if there is any, and we're we'll, uh, going to resume our session by 12.15. The next session is going to chair by uh, Professor Ravinder Singh. And the presenters that we have uh, are, uh, ma'am. There are three presenters, Dr. Ven Brenda from Nalanda University, Bhakti Joshi from a Hindu Studies Department. She's a student in, of MA. Uh, and Sarajit Ghosh, a PhD scholar from Nalanda University. You have 20 minutes okay, sir. for your presentations. Please. Thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Uh, respected uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and uh, Dean of the School of Language. Uh, today I'd like to, and uh, all my colleagues and also my students, uh, today I'm going to uh, present a very small topic regarding wisdom and compassion depicted in the Buddhist literature and their impact on the Asian society. So, um, when the Buddha get enlightened and uh, after he, he uh, preached the Dhamma to Yasa and 54 monks, and after these 54 monks get enlightened as well become Arahant, and he also told them that um, you go, each of you go a different direction and bring a lot of uh, happiness from my teaching to other people. Jaratha bhika ve jari kang, bahujana hitaya, bahujana sukhaya, loka nu kampaya, athaya hitaya sukhaya, dewa manusanang. So go in your ways, O monks, for the benefit and happiness of many out of the compassion for the world, for the good, benefit, and happiness uh, of God and man. So, uh, as you see that in this, um, in this verses, the Buddha did not say that you convert them to become a Buddhist. But the Buddha, a lot of people misunderstand that these verses indicate that uh, this is propagating Buddhism. No, he just say that Get my Dhamma, teach them, so then they can practice and gain the happiness through the Dhamma, rather than convert them to come, become a Buddhist. This is not his aim. So uh, from, from that, we can see that uh, in the, uh, the quality of the Dhamma, uh, Swakato, 
uh, that means that teaching has to be perfect and enunciated by the Buddha. Sanditiko, that means you have to come and verify it here and now. Agaliko, whatever you practice, you can gain the happiness immediately. That is the immediate result. Ehi basiko, that means I invite you come. Come and inviting you to come to experience, to see it, rather than you have to follow me. If you don't follow me, you're going to be born in health, or uh, you will not get uh, any uh, curse on his teaching. But he said, ehi basiko, that means please come and you have to know by yourself. Upaneyako, that means leading onward to Nibbana. Whatever he teach is leading to Nibbana. Pachatang vedita po vinyo hi ti. So that means this is the Dhamma that has been comprehended and also practiced by the wise person. From this sick quality of the Dhamma that the Buddha teaches is, 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 has the quality of the compassion. And the compassion use a feature of very democratic. You have a choice. You don't have to follow me. You have to come and see. You test yourself and you verify it by yourself in order. If you find it's happy, you follow. If you don't feel that the Brahma doesn't work for you, you don't have to follow. That is a democratic that coming from the compassion. So that is during the Buddha time. And then when the Buddhism has migrated to Sri Lanka, according to the Mahavamsa, like this morning, two students has presented, and the Mahavamsa indicate that, uh, that uh, Theri, Mahatheri, uh, Sangamitra, brought the uh, sap tree, Sapro chief, that is a Buddha tree from the Budgaya, branched out and brought it to Sri Lanka in the third BC, uh, she was also the daughter of the Asoka. And Mahavamsa indicate that when she came, she brought the sapling tree and also a group of a bhikkhuni to give the ordination to the uh, people in Sri Lanka. And how does she know this? Because her brother Mahinda already came to Sri Lanka before her. And there's a group of nuns uh, which is also, uh, who are also the uh, ladies in the, in the court. So they, uh, especially the Queen Anula uh, from, from Sri Lanka back then. And she, uh, the Princess Anula, want to convert to become a, a, bhikkhu, uh, uh, a Samanari as well. So then Mahinda said, I have to invite my sister, uh, Sangamitra, to come to give the ordination. Otherwise, as a bhikkhu, I cannot give you the ordination. So then she in, he invited Maha um, Sangamitra to, to come for the gift of ordination for that purpose as well. So when uh, Sangamitra come, um, then uh, she gave the ordination to Anula with 500 uh, court ladies. And after that, um, in about according to the Chinese sources, uh, fourth century CE, this uh, lineage of the bhikkhuni has migrated to China and give the Chinese the bhikkhuni in China in fourth century onward. And so we will see that um, Shankamitra come to Sri Lanka, propagate Buddhism in a sense of give the wisdom and give the happiness to the Sri Lankan people. And so China, in the seventh century, uh, one of the empress, uh, very, very famous, she claimed herself the first lady emperor, Wu Zhitian. Wu Zhitian, she is uh, a lady that lived about uh, uh, late uh, seventh century, uh, six, 690, yeah, seventh century. And uh, she was the one that, very interesting in Buddhism, and also, uh, she understand the Buddhism very well, especially Sunyata. So you see that the word here, uh, she give herself the name is Wu Zhao. Wu Zhao does mean indicate Zhao, indicate Sunyata. And why is uh, is indicated? He she inventing this name Wu Zhao by two part. You see the top one is Ming. Ming does mean understanding, and Kong Kong does mean emptiness. And why she choose the 
She used Ming, but not Liao. Liao Jia. Liao Jia does mean understanding, theory. She did not choose that word, but she chose the Ming, like understand, because the Ming is combining with the left part is the, the sun, and the right part is the moon. So the left and the moon is too polarized. So understand that, also understand the sunyata. We need to practice the middle path as well. So this indicates that she understand the sunyata concept, and also she follow the middle path of Buddhism. So uh, then she also making sure all the people in China back then in the seventh century that follow the. Uh, Dasa Kushala Kamata. That is the ten wholesomeness uh, practice. Then, when Buddhism, uh, and this is her image, she looked a little bit choppy and a little bit not very beautiful. But according to the source, it's described that she was really beautiful. But this is when she was aging already. So, um, so then, when also another uh, eminence uh, aspect. Um, that is the um, Buddhism has been migrated to, to Tibet. And also, you, we all know about the Tibetan condition that has been dominated by China. And Dalai Lama 14, he was the one that's suffering, that losing the country. But I went to the South uh, India, um, Karnataka last uh, few weeks ago, and then I found that his uh, words of truth, basically La Lama Lama uh, words. And uh, this is quite long, but I just quote um, part of it only, and can tell that from his writing, his vow is so strong of the compassion, even though he lost his country. And uh, particularly with the pieces people of the land of snow, land of snow does mean Tibet, who, through various means, are mercilessly destroyed by the barbaric horde. On the side of the darkness, kindly let the power of your compassion arise to quickly stem the flow of the blood and tears. Those unrelentingly cruel ones, objects of compassion, maiden with the delusion evils, wanton, uh, wantonly destroy themselves and order, may they achieve the eyes of wisdom, knowing what is must be done and undone, and abide to the glory of the friendship and love. So even though he lose his country, but he doesn't have even a scan of hatred in him toward the Chinese government. And in Bhutan, Buddhism has migrated to Bhutan, and of course, Bhutan is part of the Tibetan Buddhism as well. And in the literature, uh, all the high school students must have learned the 37 practice of Bodhisattva book. Uh, and this Bodhisattva book is basically uh, teach the student in high school what is the precept, what is the samadhi, and what is the panya, and bodhicitta, that is the, um, the, 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 the mind of keeping ourselves to become a, a bodhisattva, that is metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. So then I move on to uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam uh, literature. And Vietnam literature has been influenced by the Chinese and also Indian Buddhism since the first century CE already. But the most eminent event during the 12, uh, 1200 58 and to 1338, uh, that is the, uh, the king, Trần Nhân Tông. He uh, was a king, and after that, for some time, he passed out the uh, throne to his son. And he went into the jungle and he practiced uh, meditation. But in 1303, he knew that back then, Vietnam been very, very strong country, because three times, Vietnam already conquered, not conquered, but defeated the uh, Chinese invasion. And, but then the Vietnam now also, his son also want to invade to the south, to the Chamba. So then uh, he knew that. And then he, has to, uh, he had to get out of the, 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 uh, uh, the jungle and went to the Chamba country. And he lived there for nine years. 
What did he do for these nine years? According to the source, he preached the Dhamma to the king called Sinha Wanang III. And Sinha Wanang III is the king of Chamba back then in the uh, 13th century. And so he also uh, convinced the king, do not fight back to the Vietnam because Vietnam is so strong. And if there is a battle, then they're going to have a bloodshed. So uh, then somehow the uh, Sinha Wan uh, Wanam agreed with him and you two provinces to what Vietnam back then. But just yielding like that, uh, it's kind of like awkward. Uh, toward the Chamba people. So then the king uh, offered to marry her daughter to, to the king of Jana Sinha Wamma. So that is the way of using the knowledge and also compassion toward the people to stop the, uh, the war. And uh, in the contemporary uh, uh, society in Vietnam, uh, which is really uh, recent. In 1963, the, uh, uh, the Ngo Dan Yin, the president uh, of Vietnam in 1973, um, he, he uh, tried to suppress Buddhism and also uh, suppress other human rights as well. So 1963, Vietnam witnessed a severe violence of human rights under the Ngo Dan Yin. And regarding the suppression of human rights and religion freedom, despite with the un, uh, united effort of the Buddhist Sangha and civil and seeking for freedom, their struggle remained unsuccessful so many days and months. In the poignant choice to set um, the turning point when Venerable uh, Thich Quang Duc, he set himself in a fire serving as a powerful symbol of resistance against the Yim regime. This led immolation and uh, had the immediate and profound impact, rapidly spreading the news of his nonviolence protests within the Vietnam and around the world, prompting the shocking wave of reaction. Um, and now we can find that uh, there's a few vocabularies that we found in the Vietnam's uh, literature, like oh, sometimes we call the deity as Bud. This is the word Bud. And actually, this Bud is come from the uh, uh, words Buddha. So that's why when people say Bud, uh, ultimately people understand that someone that's supernatural. And also you will see that voter, if, you, if the people who don't really understand or know about Buddhism, they don't know what is voter, which is anicca, uh, impermanence, and then vonga, anatta. So uh, also vipaka, that is the, uh, the retribution. All of these vocabularies you will find in the very common in the uh, Buddhist literature, not only with Buddhist literature, but it's, it's been merged into the Vietnamese literature as well. So I, I also including uh, the sources here uh, that whoever would like to know about the source, but some of the source that I including uh, the Vietnamese uh, sources. So um, I conclude that Buddhism migrate to other countries is influenced across Asia during the ancient times and eventually reached throughout the rest of the world through two key factors, compassion and knowledge. This spreading has contributed to the numerous positive aspects, including enriching tradition and language embedded in this culture and profound this humanity. Compassion is not just a concept or a way of life that encourage nonviolence, peace, harmony, respect, and also promote the human value. Knowledge empower individuals to make choice in their spiritual journey and learning. It help people understand that the knowledge, that the language and culture are mere vehicles for conveying the teaching. At the same time, the true ascent lies in the comprehending the Dhamma and the practice application, and which is the path to genius, spirit, uh, spiritual liberation. 
Spending with the ancient time to the contemporary era is become the evidence that two fundamental elements in the Buddhist teaching, compassion and knowledge, not only play a crucial role in the human liberation, but also serve as the cornerstone of practice, foster the social peace. This principle enables individuals to employ the strategy to such a negotiation and dialogue, prompting understanding and non-violence. Ultimately, they contribute to the establishment of democratic and social political peace within a nation. Thank you. I invite for any question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben Brenda, for completing this presentation within time. And you are very focused on the theme. Uh, uh, what I saw in your uh, presentation that you tried to establish the relation between dharma and society. So our society is basically East perspective is of dharma centric and the problems that emerge in the society are resolved through the dharma only, through those practices and your uh, focus was on the wisdom and compassion as depicted in the Buddhist literature. So uh, the important thing I think is the reading of Eastern literature is essentially should be through the our own worldview, our uh, uh, perspective of society, how the society has been constructed through these norms. Uh, very well presented. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any you. Uh, question for or comment in short, if there is any. Thank you very much. Thank I see you. no question. So we'll move to our next presentation. Uh, Bhakti Joshi, she's an MA student in Hindu studies. You have 10 minutes. So I'll request if you could directly go to your yes. uh, presentation and points that you want yes. to share. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I won't take much time. I'll just start off uh, with my um, This is broadly the contents which of my presentation. Uh, we'll start with the objectives, um, the meaning of Ganas and Janapadas, and uh, their administration and governance, governance, and how effective they, whether they were d democratic republics is, is the, basically this is just a question mark where I want to do further research, and the implications on the way forward. Starting with the objectives of the study, um, broadly, this study is about people and the faith of uh, the faith of the people and the capabilities of the people that uh, that may have instilled uh, uh, theories on governance and administration. So, uh, having said that, we look at the meaning and interpretation of gunners, how they may have governed and administered administered in ancient India and whether they formed uh, the basis for effective democratic republics in the, in the later period. Starting with the meaning of ganas. <clears throat> so Panini called gana as ruled by numbers. And uh, gana was also called as samga, which, which technically turned out to be governing republic bodies. Um, I've given, these are the two types of Ganas and Samga or Samgas that were identified by Panini and Kautilya's Arthashastra. So the first type is the Raja Shabdo Pajivan, which is basically a Gana that had an elected king. And uh, Ayudha, uh, Ayudha Jivan or Shastro Pajivan was the term given by Kautilya and Ayudha Jivan was a term given by Panini. 
on how they had elected executive councils and military leaders. Um, the most interesting part about this is Ayudha Jeevan, Shastrupa Jeevan probably did not have a king. They were run by executive council members. And uh, even with the military leaders, they, they elected elect military leaders on the basis of a different campaign. So every campaign related to war or anything, or if there were any peace negotiations, they would elect a military leader for that particular campaign. So we won't have one single military leader uh, 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 heading the campaign. Uh, Raja Shabdopajivan basically divided into two parts, Kula and Jati. Uh, the best example for Raja Shabdopajivan would be the Kurus, Panchalas, and uh, Lichavis, Lichavikas. And uh, Shastropajivan, Ayudhapajivan, uh, uh, the examples, best examples would be, um, I'm sorry, uh, Malavas and Yodeyas. So there is another small circle I mentioned on Shrenis. So Shreni was also a, a, a gana, but at the same time, in certain, certain times, Shrenis were associations or gunners of guilds and samga, which also contributed to the, uh, uh, to their, uh, uh, contributed to the Republican uh, setup. All of these set up as Janapada. So, a Janapada is basically a nation, a territory, and it is, it comprises all Ganas and all uh, monarchical setups as well. So Ganas used to be a part of Janapada. And uh, Janapada, according to Kautilya, was one of the seven elements of a sovereign state. It was also considered to be an excellence of a king. So the other six were basically the king itself, himself, uh, the Amatya, the minister, Janapada, the entire territory, and uh, uh, there was uh, Durga, which is the forts, Kosha, which is treasury, and uh, Mitra, that is an ally. So, administration and governance. Um, the administration and governance could be, like, simply said as in the Vedic age, you had Samiti, which consisted of um, a common Samiti where you had a meeting of a meeting together as an assembly. So all people met in a Samiti, and they had a common policy, a common goal, a common mind. Uh, there was also a Sabha. So, uh, uh, not all Samitis had Sabha, but some of them had Sabhas, and these Sabhas acted probably, probably as consultants. So they were fathers of the council or they were elders. And not all samitis had sabhas, but sabhas and samitis existed. But they somehow uh, are not mentioned in other literatures post uh, uh, earlier than Dharma Sutras. And then we come to Pora Janapada. Now, um, the term over here, Pora Janapada, Janapada is a nation. The people of Janapada, the person of a Janapada is called Janapada. And Pura is the capital. So a Pura becomes a city assembly. Janapada becomes a, a state assembly. So this basically Pura Janapada has twin assemblies. And they took influences from the Samiti Sabha. So even if Samiti Sabha uh, ceased to exist, and I mean, there's no evidence of them in literatures, Pora Janapada took influences from Samiti and Sabha. And their functions broadly involved election, re-elections of king, coronation ceremonies, social religious celebrations, debates on war, peace, punishments for fraudulent acts of kings. Basically, what this slide says is how sovereignty was vested in central assemblies uh, of the people called Vishaha. And they involved basically several discussions on social and political debates. The next part is <clears throat> the effective, whether they were effective democratic republics. Uh, this is this boring table. I know it is boring. Uh, this is from uh, Shanti Parva Mahabharat. And this is actually a conversation between Yudhishthara and Bhishma, where Yudhishthara asks uh, Bhishma, 
what is a gunner, what is the nature of the gunner, how can they prosper, or how can they avoid uh, a disunion from enmity, uh, uh, enmity or disunion from their enemies. So um, Bhishma gave a nice, and it was a poetic verse. I didn't mention the verse, but I presented that in a boring table, dividing them into two two parts of what strong gunner constitutes and what weak gunner constitutes. So broadly, what the strong gunners constitute is how uh, people played an important role in a strong gunner. They were all disciplined, they were all wealthy, they were all educated, and they focused on main common goal being their own well-being and the society's well-being. So that constituted a strong gunner. And uh, the weak gunner obviously is the opposite of that, which was fested by greed, jealousy, hatred among each others, and there were always disputes between them. Kautilya's Arthashastra had a twist, added some twist to this. Broadly, Kautilya preferred all gunners to be acquired in a Janapada, all of them. That was desirable. But if there were some gunners which were not as, um, as um, uh, how, if the Janapada was not as strong as the strong gunners, then an alliance was preferred, or a treaty was preferred, or a subsidy was preferred. While uh, the weak gunners were very easy to capture, but then he still uh, prescribed that they should be conquered by the army and they should be punished. Like, there should be disunion between them. So, what are the broad implications? <clears throat> broad implications, uh, I'll come back to, uh, I'll come to the point where we talk about internal harmony and direct outreach, which is a major problem with with our country today and many countries today where people don't get along with each other. So this particular aspect of internal harmony where a community-driven approach is taken and that community-driven approach is also through pervasive education and knowledge in the society that leads to a strong gunner and a strong republican unit. Uh, that is the broad implication. Obviously, the other thing is how large Janaka, uh, Janapadas uh, with larger populations was considered to be advantageous. So that's another thing which is, which is the main implication out of this. Can you please conclude with your own submission? Okay. It's time. All right. Um, <clears throat> broadly, what I wanted to say is uh, how uh, we focus on the rights but not on our duties. And this is an additional in, uh, study that I've that I want to take ahead, where I want to understand the, the, the dominance and the authority of the gunners, and whether there was some transmission of ideologies that was practiced while, they, uh, while, they, uh, while their political networks spread around as they uh, collected all the gunners around with them and formed a Janapada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have taken a very, uh, I think, vast topic yes, as yes, for yes. this seminar. Yes, yes. So all the best for your uh, future uh, endeavor in research. Thank you. Basically, Thank you. I think you have taken the book of uh, uh, V.S. Agarwal. Yes, Agarwal, yeah. Jaiswal, actually. Uh, India as known to Panini. No, uh, I took up Jaiswal, Hindu polity, okay. uh, and uh, Altikar and uh, Beni Prasad. I would and suggest if you uh, go more deep into yes, that yes. book, India as known to Panini. Okay. Because uh, Panini, as we uh, earlier understood that, it's about the grammar only. Right, right. Astadhyaya is not just about the grammar. Yes, it yes. It has vast knowledge of geography and social structures, administration, yes. so many things. Sure. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, if I may, I have a question here. Yeah? It's not. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, just one minute. Ha, one minute. It's just an observation. Can you go on to the slide where Samiti was written? Sure. The last slide? Which this one? slide. Yeah. If you can see here, uh, Samiti is written as some. It 
Yes. Yeah. Samiti. That's not samiti in the word uh, in the context you are using here. It's samiti when you say samiti, the committee. Yeah. It's sam upsarg in in gata udhatu. It says to go. Who uh, uh, some a collective collectiveness? They go together. That's okay. samiti here. Some of sir, ingato root is here, dhatu, and thin pratya is here. Okay. The samiti you have used here, some iti, it means war, yudh. Okay. So it's a okay. mistake okay. here, please correct it. Sure, sure. When you are dealing with Sanskrit, like you, it, this, these are yes, the things yes. you should yeah, keep in your yeah. mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, now I request for the next presentation Surajit Ghosh, who is a PhD scholar. I think you have your own audience here. Yeah. Okay, hello. So, good afternoon to the honorable chair, honorable respected vice chancellor, sir, professors, and my dear friends. So, today I'm going to uh, present on the text Thedi Gatha, which can be translated as the verses of the elder nuns. And, uh, uh, let me introduce the text first of all a bit. Uh, that Therikatha is a classical anthology of poems. It's a collection of 73 poems divided into 522 verses. So it's associated with the first group of Buddhist monastic women uh, who went into the forth into the state of homelessness during the times of Buddha. And uh, the text has been highly debated. It has, in the past, it has uh, attracted critique of the feminist scholars as well as uh, the 19th century uh, women scholars who initially started translating uh, from Pali. Now the uh, main key points. So I have prepared an extensive 31 pages paper which I can make available after I publish it, but I will try to keep short within the time following the main arguments. So the main arguments that I want to discuss is that uh, the text is debated with whether, though it is attributed to the first group of women, is it at all written by women? Like, because we know the first council that happened in Rajagriha, where the texts were being chanted and the documentation were being made, it did not welcome any bhikshunis when the Buddha advocated himself the fourfold Sangha. That means it was, it could have been the case that nuns were present initially in the Sangha, but the records do not say so. So now uh, I will uh, draw your attention towards these two paragraphs, like rather I would say from the Kalla Vaga, uh, chapter 10, which talks about the duties of the bhikshunis. Like, the incidents happens at Vaishali, Northern Bihar, where the Buddha is sitting, and Mahapajavati Gotami, his foster mother, along with 500 women, standing outside the door, waiting for his permission to go forth. And uh, Ananda intervenes, because initially it is said, the texts say that he denied the admission of women. So Ananda questions the Buddha that, are women, Lord, capable of the going forth? And you can see the words used. The Blessed One says, they are capable, Ananda. So who are these they and uh, what is the term Arahat? Like, because why this term is very important is that if we look at the Pali Canon, uh, the word Arahat is mainly used in context of the Theras or the elder monks. We do not find a equivalent for the female, the Arahati. Like, uh, when, in many cases, the Buddha himself declares that nuns, especially the early bhikkhuni Khema and Upallavana, they are very much wise. They are called the Agga Savikas, that means the foremost nuns because of their special quality. Like, and the Buddha himself declares that they can teach or propagate the Dhamma in the same way as he would have taught to the public. So given that question in mind, like we need to understand that even though the word arahat, which derived from the word ar in Rig Veda, which means to reach a high state of awakening for a person, and that's why the monk or the practitioner or the nun, 
derives the title of being an arahat. But no specific bhikkhuni is mentioned as an arahati when given there was a declaration, yes, they are capable. So now we need to understand the politics of the text, that how a subtle suppression happens, like how the voice of the female becomes latent during the composition of the text. Uh, we can see, I have put example uh, of Therigata verse 6061, the evil one, the Mara, like if you can consider it is like Satan in the theological uh, paradigms, like uh, makes an uncomfortable advance to Bhikkuni Soma while he was meditating under the tree and he uh, tries to tempt her and distract her from a path by saying that it's hard to get a place that, that sages want to reach. It is not possible for a woman, especially not one with the two fingers worth of wisdom. Now, now what does he mean by this two-fingered wisdom? Because he immediately assumes that a woman's work is to just cook rice. And what we do when we uh, try to understand whether the rice is cooked or not, we try to press one rice. So see how he demeans, uh, try to. Now we need to understand, is Mara a male figure? Maybe not. Maybe it's a societal voice uh, of in the medieval period when the textual compositions were happening, trying to somehow subordinate the order of the nuns in a very tactful manner. So if you see the verse, the reply provided by Bhikkhuni Soma to Mara is that what does being a woman have to do with it? What count is that the heart is settled that one sees what reality is? If we give a very superficial reading, it would appear that the text somehow empowers women because it speaks about, about their realization, it speaks about their wisdom. But if you see the dark side of it a little bit, it not there a certain assumption that, uh, that they do not celebrate the natural instinct of a woman, the femaleness? It is assumed that uh, they are somehow like a seductress or they are full of lust. And uh, uh, once they g understand the dhamma of the Buddha, they cured. So you need to see the pattern, how the text has been formulated, all these 73 verses. Like, so it shows that as if the female is lamenting about her own body, like uh, sh she finds disgrace in her female birth, which usually cannot be the case, I hope. Like, we need to understand that any inner defilement is a natural instinct. We need to recognize it's there. The question is about controlling it once we understand the dhamma. So I have talked about this. Uh, so the main question that lies is that even the verses may seem very uh, putting women at a very empowered position or trying to celebrate the wisdom, but we need to understand that how also in a very latent way these verses uh, celebrate the female agency in early Buddhist monasticism and the shift of power dynamics between the order of the monks and the order of the nuns. And I need to tell that the colonial translators were much more uh, busy with the, relating it with the Dhammapala's commentary, Paramatta Dipani, while they failed to understand how it can relate to the modern contemporary Sanghas, how there is a burden of this text on the contemporary Bhikshuni Sangha because they have nothing to relate. The, uh, even the modern nuns whom I study, like the contemporary nunneries, they do not relate to this text. So you see the words like the initial translation by C Mrs. C.F. Davis, who uses the word Psalms of the Sisters, or like, uh, and also tries to figure out that whether these monastic women can be put to a category in the society, that means she's trying to understand from a Eurocentric point of view and calls them arms women. Now, when the initial uh, discussion happens, the translations, the analysis of the translations, the Eurocentric scholars were busy in comparing the Therigatha with the Theragatha. That means the verses of the monks with the verses of the nuns. Question is, is the word thera and theri used in the equivalent sense? Because when we understand the word thera, they are usually the elder nuns who have already achieved the state of arahatwood 
and it is definitely uh, when they find their place in this uh, anthology of poems, that means they are the most realized ones. But when we come to the Theri Gatha, the nowhere it is mentioned that they are at the Arahati, that means the supreme realized ones. While we need to understand that uh, in certain verses it is told, yes, she have received the teaching of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha has been done. This aspect or itthi araham, the word uses particularly itthi araham, which means that they have realized, which can imply that they have already reached the state of arahati. Also, you need to understand the placing of the text. In the Pali Canon, the text is found in the Khuddha Kanikaya, Khudra, like that means the minor collections, not even finding its place in the main discourses. See how the internal Sangha politics or the composition of the, like the, the initial composition after the first council tries to put women at a certain, at a certain subordinated position. The, then my question is, when we listen about the Agga Savikas or the foremost nuns like Mahapajapati being the foremost or Bhikshuni Khema who is so well articulated in the art of meditation and there is a special quality of the nuns, Bhikkhunis, due to which they are termed as, as the foremost. So who are they? Then why these uh, verses are called the Udanas or the exalted utterances? As I said, like, uh, uh, this is a declaration, public declaration made by the Buddha that Bhikkhuni Khema and Upalavana can teach the Dhamma exactly in the same way I, I would have taught to the public. So the gendered aspect, if we understand the composition pattern of the Theragatha and the Therigatha, we need to understand that it's the, the, the tone in the Theragatha is much more authoritative, as if it's coming as a very, from a very realized person trying to declare what sh it should be the case. While in contrast, we we, when we look at the verses of the bhikkhunis in the Therigatha, they are much more personal, they are much more emotional because it's hardly in the text where uh, it is recorded that the bhikshuni is getting a direct teaching from the Buddha. That means in the same way in which the Buddha has uh, accumulated the wisdom or cultivated the wisdom from first-hand experiences, mostly the bhikshunis in the same manner has also cultivated the wisdom out of their own practice much more. Rather than, I think, the order of the monks were much more privileged enough to get direct teachings from the Buddha. So the entire text is divided into these uh, uh, one verse poems or two verse poems. So these are all the categories like in my paper I have uh, tried to identify all the uh, all the verses like uh, that is attributed to all the bhikshunis and also try to uh, understand their special quality. Let me once, like, yeah, this is one of the example. I have done it for all the categories, like the two verses, three in my extensive paper. If we see the first bhikkhuni, the therika, the Buddha declares a quality that she has achieved all that it takes to be a theri. That's what the text mentions. And the liberating factor is that the passion of sex has shriveled away. Also, in case of Bhikshuni Mutta, like the Buddha declares that her, that her main quality is of being free from all graspings, and the goal achieved or the liberating factor is the her mind is completely free. So there can be an extensive list that goes on, uh, because you know, no, the texts do not really recognize this, their special qualities, just the verses trying to prove that as if there was some defilement in the woman and after the receiving the dhamma they get skewed. A certain way of putting uh, the uh, woman sangha into a much more subordinated position. So yes, another, another example can be uh, the verse of Bhikkhuni Sumeda where while she is walking in the forest a rogue or a like, uh, bad person trying to make uncomfortable advance and uh, also uh, sees her body as a medium of lust. And uh, uh, while, while she, he tri tries to tempt her and distract her, Bhikkhuni Sumeda gives the answer, what should I cling like a worm to a body that will only turn into corpse? 
a sack always oozing, frightening, stinking, foul, foul and putrid, filled with foul things. Now you need to understand that, see the pattern. It may, it may, it may seem that the woman has been extremely realized, but why does the, uh, and, and, and yes it is, the women are realized and they understand the fact that our human body is fragile and this speaks of the deep philosophical insight of the Buddha's anicca, the impermanence. But you see, the text assumes the female body as impure. Uh, so it's time to conclude. Okay. Can you give your submission? Also see another, uh, the two predominant themes that we find in Therigatha is the disgust with one owns body and physical cravis, cravings as if the female is lamenting about her female birth and also grief due to loss of child which is related to the assumption that the practical function of a woman body is to bear a child. And also you see a very critical observation is Yashodhara, the partner of Sid like not uh, like Siddhartha before he becomes the Buddha is not mentioned in the Therigatha while the verse of Mahaprajapati Gautami, the mother, his foster mother finds place in the Therigatha means there's a tendency to sanctify the mother, the identity of a mother while when uh, Yashodhara being a wife does not find the place as it's, there can be a romantic angle. Now the impact on Southeast Asia this inherent, this projection of the verses that the woman as if lamenting about their own body, the a practice started in Japan in Southeast Asia like that uh, uh, an aristocrat woman, Ono Komachi, is being depicted, the, her corpse is being depicted as if it is dying in, uh, decaying nine stages and people used to meditate on it. Nowhere in the text, in the Buddhist teachings, it is mentioned that a woman body has to be considered impure. Even I can meditate on my own body, considering uh, I, can, I can visualize my body as being, being burnt or uh, I am decaying. Like So, uh, see how woman bodies, the, how the element of impurity gets connected to woman. So, these are my primary sources. These are the main arguments that I made uh, in short. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Surajit. Very uh, well structured paper, and I think you have taken and responded to the Western perspective on the Indian or uh, Buddhist literature and its text uh, because most of the queries and the interpolation happened after the uh, translation and the reading by Western theoretical ideas. So you have very well responded to that and I think your uh, work and your research will go in that direction and fulfill the other uh, aspect of this thing. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Any questions, sir? Yes, please. Of course, I came late, so maybe you have already responded to what I'm going to ask. But I have one question in the context of your paper, and as Sir also said, that it, okay, Western theories, and in that we are understanding it. So, <coughs> since it is just the opposite, so in that context I am putting you a question. How do you define empowerment in the context of your paper? Okay. Is it slightly different, or is it in any way different with what the <coughs> contemporary Western thoughts tell us in terms of empowerment or empowerment of women, etc. anything. So how do you define empowerment in that context? Yeah. And how is it different from the perspectives that the West has put? Okay, okay sir. Thank you, sir, for your question. Like, I would like to respond that uh, if we look at the past Western scholarship, they are trying to put up the same point, but they are placing the Theragatha beside in comparison with Therigatha. That means they are trying to find the differences in translations and trying to understand that uh, how words has been used uh, to depict wo realization of women vis-a-vis -vis or verses, how words have been used to depict awakening of men, the monks. While in this process, when the Eurocentric scholarship is, has been, I think, over-obsessed with translation of Pali, 
because we do not find Chinese or much, uh, which, uh, which means much later, and uh, they, they take it for assumption that Pali is the authoritative language. Uh, they do not speak that how today the Bhikshuni Sangha is really burdened with such basic assumptions. The, uh, now, now why, as your question, that how I define the term empowerment is that I'm trying to project that even if uh, there are translations, uh, they are trying to speak about how the women went forth, their narratives, how they create, probably created the womanistic space even in the early uh, Sangha during the times of the historical Buddha. But what's a latent intention is, you see this pattern in every verses where they speak of their, uh, as if they're lamenting about their female birth, which cannot be the case because uh, as a Buddhist, when I understand the teachings, we need to accept, that is, we should not have any grasping about any particular views. There are defilements, the Dhamma helps us to eradicate those false views. It's not necessary for women to lament about their female birth as if they are trying to get rid of their, this life, like... Uh, never, never, never. No, no. Is there visibility? <laughs> Just Sir, last... I have a question. Yeah. Okay. okay, you first, please. Uh, okay. Like, there are two observations, yeah. what Sir has said here. Uh, when you were saying the, 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 there was this person who was who were making like advances towards Sumedha, I guess, Bhikkhuni Sumedha, mm. and she replied by saying the like fragility of the body, like uh, body says it's oozing and everything. Don't you think she's trying to say that you are just lusting over this body, you are not going after the enlightenment, this body, and she then she described that this body is something like this, that perishable body, it will turn into corpse. Yes, How I, is I she saying so that, that female see, body see, is disgusting? A body has two mediums. A body is a medium of two, two-fold like, things. Like that. I have another question, then you can answer, please. And the word arhat, you say, arhat is used in all three genders. It's a three gender, kli, three, three gender words, like manushya. Manushya can be used for female and males both. So the word arhat is used for both of them. Hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. And if you look at that in Pali, somewhere you can, uh, Pali in upper branch, you can, uh, in, in, even in Hindi, arhata. Arhata still means yogya, yogyata. Yogya, yeah. Yeah, so arhat, it doesn't, it's, it's not like arhati, arhati cannot be there, because if you go by the Sanskrit word, it can be arhata. Arhati is not uh, necessary to make it with, uh, end with E, arhati. So the word, what you're making your, uh, like, Hypothesis here, like the word arhata wasn't there, that they were not gi given equal space there. No, so arhata no, no. was it's used. Arhata can be used, and it is used for all three, ma like females and masculines. Like I would respond to that. That even that is the case. I understand. I have also noticed that. But do you see any particular cases where a bhikshuni has been declared a arhata? Is just written both men and women can be. Like if you see the theragatha or the text that is related to men. There are extensive mentions of Arahat this bhikshu, Arahat this bhikshu. When you come to the Therigatha, there is not a single case, even when there's a declare, I understand that you, you understand Arahat, or even I understand Arahat as a uh, like gender inclusive term, and it can be for like all the genders, but there hasn't been a single mention of a bhikshuni as the Arahat. So thereby, I propose that there could have been a term Arahatiya, equivalent of the term Arahat, uh. Actually, my, my question is kind of piggybacks. Or it's interesting we're all talking about language, all three questions. Um, my question was similar to yours, but a little more specific. And that's the original source in the, la the original language for the word impure, as it's translated impure. Is that um, a meaning? Um, the fact of a sexual arousal in a male, like a bhikkhu, in terms if there is a female present, right, impure, in the, you know, the attraction, physical attraction in a, in a bhikkhu or in the sangha, or is it a connotation to the monthly, you know, um, physical cycle of menstruation necessary for um, birth? 
reproduction. Yeah, you, you are right. I think, Chris, you are right because. Uh, or is, it, is it both? I don't know. No, it's it's. Uh, you need to understand that even when the Buddha says that uh, there can be female arahat, or like he said, both men and women can be arahat. You also know in the Bahuda Tuka Sutta, the Buddha declares that women cannot attend Buddhahood. Like. So now you understand the difference. That means uh, uh, that a woman can reach the highest state of awakening, yet cannot be the Buddha. And if you also see the Lotus Sutra or, or rather Saddhamika Pundarika Sutra, there is a verse which uh, even in the Bhaudatuka Sutta, like uh, it says that women are impure because they menstruate or they are, uh, their main function is childbirth because they, they see it as a suffering, as a uh, uh, attachment to a child, as a sort of grasping. Uh, so somehow you're right, like yes. Like even if the term is neutral, but there are certain ways in certain contexts we can use it when it comes to a female, like in the text. Okay. Oh, thank you. I've been trying to get a, a, a clear answer to that question for a while. And that's very sufficient. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Surajit. Uh, with this, thank we you, come sir. to thank you, end sir. of this. Uh, a session because seminar doesn't mean the end of questions yeah. and the more question will arise for the possibility of next seminar also thank, thank you, you, you very much thank you and i thanks professor sushanti suvita ji and uh, honorable vice chancellor ji dr mohanti ji for their presence and more and great thanks to Professor Kapil Kapoorji and Professor uh, Mrs. Kapoor for their presence. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I was actually about to say Sushant sir, but I ended up saying my own name. Uh, okay, so here we break for lunch uh, and we resume the session by. Two o'clock. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for chairing the session. And uh, that was wonderful having you. the people sitting here to uh, all the people present here to be seated um, we as we proceed with the sessions here we have our sixth session that's a plenary session chaired by professor ranga kapoor ji and uh, our speaker is going to be professor rajneesh kumar mishra from jnu i request uh, professor sushant mishra to kindly come on the podium and introduce. I, I, I welcome, I invite our both the chair and the speaker to be on stage. Okay, so here uh, we are in the sixth session and the plenary session, first plenary session of this conference being addressed by, so here we are in the sixth session uh, and the first plenary session of this uh, seminar. Uh, this uh, session, uh, our chair has already announced is Professor Ranga Kapoor, uh, Vice uh, Principal 
and Professor of English of Delhi University, Vice Principal of IP College, an eminent scholar of uh, English. And uh, our speaker is uh, Professor Rajneesh Kumar Mishra, who is uh, an uh, eminent uh, linguist working on uh, Indian uh, grammatical traditions for long. And he has uh, conceptualized uh, in two of his books, Buddhist Literary Theory and Shaiva Literary Theory. And this is where I, I thought that Buddhist school and Buddhist scholars will interact more with him uh, because that is something which I don't think any Buddhist school in India teaches or even thinks about. So it goes beyond the boundary and that is our world literature. Because others have boundary, we don't have boundary. Uh, we are thinkers uh, sans frontiers. So uh, that is a speciality that we have. Uh, so uh, he has uh, contributed in various ways. Uh, he is a member of a Manuscript Mission of India also. And they have collected and they have preserved and they are still working on the manuscripts of uh, various parts of India and abroad. Uh, related to um, uh, various aspects of Indian knowledge systems. He has been uh, involved on various projects on Indian knowledge systems in various capacities and has himself produced uh, a number of uh, uh, books and uh, research papers, etc. And he touches upon various other uh, roles also in his life uh, as an eminent scholar in this field as a member of IGNCA, and since he knows music also, so he brings in the aesthetics aspects also. So one of the few people who works on the aesthetics based on Indian knowledge systems in general. I am, of course, using the very general terms. Uh, so, uh, sir, now uh, his topic uh, is again uh, related to Kalidasas and, uh, and uh, Abhigyana Shakuntalam. Uh, in world literature, con conceptualizing that in the world literature, how it helps us conceptualize world literature. <coughs> so uh, now, uh, may I request uh, Professor Ranga Kapoor to take over the session and invite the speaker for his, uh, for delivering his uh, lecture of this plenary session. Thank you. Jambu uh, Dvipe. भारत खंड में इस महाविहार में ये सचेत सक्रिय और समर्पित भूमि का मैं नमन करती हूँ ये आ, ये ये एक पुण्य भूमि है क्योंकि इसमें क्योंकि इसमें इसमें बड़े बड़े विद्वान और पुण्यात्माएं यहाँ काफी देर के लिए रहे हैं उनके देह छोड़ने के लिए मैं उन आ, हमारे पूर्वजों का नमन करती हूँ उन पूर्व आचार्य वर्ग का नमन करती हूँ जिन्होंने आ, अपना देह तो छोड़ दिया पर हमें अपने अपार ज्ञान की धरोहर दे गए हैं उनको ये मैं समर्पित करती हूँ अपना नमन यहाँ उपस्थित वयोवृद्ध विद्वा जो वे वृद्ध वयोवृद्ध और जिज्ञासु शिक्षक और विद्यार्थी लोगों को मैं अपना नमन समर्पित करती हूँ मैं इस उम्र की हूँ शायद यहाँ सबसे बड़ी उम्र में मैं हूँ महिला की तौर पर तो मेरा ये फर्ज बनता है आशीर्वाद देने के लिए कि ये प्रथा जो है जो बहुत बहुत सदियों से चला आ रहा है ज्ञान का संचय करना उसका आदर करना वो वो लगातार चलते रहे नाउ आई स्विच टू नाउ आई स्विच टू हिंदी यदि मेरी वचन में कुछ त्रुटियाँ रही हों तो मैं क्षमा प्रार्थी हूँ हिंदी मेरी मातृभाषा नहीं है मैं दक्षिण भारत की हूँ तो हो सकता है कुछ त्रुटियाँ रही हों नाउ आई स्विच टू हिंदी आई ट्राइड ट्रांसलेटिंग द फर्स्ट फोर वर्ड्स फर्स्ट फोर सेंटेंसेस 
of Naman in English, but found that no translation I could make was satisfactory. This, I think, uh, supports the point which I heard yesterday in a paper by Deepak, who was, Deepak, I'm sorry, I'm calling the Deepak instead of saying Deepak Ji. Uh, Deepak Ji, who read a paper on the limits and viability of translation of text into a foreign language. Our own languages are not foreign languages. They are our languages and they belong to the culture. In the very lively discussion that followed, uh, Dr. Kapoor, who happens to be my husband, Dr. Kapoor uh, made two points. One, that no trans translation will be completely true to what we want to say. And he made the further point, which seemed to me to be valid, that if you translate a text from one Indian languages, say that uh, the Vaishvi schedule, the translation will be uh, far more effective and many things we lose out on will be there for us. If such translations are made and they are very easily made. I take this opportunity of thanking the august and distinguished uh, administrative bodies of the uh, university, particularly the vice chancellor and Dr. Sushant Mishra, who by apart from being a very dear person to us, is also a very able administrator. I am very grateful to them for giving me, who is basically an English teacher, to be part of this board, part of this conference and learn a few things myself, because we can always learn. Then uh, the uh, operative words of what has been happening all these days are uh, uh, Nalanda and world literature. Please note the conjunction. Nalanda is not only this particular place, it is an area. Yesterday I went to uh, the remains of Nalanda and there I saw the magnificent ruins but I was not sad because Nalanda, the area, is like a phoenix. After every destruction, it rises and recovers itself. And here I'd like to quote again Dr. Kapoor, who has very firmly asserted and tried to uh, prove that uh, in India, there is a heritage of if you, lo if you have lost something, you recover that something also. Yesterday, I met uh, the guide. He was a very uh, ordinary kind of person. Apart from being very particular uh, and precise in his description of the history of the place, he taught me two things. When he came to the destruction by Bakhtiar Khilji in the 13th century of the magnificent Bihar, I still think of this place as Mahavipa. He, uh, he told us that Bhaktiar Khilji to Chelege par ye hai abhi hai. He was not referring to the physical remains because just before that he had told us yaha teen chizne hua karti thi. Ajayan, Abhyas, Anubhuti. I was so startled for a moment. I did not know this. And he, so I was very happy that he, at the ground level, at the ground level, the knowledge that this area has produced is still in the language and consciousness of people. I, I, I think this is an extremely hopeful uh, thing we are seeing around here. Sorry, I, what I said I have to read. Nalanda is, as an area, I, I don't only refer to the city, but the entire Nalanda, apart from the great Mahatma Buddha, who changed the world, and it's a marvel to see how he changed the ideas of the world. Apart from that, there have been hundreds of scholars I can, who, who have come to India or who have gone out of India. I cannot take time out to mention all those because I'll be here for another two hours. But I'll mention Hyun San, who his name, I'm told, translated means Moksha Deva. He stayed here for 15 years and compiled many manuscripts for to be sent home as well. So, uh, and here is where the great Adi Shankara on his Shankara Vijayam 
defeated Mandal Mishra, and please note this also, and his wife, in case we all think only men did the argument, you see, uh, the, uh, in debate, not at the point of the sword. The ideas were accepted by Mandal Mishra, who later on went on to uh, do his work in the new field which he had learned. I mention this to show, I'm here not to lecture to you all about what you all already know, because they are there in your archives, they are there in your books, they are there everywhere. N Nalanda, you, for me, I have come here for the first time, but I do not feel strange, because Nalanda is part of the mental landscape of most Indians. We, we carry it within us, and that is the uh, important. As far down as south, in 5th or the 6th centuries AD, there are two epics, Shilakadi Ravan and Manimekhalai, which are about Buddhism. Particularly the second one, Manimekhalai, is about the debate that Manimekhalai, the heroine of, or the woman protagonist of that thing. So the area was vast. We are talking of how far the uh, idea of Nalanda mental uh, uh, landscape of Nalanda uh, persisted in people. Cengiz Khan, the great expansionist, he left India alone because it was the land of the Holy Empire. I mean, uh, uh, we, we can go on and on and on about this, and we are standing in that very uh, important place, all of us. Now, the, uh, the seminar organized by Dr. about uh, world literature. The question, of course, arises, what is world literature? One simple answer for the ordinary re reader is that it is literature which we all read in various languages uh, through translation or through original. Most of us do it through translation. That's fine. That is what literature is for. But a serious study of world literature uh, is very different. There are analyses. There are interpretations. There are universals to be sought out. So when we read, we, uh, uh, this Sushant Mishraji will be able to tell you far more than I do. Today's topic by Rajneesh Mishra is in a very, very old, uh, he is not old, we are old. Uh, he is an old uh, friend of ours. Uh, I won't call him a friend. I will call him part of the extended family. So quite a lot of what I have learned has come from the discussions that take place between him and my husband at my residence. So this is hearsay knowledge, which very permissible in, in the Indian oral context. The, uh, uh, when I was rereading, uh, when I was rereading Shakuntalam for the sake of uh, understanding at least past, partly what Rajanishri is going to say, I suddenly thought of Oedipus Rex, the play Two plays, there are two plays. One is Oedipus Rex, the other is Oedipus Tyrannus in Greek literature. Now that is also a troubled man-woman relationship through marriage. Oedipus marries his mother, unknown, and it's a dark tragedy. That it ends in the Joka his mother-wife's death, Jocasta, and Oedipus's expulsion from his state. Now, nothing of this kind happens in Shakuntalam. But Shakuntalam also, Abhidhyana Shakuntalam, as he will be able to tell you better, means recognition of Shakuntala, who is forgotten for us sometime. Now, the questions, very interesting questions that are, that I hope that will be answered, is uh, what? What was it? Was it karmic or was it dharmic? If I may presume to express an opinion, uh, I agree with Ravindarji's uh, conclusions yesterday in his paper that Indian literature basically is dharmic. And I now request uh, uh, to answer all the exciting questions that must be there in this text. Thank you all for listening to me very patiently.
I seek your permission, ma'am, sir, and I sign the letter to begin my presentation. I begin with a kind of Mangala Charana or Nandi part uh, from Abhigyan Shakuntalam itself, which is the main topic. Ya Srishti Srashtu Radhya Vahati Vidhihutam Ya Haviriya Chahotri Ye Dve Kalam Vidhatta Shruti Vishayaguna Ya Istita Vyapya Vishwam Ya Mahu Sarva Bija Prakritiriti Yaya Pranina Pranavanta Pratakshabhi Prapannas Tanu Hiravatu Vasta Virishta Virisha Om As a, it's a very difficult situation for me and perhaps the most easiest also. As my teacher is sitting in front of me, and ma'am, like my mother, who is chairing this session, this is really a great opportunity for me. And uh, this is unforgettable. I don't know to what extent I'll be doing justice to the topic which I have been uh, given by my uh, learned friend, Professor Sushant Kumar Mishraji, and uh, it's really a vast topic as the world literature itself suggests. Uh, I feel that uh, I am caught in a circle. Uh, I don't know from where to begin and where to end. But this is the uh, easiest way also. You can start from anywhere. And that will be your beginning point and any, anywhere you can live. And uh, culminating as per your ability or so. Whether you are able to draw the circle complete or not, that doesn't matter. But still, there is some center. That should not be misplaced. OK? Uh, when I look at this scenario or the domain of world literature, uh, I can visualize a kind of image, a vast ocean filled with islands, uh, multiple islands. I don't know uh, how to define this world literature through these islands or through this ocean. You know, uh, because islands are located there in the ocean. They are located, they are manifested there. Uh, so in a way, they are different from each other, but they are located in the same substratum. So there is a kind of connectivity. So ocean binds them all. We are dealing with uh, human conditions, you know, and sorrow, happiness, uh, strife in life is everywhere in all communities. This we have experienced in our historical journey. So loss of hope, and then we regain, uh, as uh, ma'am just uh, talked about, Phoenix. This is the place where we don't come for teach, teaching or preaching someone. We have a great preacher here, a tradition of great preachers, scholars. We come here to learn. This is the, this is the greatness, this is the importance of Nalanda and Rajgrih. So one should be very, very humble. Another thing is that I feel myself a kind of hurdle because in the next session you are going to listen to my teacher, Professor Kapil Kapoorji, and uh, I am also eagerly waiting for that. So I don't want to waste much of your time in that way. Well, so, and please uh, excuse me uh, for my articulation or pronunciation of German words. Uh, we call uh, Goethe, Goethe or something. Huh? So please excuse that. It's a kind of variation, let us say, <laughs> in here. Uh, but before that, you see, how to approach this uh, concept or uh, revisiting uh, this very concept of uh, the world literature? Is it the sum total of literatures written, composed in multiple literary traditions? Or something more than that? Uh, second question is that, uh, is it the case that whatever is written, whatever is written or composed in any language, in any literary tradition, all may be assimilated or all may be uh, put forth as world literature? 
is there somewhere uh, we can uh, develop a parameter parameter for uh, for uh, qualifying what we call as world literature uh, i am i have in view the contemporary literary thinking which is mostly based on not on ideas but on ideologies so in this context uh, how to approach how to conceive this uh, very idea of world literature uh, when we say world literature do we undermine the nationalities or provincial or local elements or how to accommodate how to interpret these notions in the broader concept of broader context of world literature these are some of the questions uh, which we need to address as gate rightly pointed out at a time in 1827 that national literature doesn't mean much at present it is the time for era of world literature and everybody must endeavor to accelerate this epoch you know uh, tagore also wrote an essay on world literature uh, it was 1907 now he has a somehow slightly different view and he says Uh, to some extent he disagrees also with uh, gate and he says that uh, world literature is not a symbol of national literature uh, he he posits a philosophical notion related to understanding of the self what we call uh, which is manifested in the world literature and then he says that uh, mm, it is the understanding of the self and other which is predicted upon the inheritance of an interest and interest in both upanishadic thought and the popular folk culture now tagore is not saying anything new in this context uh, but he is reiterating the indian literary experiences that whatever is coming down from the uh, vedic upanishadic times uh, that has to be assimilated and in our intellectual tradition india's intellectual tradition we don't really make a uh, difference or distinction between lok and shastra classical is generally translated as classical and folk this dichotomy is not there so uh, there is an assimilation they interact with each other they uh, complement each other lok and shastra traditions complement each other and uh, his audience uh, uh, he, uh, and his he says that uh, this is my advice to find the world in the self and this self is not a narrow self uh, most of our uh, literary works or art in fact they are in one way or the other is a kind of quest of the self this is a simple approach whether we are composing philosophical texts like upanishads or any other art form there are 64 art forms literature is one of them in all in through all these i mean disciplines knowledge disciplines there is a perennial quest for the self and in this way uh, particularly in the uh, indian literature indian literature has been uh, composed uh if you look at gitanjali of tagore that is also coming down in the same tradition and that is upanishadic uh, through bhakti poetry and then in modern times so uh commenting upon uh gitanjali in the introduction wb it says we are not moved because of its strangeness but because we have met our own images there in the songs of gitanjali uh but at the same time the chairman of the nobel prize committee he was doubtful he says that it is a kind of imitation of the earlier indian poetry so nothing new in fact we don't create anything new uh it is coming down in a tradition highly repetitive themes are there but with with variations with a, a kind of localization in a specific time and space that's why the beauty is that the whole tradition can be traced 
So nothing is lost in this uh, perennial flow. Uh, instead of creating something uh, isolated and uh, strange, just for the sake of that it should be totally different from whatever is composed there, this has never been our approach. And I think in the whole this South Asian region, this has been broadly followed. Uh, then the very concept of literature uh, poses some uh, problems, uh, some challenges, uh, where we say in our culture, as uh, yesterday Professor Ravindra Singh Ji pointed out, our world is Sahitya. Literature uh, is a, a, a derived from a culture that is largely scriptal. So you have scripture, the word scripture, doesn't pertain to Indian realities, that's another thing. So it's from a script to a scripture, and then, uh, uh, so, and then uh, there is a concept of book, holy book rather. A book cannot be without author, and a book also anticipates reader. So this is the whole literary terminology, which, what we discussed in uh, our days. You know, reader's response theory and uh, author's intention, then the death of author, and all such things which we discussed, you know. The death of God also. <laughs> the authority has to go. So, uh, so all such things, you know. Uh, uh, the poet, I think, uh, I, I may be wrong. Uh, I think that West uh, started studying literature the way they studied Bible. The same notions are there. and. Uh, after a certain point of time, uh, they had to change it, you know, because author and authority uh, cannot control uh, the text, you know. So this is the problem, the, or this is the characteristics of the Western tradition. Our word is Sahitya. This is important. It has nothing to do with written or oral. Sahit, two meanings are there. Togetherness, as uh, Professor Ravindraji uh, pointed out yesterday, but also sa plus hit for the welfare, huh? hitkari, hit ke, sabke hit ke liye. And that's why if we see the origin of uh, sahitya, the way it is uh, suggested in a number of texts in poetics, like Marashekhar uh, Skabi Mimamsa, Prajasu Hitkam Meya, Brahma created this discipline for the welfare of the people. And the same we see in the Natya Shastra also. So it is Sahit, Sa plus Sahit and Sahitya, togetherness. But togetherness of what? Of word and meaning. Shabdarthau Sahitau Kavyam. This is Bhama in uh, fifth, sixth century. Uh, he's talking about and trying to define uh, Sahitya. Shabda and Artha, word and meaning. But this is general. Uh, every, every expression has word and meaning. So do we mean that all whatever has been say, uh, stated or written is literature? No, this is not the idea. Uh, remember, he is composing a text on poetics called Kavya Alankar. And figures of speech, Alankar means figures of speech, figures of speech and figures of thought. He, are, he is talking about two, at two levels, Shabda and Artha. Shabda Alankar, Charm, at the level of words and charm at the level of meaning. That's why he is saying Shabd Shabdarthau Sahitau Kabyam. So uh, this charm should be there at the level of word as well as at the level of meaning. This comes from the earlier matrix where we classify our, uh, uh, or the, uh, our verbal composition as uh, Prabhu Sammit, Suhrat Sammit and Kanta Sammit. Prabhu Samhita, where the words are very, very important, primary, they cannot be altered with another synonyms or so, because the sequence of sound is equally important. So that is Veda, Shabda Pradhan, and then uh, Artha Pradhan, and that is uh, Purana, Dharma Shastra, etc., all. That is uh, where the meaning is important, not the word. Meaning is important. In poetry, the task is still difficult. You have to maintain both the levels, at levels of word and level of meaning. The charm, charm that characterizes literature, 
or uh, sahitya from other types of disciplines so this is sahitya and uh, another thing is that why it is called sahitya because all the other intellectual disciplines knowledge disciplines are assimilated in the domain of sahitya so bharat muni says uh, na sa vidya na sakala etc that uh, that cannot be all disciplines all art forms all yoga and all crafts etc everything can be represented in drama so literature uh, sahitya in this tradition is essentially essentially a knowledge discourse uh, there is no debate no poetician or no no other philosophers even have pointed out except jayanta bhat sometimes <laughs> there is says that serious discussion should not be done with poets <laughs> like huh? but anyways but uh, this is an general agreement that uh, no, literature is a knowledge discourse however a specific kind of knowledge vilakshan vishisht gyan hai this is elaborated by acharya abhinav gupta in his abhinav bharati at great length at great length in the first chapter of the natya shastra and in the sixth chapter so uh, knowledge discourse and but what kind of knowledge this is distinct extraordinary extraordinary so uh, in uh, raj shekhar's kavya mimamsa also sahitya is uh, said to be the seventh vedanga six vedangas are enumerated as you know shiksha nirukta vyakaran etc seventh vedanga is alankar shastra alankar shastra means poetics because with this without this tool even vedic interpretations may not be possible uh, as uh, there is a uh, mantra cited there in that in that uh, poetic text uh, kavya mimamsa dwa suparna sayuja sakhaya saman vriksham parishashva jat etc so there uh, rashekhar is asking which vedang will explain the meaning of this mantra and the idea is the meaning is that two birds are sitting on the same branch friendly they are sitting friendly on the same uh, on the same branch of the same tree one bird uh, eats the fruit and accordingly uh, happy or you know <laughs> not happy so happy so happy and the other one is simply watching huh? simply watching so which vedanga is this phonetics that is going to explain this meaning or uh, grammar or uh, uh, etymology or uh, prosody or uh, astronomy or uh, or uh, uh, social thought which one is going to explain that's why he included essentially that vedang saptam vedang is poetics that has to be included there then four vidyas then sahitya is the fifth vidya literature is the fifth vidya or fifth, uh, 14 knowledge disciplines are there so literature is the 15th discipline why 15th why 7th why 5th uh, 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 or 15th because it assimilates all that has been enumerated earlier that's why it is sahitya in that way also so sahitya in terms of uh, creative literature and sahitya in terms of poetic sahitya shastra it assimilates everything and uh, uh, as tagore tagore just pointed out that uh, Uh, it has to be in the form of self the self which is free from the narrow boundaries and uh, we learned from i learned from my teacher that one of the purposes of literature is to liberate uh, liberate us from narrow boundaries narrow boundaries and that's why the concept of ras comes here without this sadharani karan getting liberated from the narrow self of a particular a community particular time or a space or a, a linguistic community or so we may not be able to uh, enjoy this so uh, in a, uh, uh, 10th 11th century we have the concept of uh, sadharani karan uh, that is the universalization if we are not free from our narrow self probably we will not be able to appreciate whatever is composed in the form of sahitya or literature so साधारणीकरण अभिनव गुप्त दिस साधारणीकरण इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट गिवन बाई भट्टनायक ए ग्रेट पोइटिशियन ऑफ टेंथ इलेवेंथ सेंचुरी देन यू सी अभिनव गुप्त बिल्ड्स अपॉन दिस नोशन एंड ही सेज ही हैज़ अनदर वर्ल्ड 
Tanmai Bhavan Yogyata, Tanmai Bhavan, to be just one, identical, whatever is portrayed there in drama or in any literary work. Otherwise, and to be one with what is being described or portrayed, uh, essentially demands the total freedom from our narrow self, narrow boundaries. You know, in this way, this is how our moksha is also defined. The highest goal, dharma, artha, kama, moksha, these are the fourfold goals of life, dharma, righteousness, artha, means to achieve that, to, and uh, then um, desire, icha, and then finally liberation from all. So this moksha is uh, attained only through this kind of, uh, a kind of uh, uh, practice, let us say, through literature or art, or through yoga or whatever. So we are, uh, uh, we are free from our narrow boundaries. And uh, I um, want to quote again my favorite Acharya, uh, Abhinav Gupta, he says, Moksho hinam naivanya swarupa prathanam hitat. Moksha is nothing, anything else. It is like the expansion of yourself. You are not in, in any kind of boundary. No? So this is the highest goal uh, which we want to. And I think a literary work composed with this kind of awareness or consciousness or the, at the level of this kind of consciousness is going to appeal worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, these days we create literature of ideologies. Ideologies are the narrow boundaries, you know, and uh, maybe we are not able to feel or experience the kind of literature which is being composed these days. And mostly we have imported from the West uh, this kind of things. This has never been our literary tradition or literary experience. Okay, so our, in our culture, we learn how to dissolve the self. Uh, dissolve the self means narrow self. And uh, as opposed to this, contemporary literary practices teach, uh, teach us how to form identities. Where the norm is dissolution of identities, uh, and the, today's norm is formation of identity. Till this formation of identities culminate into identity crisis, you know? That is the uh, ultimate goal of the contemporary. Anyways, there are challenges also. Major challenges are related to translation. And uh, we cannot uh, reject this uh, very, very important uh, tool or instrument. Uh, without translation, world literature cannot be approached. This is a simple fact. But here again, uh, this is the major challenge also. As I just uh, talked about, literature is not simply about words or not about simply meanings, togetherness of word and meaning. So in translation, usually we can, we can transfer meaning from one language to another language, but what about words? Words are equally important, you know? So for example, if in the source language or source literature, there, there is a, uh, kind of alliteration, how this can be transferred into another language when we translate it, you know? Uh, like uh, uh, the foro followed free uh, in, uh, in uh, Coleries. Hmm? How to translate this? So this kind of musicality, because music or rhythm, rhyme equally constitute the level of uh, you know, receptive, receptivity. So uh, if we translate, uh, think of Gitanjali, translation of Gitanjali itself by the poet himself. Is this, uh, it, uh, does this has the, uh, have the same impact uh, as it has in the original Bangla, you know? So the whole music, uh, and Tagore was very competent in music also. He, he wrote notations for his own songs uh, uh, the same notation doesn't apply in the translation. <laughs> you cannot sing it. So uh, it is simply a dull prose translation of whatever was there in the original Gitanjali. But anyways, meaning is to some extent preserved uh, and there are many translations now uh, we have in 
uh, of Gitanjali. Uh, second is how to transfer meter from one language to another language. You know, we are told of uh, Chapman's translation of Homer, a very, very uh, classic uh, work in that way. Uh, but meters cannot be transferred. Meters are just like, uh, you know, uh, they are also uh, something which is given. We don't create meters. They are what we call nasargic. So Valmiki, when he com started, when he composed Ramayana, we, it, there is a clear indication that spontaneously Anushtup uh, was manifested. He didn't uh, do it deliberately, that now I have to express my grief, and that's why I'm uh, this kind of meter I'm going to decide, and then I will express. This is not the case. So this is the experience that itself suggests, uh, selects its, uh, its uh, medium or meter for expression. So the, the rhyme, rhythm, everything. And in a way, if, when we translate poetry, I'm talking mostly in the context of poetry, if you translate from one language to another, uh, when we translate poetry from one language to another, what happens? Uh, I don't know, but please uh, think about it. Language itself, every language is a form of meter. Every language, because it has its own rhyme and rhythm, which cannot be transferred. The way we speak English, we do not speak Hindi or any other language, you know, Sanskrit or so. So it has its own. I'm reminded of a great uh, Vedic scholar, uh, uh, Pandit Madhusudan uh, Ojaji. And uh, we were lucky to meet his disciple, Rishi Kumar Mishraji. Uh, and uh, one, he narrated one incident. He says that uh, uh, Guruji, uh, Pandit Madhusudan Ojha, uh, was teaching him Ved, and the, his task was uh, the disciple's task was to, to translate everything, whatever Guruji has taught in Sanskrit, into English. Uh, so, and Ojhaji, Pandit Ojhaji insisted that you have to translate, uh, show me uh, in the English translation. And uh, to his surprise, uh, Pandit, uh, Rishi Kumar Mishraji told that Guruji, you don't know English, so what, what is the purpose of translating it into English? And showing it to you. He says, no, no, well, just uh, do that. And uh, in the evening, he used to uh, uh, translate uh, all those things which he had taught the whole day. And uh, Guruji was in a position to correct him, that here, this word is not correct. Change it. Though he is not able to say which word should be uh, there, uh, which word should be replaced like that. But he used to say that this is not good, because why? Because there is a rhythm, a rhyme and rhythm in English that is disturbed. And if that is disturbed, it means the thought process is also disturbed. So you will not be able to communicate the way you want to. So this is how uh, uh, I wish to say that uh, every language is a form of meter. Every language is a form of meter. And this is the major challenge uh, before the translators, and particularly literature and poetry in that. Uh, I am reminded of uh, uh, Megh Dutam of Kalidas. Uh, Megh Dutam is composed in a meter called Manda Krantha Chand. It's a long meter, long meter. And uh, it suits the purpose of the poet, the kind of uh, uh, experience he is going to describe. Uh, last, uh, you know the story, Yaksha is uh, cursed by his, uh, uh, let us say, Swami or master that he has to uh, be away from his native place, from his wife for one year. So eight months have passed, and this place where he is living is uh, Ramgiri, maybe Ramtek in uh, Maharashtra. So there he is uh, living for, a, for the whole year. So eight months have passed swiftly, without any, um, uh, any difficulty. Now four months of the rainy season, that is difficult too you know, uh, bear with. Because th this was the convention also that people used to come back home during the rainy season. And this is the, uh, these are the four months that are difficult to spend. And that's why poet has uh, selected, may not uh, be consciously, 
but the experience demands a kind of long meter, suggesting that it is difficult time to uh, pass, you know. So, manda kranta chand, kaschit kanta virah guruna swadhikarat pramattah, shapena stanga mit mahima varshabho gena bharatuh. See these long lines. That suggest that it is difficult. Uh, Shakespeare says, sad times seem long, sad hours seem long, you know. So, this is the uh, uh, the time which is difficult to explain. So this is again how to translate this kind of situation. Then third issue is regarding oral, oral literature, though the term itself is self-contradictory, oral and literature. So that's why Zirmu perhaps coined the term orature, uh, oral literature, let us say. So most of our, uh, uh, particularly in this Subcon in the subcontinent, most of our literary compositions are oral. Ramayana, Mahabharata, there have been performance texts. Uh, so how to transfer um, through translation this orality into the uh, target language? Uh, uh, in the context of drama, again, uh, we see uh, lots of problem because in drama, uh, since this is a drishya kabya, visible, visible form, I will come back to the nandi which I recited in the beginning. That is pertinent to some extent. So in drama, uh, you see, how much time, Sushant ji? Dash minute hour. Okay. So uh, in drama, since this is a uh, uh, visible form. And that's why in the beginning of the play, Avigyana Shakuntalam, Kalidas invokes the eight visible forms of Lord Shiva, Bhagavan Shiva, Bhagavan Shiva. These eight forms are like Ya Srishti Srashtaradya, that is the first creation, that is Jala, water. Ya Haviriya Chahotri, and then that which carries forth uh, the offerings to the desired deity, that is fire. Second is fire. Third is hotri, the performer. Ya haviriya chahotri, ye dve kalam vidhatta, that which divides time in two ways, that is moon and sun, uh, uh, lunar and solar uh, calendars you have. So uh, moon and sun, dve kalam vidhatta, shruti vishaya guna, uh, ya istita vyapya vishwam, that is akasha, sky, that has the characteristics of our, the quality of shabda, sound. And that has permeated, uh, covered, the, uh, covered everything. That is sky. Vedekalam vidhatta shruti vishayguna ya istita vyapya visham yamahu sarva bija prakritiriti yaya praninaha pranavanta. From where the seed sprouts and takes the form of tree or so, it develops. That is artha, prithvi. And then by which everyone, every living organism uh, uh, holds its life, that is uh, vayu, prana vayu, we call it prana vayu, air. You know? In these eight forms, pratakshabhi, in these eight forms, uh, visible forms, Bhagavan Shiva may take these eight visible forms because the other forms, are, other forms of Shiva's are beyond our ability we may not be able to grasp. So he is praying Shiva that please be visible in these eight forms so that we can see you. And this is drama, uh, drama, uh, uh, visible art form. So he is uh, uh, praying that be visible in these eight forms, protection, like um, in our perception, come in the domain of our perception so he, and um, uh, do welfare of all the spectators in front of you. The moment you utter this nandi, you don't find any other. Everyone is assimilated in this uh, kind of framework. There is no self, there is no other. So this has been the idea of Sahitya. So in drama, what happens, uh, you, even the colors, the kind of dress you are giving to the characters, you know, uh, that is very, very important. So, and that is culturally uh, meaningful. Uh, 
For example, um, I, I was told that uh, Abhigyan Shaguntalam was being played in Russia and uh, the bride was supposed to wear a white dress, totally in contrast with Indian realities. You know, a white dress is just not a good sign, you know, a widow. Huh? Usually widows wear this. But in that context, uh, Christian community, you have to wear the, uh, during the marriage. And moreover, Sakuntala refused to cry when she is leaving the father's home. <laughs> he says, why should I cry? I was living in, in a forest and uh, having a very hard life. I will go to the palace. Now people will be there to attend to me. So there is no point of crying that I am se being separated from my father also. Uh, such hurdles are also there. So think about it. And so there are cultural determinants also. And uh, then uh, what about poetics? Should it also be uh, included uh, under the domain of world literature? Not only creative literature, but also canonical, uh, which we have. So these are the, uh, some of the points which I wanted to uh, put forth to you. Now, so far, uh, Abhigyan Shakuntalam is concerned. I have seen many translations, and the translation of the title itself is very, very problematic. Somewhere it is translated Shakuntala, the fatal ring. Sometimes Shakuntala, the lost ring. Eh? All this. Eh? Recognition of Shakuntala, recollection of Shakuntala, like this. None of these titles suggest this meaning. I have brought with me a very, very recent edition of Vigyan Shakuntalam. Uh, this is based on the, uh, edited by Vasant Kumar Bhatt, sir, you might be knowing. Uh, this is based on the oldest and most elaborate authentic manuscript uh, that, is, that has been obtained from Kashmir. And uh, in this uh, particular uh, drama, see, the title itself is different. Avigyan Shakuntala Natakam. Not Avigyan Shakuntalam. Avigyan Shakuntala Natakam. Uh, in 2019, uh, we experimented with this text and we planned a kind of a performance of Avigyan Shakuntalam based on this manuscript, based on this manuscript. This is the most elaborate one. And uh, that was also to test whether Kalidas is still pertinent or not. You know, uh, uh, luckily sir was also there in that uh, among the audience. It was a huge success. I must tell you, in 2019, in JNU, in a place like JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, yeah, uh, it was jam-packed hall, and it was a huge success. So great literatures, I think, uh, uh, the way it is said in, uh, in a way, in Atharva Veda, Devasya Pashya Kavyam Na Mamara Na Jiriyati. See the uh, uh, poetry of God, see the poetry of God, that never dies, never fades away. This is the test of world literature also. You know, great works, they may be translated in any way. They will be highly uh, respected and uh, they will be received with a great, uh, you know, enthusiasm or so. So these are the uh, works. Uh, they are not impertinent. They have gone through the test of time and space. Any community, any play, any time, they can be performed. Many other great literary works in the at the world level also. And uh, so, Herder, you know, who introduced Shakuntalam to Goethe, he says that uh, after reading Shakuntala, he says that philosophy of the West. This is the impact of Avijnana Shakuntalam on this uh, on this philosopher. Philosophy of the West seems narrow and cold, narrow and cold in comparison to Indian literature. This is the era of German Romanticism also, German Romanticism. And then he says, I cannot easily find a product of human mind more pleasant than this, a real blossom of the Orient and the most beautiful in its kind, something like that, of course, appear, appears once every 2,000 years, every 2,000 years. 
So this is how uh, it has been received uh, when William Jones translated it in 1798. And uh, it was uh, in a short span of time of, uh, from 19, uh, 1791 to uh, uh, 1807, it was reprinted five times in English, I'm talking about English translation, and it was widely circulated uh, throughout Europe, um, through French, through German, and all things. And uh, you know the very famous uh, quote from Goethe, um, the praise of Shakuntala, it has been over and over uh, uh, repeated, I, uh, skipping this. And then he say, he, uh, it is important to uh, note that he, uh, uh, his uh, prologue of uh, Faust was modeled on uh, Abhigana Shakuntalam. So what I am trying to suggest, if uh, literatures composed in different times, in different spaces, in different literary traditions, if they are presented in the right perspective, there is immense possibility to uh, to enrich each other, you know, and uh, in that way that will be more uh, bringing the world together. And uh, uh, mostly um, uh, in this uh, German Romanticism, we learn that uh, the notion is back to nature, internal, external, both, and value of the unknown. Literary experience in India, uh, the classical. I don't know how to. Uh, uh, how to say, classic, classic word itself is uh, difficult to accommodate. Now, classical Sanskrit literature, Gaurinath Shastriji, a great uh, renowned Sanskrit scholar, uh, with, uh, uh, with my apology, I would like to say, uh, see the title of his work, A Concise History of Classical Sanskrit Literature. What is classical about it? Uh, so when we find it difficult to accommodate mm -hmm. in our culture, we say that no, Vedic culture and then classical, uh, Vedic literature and classical literature. Uh, so this is the difficulty. We, we import the categories and then we try to um, accommodate our uh, texts and literary experience into that. Uh, that may not be possible sometimes, so we have to be careful in that way. Uh, so there he says that, uh, 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 value for the unknown and literature in our uh, culture, in this culture, is not to give uh, any kind of, uh, you know, lesson or preaching. Uh, throughout Ramayana, never, Valmiki never tells us what to do. This is the suggested sense that Rama divat pravartitavyam na Ravana divat. This is not the literal meaning which he is going to communicate or preach us. This is the suggested meaning throughout this strife, struggle, and everything, finally it is suggested. And great literature is always suggestive in nature. Always suggestive. Dhani, we call it Dhani, suggested meaning. So uh, it is Rama divat pravarti tabhyam na Ravana divat, etc. So it doesn't uh, preach. Preaching is not the notion. Preaching is, uh, we have other disciplines, uh, Subhashit, good saying, uh, uh, maxims and all, th there is there, these are there. So, but here, uh, uh, reality is not something which is determined. There is a vague uh, boundary, there is mystery, and there is a, an attempt to see life into the things as Wordsworth would say. Uh, why vague boundary? Because uh, whatever we have mapped, whatever we have de determined, is going to merge in the wider reality, wider reality. So this shows a kind of continuity, no break. When we, uh, our boundaries are sharp, uh, thick, then we can see a kind of duality. The idea is to merge the individual self with the larger self, supreme self, like that. So this is how it goes on. And uh, that's why uh, the concept of Leela is very, very important. Throughout this uh, drama, Avigyan Shakuntalam, right from this uh, um, Nandi part to the Bharat Vakya, that is the concluding verse usually in Sanskrit drama, you will see that all the characters at the end of the traditional Sanskrit drama, let us say, all the characters, all the actors who are playing different roles, different characters, they appear on the stage 
and they sing co uh, collectively this Bharat Vakya. Bharat, in recognition of this great uh, theoretician Bharat Muni, uh, this is called Bharat Vakya. And there he says that uh, at the end, I just tell you. Uh, <coughs> Bharat Vakya. Wait, wait. They are also, uh, as in the beginning, uh, you see all the actors who were playing the role of Dushanta or Shakuntala or uh, others, they appear and they say that Pravartatam prakriti hitaye prakriti hitaye parthiva saraswati sruti mahatam mahiyatam mamapi cha kshapayatu nil lohit punarabhavam parigata bhakti. Here the part is bhakti in Kashmiri. Parigata bhakti or shakti, shakti rakmavu. So again, uh, this is. Uh, uh, this is the pray, uh, prayer uh, or the aspiration that uh, the king uh, should take uh, take the steps for the welfare of the people. They should not be self-concentrated, you know, self-centered. And uh, the speech of learned people, uh, speech of learned people is poetry or great uh, discourses should be uh, revered or said should be praised everywhere and then he says that uh, along with all of you I should also be liberated and these all these characters they were playing different roles so they were bound now that play is over and that role is also over there, there is also a kind of moksha for them so it says that it should not go back to the same framework you know so uh, this is a kind of liberation and that is praised for uh, prayed to Bhagavan Shiva. So, Neel uh, Lohita, that is the name of Shiva. So, this is how it goes on. So, this is the Leela, the concept of Leela that uh, permeates in all the art forms or literature, uh, whatever is being practiced here. And in this way, I think uh, I should just stop here. After Bharatvakya, there is nothing to say. Thank you very much um, and thank, uh, grateful to you. Thank you, Rajneesh ji, for your very scholarly paper. I reminded us that a text does not exist in isolation. It exists in a number of assumptions, premises, that also we have to take into account if we are not mere readers for pleasure, but seek to analyze a text and discover its proper or what may appear to us proper, its proper position and interpretation. I cannot say that I have uh, followed all your references. I propose to ask you one or later on to ask me to explain, and I think you'll understand since I'm a mere, mere novice at uh, this Indian uh, uh, literature studies, uh, you will help me out. There are other questions? It is a very new way of looking at the last Varata Vakyam. You know, Pravartatam, Prakrithitaya, Parthivaha, Saraswati, Sruti Mahatang, Mahiyasa, Mamapi, Chakshapayatu, Nila Lohitaha. Mamapi will not go along with the line of interpretation you gave. Because mama picha khyapayatu nila lo hita. What is that? Punar bhavam, let there be no next birth for me, Kalidasa says. Parigata sakti hi, atma bhuhu. Why? Because you are the all perfection. It is a, it is a, it is a, almost like Kalidasa is a, invoking a Kashmiri saiva type of a, you know, phenomenon, he says. Let there be, why? Because parigata sakti hi. 
you are the you are your sakti is ever like all pervasive atma bhu and you are swayam bhu therefore let there be no next birth for me because i am one with you that is a like that mama api will not come in the thank you wonderful wonderful exposition thank you sir uh, just i wanted to uh, uh, ask you regarding uh, abhigyan sakuntalam is also interpreted symbolically uh, uh, in comparison with uh, this kashmir shaivism pratyabhigya darshan uh, this is not pratyabhigya of uh, nayayika so prati abhigyan and the abhigyan term is again repeat being repeated there so can you uh, little enlighten us about that aspects so, pratibhigya and abhigyan sakuntalam that's first uh, thank you for asking this question uh, quite often i feel that uh, pratibhigya darshan is an aesthetically designed philosophy aesthetically designed philosophy and you know uh, the way acharya avinogupta defined in his pratibhigya karika his lagu lagvi vimarshini in pratibhigya vimarshini says that pratipam atma vimukhena gyanam prakasha this is pratibhigya uh, the idea is that which we have forgotten for certain reasons we don't know uh, but we have identified ourselves wrongly let us say in a different way because as sir rightly pointed out shiva 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 shakti is everywhere that is this whole world uh, we call it a vishwa technically uh, there are 36 ontological principles so from sada shiva that is the third principle that is ichha shakti pradhana huh? from sada shiva to prithvi technically this this is known as vishwa okay vishwa so uh, chitta shakti uh, चित्र शक्ति आनंद शक्ति इच्छा शक्ति ज्ञान शक्ति क्रिया शक्ति दीज आर फाइव फाइव शक्ति एंड एब अब ऑल स्वातंत्र्य स्वातंत्र्य शक्ति न सो इन ऑल दीज मैनिफेस्टेशन शिवा इज नॉट अंडर कंट्रोल ऑफ एनी वन बिकॉज देर इज नो अदर एंटिटी दिस इज अद्वैत दिस इज हाउ इट हैज बीन इंटरप्रेटेड सो वॉट विल यू सी समटाइम्स आई सी दैट i don't know uh, how old is this pratibhigya philosophy uh, though we have texts uh, um, uh, we have texts uh, from 8th century onwards somananda huh? somananda shiva drishti huh? but before that also somananda himself says that i am uh, in uh, the 19th uh, generation acharya and he names uh, four more uh, acharya previous to him Uh, uh, but uh, and uh, from trembaknath to um, uh, sangamadit no sang, not sangamadit sangamadit yes from trembaknath to Sam- sangamadit all these 14 generations are not nowhere mentioned so that you can correlate how old is this uh, system but and kalidas is generally accepted not after 5th century 4th century so maybe this text is modeled on this pratibhigya for some reason as we uh, do not recognize ourselves real self in this way dushyant is also not able to recognize shakuntala because of the durvashaj curse or so so this is how uh, uh, the same principle and once uh, that mudrika recognition is possible uh, when there is some trigger some causal factors are there that can remind us that what we have seen earlier and what is present before us it same you know so once a mudrika is shown to him then he is able to uh, recognize shakuntala is not different from him in this way he recognized him uh, recognized her and that's why the, the title itself is abhigyan shakuntalam uh, pratipam आत्मा अभिमुख्य है ना आत्मा अभिमुख करना ये इम्पॉर्टेंट है ना आत्मा से विमुख होने में इदम है ये जगत है दिस आई एंड दिस सो द इम्फेसिस इज यूजली वॉट हैपन्स द इम्फेसिस इज ऑन दिस एंड आई इज वॉट वी कॉल गुणीभूत इट इज 
uh, it goes in the uh, oblivion or in the background. So the idea is to recognize the source. Uh, as in Munda Kupanishad says, uh, the question is Kasminno Bhagavo Vigyate Sarvimidam Vigyatam Bhavati. That what is that knowing which everything is known? So that is the quest. And that is the quest of the self. Atma vare drashtabhya srotabhya omantabhya nididhya sitabhya. Like that. So this is the culture, cultural specificities. Thank you. Rajesh ji. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, your presentation thoroughly. Only thing is that I have differences when you talked about translation. We have never discussed translation seriously in this country. There was no translation in our tradition. It was Tika, Vyakya, etc. etc. Translation is an important discipline. Most probably in 19th century. Once the Christian missionaries came and started, you know, um, did all sorts of, I mean, pre uh, started preparing, de compiling dictionaries, grammars, etc., to teach Christianity, they started translating, that became the norm. The other point is that whatever translation has become a muddy water, primarily because of the scholar, literary scholars. They talk about translation with reference to literature and generalize it, which is bad. Today, you take menu card, uh, you know, everything, uh, translation is there. Translation is an entirely different discipline today. And when we talk about translation, you talk about literary translation, I understand. But when you talk about translation, it's very difficult. Third thing is that there are very good discussions by no, I mean, I can name one of the Umberto Eco, who says, who should be a translator? In this country, anybody who knows two languages is a translator. That is, again, bad. Then I would start quoting some people, a transla translation is a descriptive inductive discipline, not a deductive discipline. People just make statements about translation. There are scholars, I may quote, I'm sure you know Eugene Naida, Peter Newmark, you know, whosoever, all these people who have translated throughout their lives and they have theorized translation. And I can quote um, Newmark who says that literary, literal translation is the first step in translation. He was talking about that in the context of translation of Baudelaire's poem, um, Requiem. Yeah, some, it is an obnoxious French word, whatever, a Requiem, there is LL something, Requiem, by two German translations, translators, Stefan George and Walter Benjamin. And both of, I mean, all scholars say that, um, um, George is a better translator because George was literal. And I have worked on Fakir Mohan Senapati's um, autobiography by two translators. One is a British, uh, you know, uh, researcher and another two Odia scholars who are in Oxford. I have shown that um, the British color translation is much better in terms of content as well as readability. Then Faiz Ahmad Faiz translation by uh, Kiernan and uh, Kiernan and Shipke Kumar. Kiernan translation, we have again discussed a paper that Kiernan translation is better in terms of content and uh, uh, readability. I think we must have a, m I don't know, two, three, four conferences, seminars on translation itself in this country. We have taken translation very lightly and that's the reason for which all these things are happening. That shouldn't happen. Yes, yes, we have time. We have time because we have started late. Uh, uh. Yeah. 
what at the conclusion of the play is the rush you feel. Rush of the, the central rush of uh, Abhigyana Shakuntalam. Well, one easy answer is Shantaras, that all rush <laughs> culminate into that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, ultimately, see, uh, as we just talked about uh, the various uh, characteristics of Shiva, like uh, Chit Shakti, Ananda Shakti. So ultimately, it is the Ananda um, that is uh, because all the uh, uh, all the strife is now settled, and you know, um, all are united. Shakuntala is recognized, and uh, there is a happy ending. So. I don't know how to uh, uh, say this, <laughs> but anyways, uh, the ultimate goal is a Shanta, uh, uh, but throughout the play we can see uh, this is a Shringara, um, uh, and mostly Vipralamba Shringara uh, throughout, because there is a separation for a long time in many of the acts. Shakundala is away, and uh, this is the separation that prevails uh, in many of the acts. And finally, it is so from Vipralambha to uh, Sanjog Sringara. This is this may be. Okay. So, uh, may, may I ask one? If that we have time, so one simple question uh, related to recognition and the protagonists in Abhigyan Shakuntalam. So, I have always uh, wondered whether. Dushyant does not recognize Shakuntala or Dushyant does not recognize his own memories and his own thoughts and his own in mental impressions. So in a way he does not recognize himself. So what sir would you say in this? <laughs> uh, philosophically he is not able to recognize himself that he is uh, still Dushyant. <laughs> Not Shiva. <laughs> and uh, in the context of drama, uh, it is said uh, there is an episode of Durvasha's curse, you know, and uh, that is uh, prevailing at that time till the uh, ring is not shown to him. So, uh, under that, uh, the influence of that uh, curse, he is not able to uh, recognize. The memory is. Uh, gone for some time, uh, so that uh, not uh, uh, memory relating to Shakuntala, the sansakara which he has earlier uh, in his chitta, he is not able to connect that, you know, because of this uh, karsha. So that's why uh, you can say that uh, he is not, though Shakuntala is in front of uh, him, but he is not able to identify that this is the same Shakuntala whom he had married. So this is Pratavigya. So, but, uh, but the curse is to Shakuntala, Dushyant is nowhere. Uh -huh, maybe, <laughs> curse is, curse uh, uh, pertains to the person who is going to recognize her, you know. Like, uh, this is the Mimamsaka position, that whenever there is memory, memory is not complete. That memory is not complete, uh, that is why they say there is no Akhyati, akhyati Vak. You know, it is half, like when I remember something, the memory is neither complete, nor the perception was either complete early. So, the, the question which uh, uh, Professor Mishra asked, whether he did not recognize his memory, no, such a thing is not possible. The recognition comes when the thing comes in front of you. So, therefore, the question of Vigyana and Pratyavigyana, there is a difference. Abhigyana means when another Abhigyanam, Abhigyanam, Smriti, he. Pratyabhigyanam is not just a Smriti because you are having, it is yourself. You know, ultimately Pratyabhigyana is, Abhigyana is because of something, Abhigyana comes, recognition comes. But it is, Pratyabhigyana is something much, better, much more profound than just Abhigyana. So there is a lot of difference between, and the question, Naya is another thing. And it comes in other schools also. So, good, good question. But this is uh, like uh, coming to your question, Professor Misra. You don't recognize your memory. Memory is this memory. Recognition of memory cannot be. If memory helps you in recognition. So, no, no, no. 
that is not to be answered that is that is all the schools like Pra smriti is a source of pratyavigya smriti is not pratyavigya i remember my something but ha who 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 oh no 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 stimulus response will come in this only because just a minute when you see something the question of if you have seen it earlier then only pratyavigya comes so otherwise you are seeing something for the first time it is pratyaksha this is what dharmakirti says that when when you see when you are seeing everything and new new thing it comes front of you so there is a lot of difference between so i will ask you one question if a person is suffering from dementia is that person suffering from from dementia or what is being forgotten not being recognized in suffering so you see you see the important point is here the contemporary ways of looking at it dementia is dementia is forgetting forgetfulness it is a you, you are not able to the mind is not working at that particular point because there is no see that is why i am telling this is the position of prabhakar mimamsak akhyati no 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 this is what question you are asking is a question like like no no i am just telling that another giving you some clue from another tradition that which that which will give you some clue to understand your question when you say dementia there is no memory at all mind is not working are you getting my point it is not it is one minute there can be hundreds of stories one minute bro no my point is dementia is different from it is you know smritir labha you know that is what ha uh, ha uh, that is see this is ha uh, exactly uh, smarana is gone so that is not this is a physical problem and this is a psychological problem both are different no i just <laughs> this is a good 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 sign that uh, it is generated so much interest uh, pratyavigya is a slightly different uh, this is not about memory uh, go through pratyavigya vimarshini uh, smriti gyan apohan uh, abhinav gupta talks about it uh, smriti uh, so pratyavigya like soyam devadatta the example is given so devadatta which we have seen in the past that impression is there uh, because uh, smriti is about the past and devadatta who is present before me in front of me so if we are not able to connect this these two impressions that both are identical the person uh, in front of me and the person i have seen earlier uh, if we are not able to connect these two if there is no samanadhikaranya uh, Uh, pratyavigya is not possible so this is the idea behind this pratyavigya philosophy thank you very much uh, i must thank the very learned audience i think i have learned more from the audience than i ever did before thank you all for the very active participation and this is uh, makes me very happy because it seems that the abhigyana shakuntalam is a living text for all of us Thank you all. Chai ki vyavastha saadhe paanch bajay hai sir. So, yes, it is under your guidance sir. <laughs> you are my dean. <laughs> so, uh, so i thank uh, uh, the speaker professor rajnish mishra he helped us uh, in a way 
what we often, though I said and our dean uh, Hindu studies said that it is not related to Hindu studies. I am very happy. <laughs> and he himself brought all the theories of Hindu studies. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the purpose. When we talk, talk of Indic and Southeast Asian, many times the Buddhist scholars, they still identified themselves. The Hindu studies scholar, perhaps they don't even identify. And this is where I find somewhere, may I use the word loss in tradition? Loss in tradition. Uh, our thinkers, loss, not lost, not T, only sir, loss in tradition. Whereas, loss in tradition, because, I say it so, because, uh, See, the philosophical tendencies should be there or are there which help us think and which help us understand as whatever is around us, the ontology, epistemology, these processes. Uh, these words I don't understand well. Professor Mishra will help us. Uh, the, the elder M Professor Mishra will help us understand better. But, <laughs> but uh, the, the point here is that uh, literary reality is also a reality. And literature also is real, whatever it may be. So once we discuss that, how do we address this reality of literature? Because language, when we study language, literary meaning is also created through language. So the, all that you talk of Mimansa theory of meaning, sir mentioned just now, I would have loved to hear senior Professor Mishra on how to use Mimansa theory of meaning. Professor Godavari, sir, you are slightly distracted. I'm addressing to you only, sir. <laughs> I would have loved to get a, uh, uh, your intervention now and in future on how to use Mimansa theory of meaning, because you talked just now how Mimansa understands the words and the meanings, to interpret literature and the living literature. And then, in collaboration, we can study Shakespeare's plays, and you will help us interpret the plays of Shakespeare. That is the challenge before this conference when I conceptualized. And it is nothing new that I was bringing. So similar works have been going on. So we always talk of Nyaya discusses how to create meaning. And there is a lot about Nyaya theory of meaning, but how Nyaya helps me, or Buddhist Nyaya or both the thinkers, when they tell us about how to create meaning out of texts, out of literary texts, what we call literary texts, because otherwise there's nothing which is not literary. Uh, as uh, the, uh, the Professor Rajnish Mishra said, which reminded me of Moliere also, that uh, all the life what we have been doing is prose, and perhaps all the life what we have been considering prose is nothing but poetic. So <laughs> somewhere, poetic prose and prose poetry, this issue is there, and we have to create a meaning out of it. And then trying to understand the basic units. For example, Rajnish ji will tell us uh, there are texts on karikas where la, ma, na, ta, these kind of variations become important. Malini Tantra is the text. Rajnish ji will t tell us more about it. I have only primary readings of these texts. Malini Tantra is a text of Shaiva tradition. And it corresponds to many of the Greek traditions in its basic formulation of the sounds. I will not say primary or basic sounds, but the way we cut the sounds of literature. Uh, literature means language. So with the way we understand the what we call generally alphabet, though alphabet, again, is a very restrictive term, but what we generally call alphabet, and that is Malini Tantra, La, Ma, Na, Ta, Ra. And if you see linear A, linear B, all of the whole tradition, it corresponds at, a, at one point. So maybe next seminar, as Professor Mohanty said, should be, there should be two, three, four. We should think of it more, sir, under your guidance, Professor Mohanty, sir, that there should be translation, and translation simply means translation. Latio, latio, going to you, taking something to you. So taking meaning to you and trying to take your meaning to myself. So trying to understand the meanings that we all create 
for ourselves and for each other. And that's where Shakuntala is also trying to create a meaning by her own existence, which is not being responded this, by someone else. So somewhere this kind of study we have to understand. And as you mentioned, sir, so I would request Professor Godarj Mishra and Professor Mohanty to conceptualize some such conferences. Supervise me, sir. I am the executive. You are the legislative. So I, I will put all your ideas into practice uh, because I am a student uh, of someone who has been uh, believing in Chhatra Dharma all his life. Professor Kapoor is here. So he has been more uh, Khatri. Kapoor's are Khatris. So he has been Khatri, Chhatriyas. So I am here as your executive. <laughs> so uh, I will f follow uh, your advice, your guidance in that. Now further, I request uh, Professor Kapil Kapoor ji to be here and our Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, to chair the session. I request, sir, both of you to kindly come. I request uh, uh, Professor Ravinder ji to escort Professor Kapoor to the uh, dais. Now, this is the scholarly spirit. Since morning, Professor Kapoor needed some help at his age of uh, 84, which he attained very recently. <laughs> uh, but now we see him walking. So, so maybe Professor Rajneesh will tell us during tea break whether it was idea of Professor Kapoor that was walking or the physicality. So, or, or perhaps both, the idea embodied in the physicality. So, it is there. Of course, uh, uh, both dignitaries on the dais, they, don't, they need no introduction. And uh, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh is a well-known name in his field. He's not only simply, I, I don't say that he's only a vice chancellor, because his personality is much beyond that. Vice chancellor is restricted like a king is known only in his kingdom. Vice chancellor belongs only to a small university which is 600 acres, 500 acres, et cetera, et cetera. But his works, his scholarship is well known beyond the, the ages of this university. And uh, he has been a, uh, a student, if I may say so, sir, uh, a student of a, an eminent scholar of an eminent scholar about whom both of us, we often talk, and I have very fond memories with him. We had celebrated his 75th birthday also. He's an eminent scholar. And more than eminent scholar, he has been a great teacher also, Professor UN, UP, Professor UP Aroda, Uday Prakash Aroda ji, who has been a historian, uh, but more than historian, he, ha he has been a great teacher. He has encouraged people like us, ordinary mortals like us, to try to do, contribute something which, which the world's language will take as immortal. But, uh, and here, uh, we, he is uh, there to guide us. I will talk more about his guidance later. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Kapil Kapoor, uh, how to introduce him, Sir Ravinder Singh Ji? Can he ever be introduced? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I think it was said uh, in the beginning, legendary uh, scholar, so can legends be introduced? So I don't know how to introduce, but uh, one basic introduction is there, that uh, he is a great teacher who can teach you about Panini, about Chomsky, about Shakespeare, and about Kalidas. without you even feeling that you are being taught. <laughs> so that is the only thing I can say, I can tell about him. Uh, he's one of the few persons who established uh, the Indological systems uh, and the Indological thoughts. Uh, and the core challenge that comes to many of our uh, thought uh, patterns because initially I had said in the beginning when I was asked to 
talk about the theme of the conference, I had said that we have the globe-trotting professors, and now here is only not a globe-trotting, but only a text and idea-trotting teacher. So <laughs> that is the only thing I could. Uh, Indian knowledge tradition is naturally, the moment you talk of globe in terms of an idea, it, it can only be Indian. So, so was, that aspect is there. That is why, sir, now may I request, sir, would you like to talk from there or you would like to come? Yes, 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 sir. So as you say, sir. Sabko namaskar. In this uh, uh, confabulation about world literature, by many people from many parts of the world here, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, conjunction. And uh, before I was asked to come here, I had never really thought much about uh, world literature. We had heard about classics. We had heard about comparative literature. But uh, in spite of Harish Trivedi, I paid no attention to world literature. Those who know the reference will get why I am saying that. World and the literature. First of all, I must thank, I am often, you know, bad in my social manners. You see, I must thank Honorable Vice Chancellor Saab for giving us such wonderful hospitality, a five-star guest house, and also being so kind and affectionate in, in talking to me and meeting us. And also, of course, Sushant. Sushant ji, to ab kya kehna chahiye? Sushant ji, to apne bachche hi hai. But uh, aaj kal ke bachche bhi bigde huye hote hai, na? Aur ye bigde huye bachche nahi hai. And uh, like good children, like good child, he has always been, he's very, he's, he, both he and Rajneesh are very quiet people. But they are two persons whom you don't have to say what you need. They understand what you need. And this is saying something. And uh, that's why I'm very happy to be here. And... Uh, Although I haven't thought much about this subject, but I'll share some, some thoughts with you. First of all, word and literature, both the words require reflection. Which world, whose literature we are talking about? I think broadly speaking, we are talking of the educated world. We are talking of those parts of the world where literature is there, has been composed in, in letters, in letters. So we are talking of the learned world, and the entire world is not learned. Not that learned, being learned is a virtue, I don't think it is. Because uh, the ability to read is a very dangerous ability, you know. The people who fought the world wars were all people who could read. Hmm? And the Adivasis who don't know how to read, they never destroy a forest. They don't destroy the environment. The greatest damage to the world is done by learned people. Now we are talking about the learned people. People are learned. That world. But then civilizationally, civilizationally, the human history has had several, you know, several instances of a civilized world which created a great body of literature and that literature which traveled beyond its boundaries, beyond its boundaries. So look at the Greeks, for example, in philosophy, in poetry, in drama, hmm? 
and uh, their influence went right across Asia. Of course, it went behind Alexander. And Alexander, whose teacher Aristotle, Aristotle, it was a, it was a, it was a deadly combination. Aristotle was the master of terra cognita, and he taught Alexander to conquer terra firma. So Alexander marched across Asia, and wherever he went, the Greek art, the Greek philosophy, the Greek literature went. You have in India till today, till today, the reflex of the Greek influence, Greek influence in so many spheres of our life. In Punjab particularly, if a boy starts talking very wisely, parents say, Tu bada aflatoon hai. Aflatoon is Plato. Hmm? Tu bada aflatoon hai. So the, we have, this is Greek civilization produced a large body of literature which has continued to influence mankind till today. Till today. And I think Greek world was a learned world. At that time, there were, there were I think, three, three learned worlds. Uh, Chinese, Greek, Indian, and I think uh, early, early Arabs, early Semitic, the Jews, the Judaic people. So these four centers of learning were there. And uh, it is always the centers of learning which interact and where, you know, the boundaries are crossed. And one receives, acquires, acquires, uh, and reformulates, and then puts into practice, combining it with, with its own practices, and creating a new body of literature. So that happens. So we are talking of the learned world. But the important thing is, in today when we are talking of world literature, we are talking of scriptal literature, scriptal. But an important point is, Indian literature, India's literature, is mostly oral literature. Oral. Even today, a large body of India's literature is oral literature. And I don't think any program of world literature takes into account the, the Gita, the Katha, and the Natak of Northeast or of the forest dwellers of uh, this uh, Ranchi and uh, Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat, you know, where a massive body of oral literature is created, has been created. Because I happen to, again with Rajneesh ji and Sushanji, you know, we did an encyclopedia of Indian poetics, 28 Indian languages. And we have finally, in the introduction, said it's a poetics of orality. Indian literature is essentially oral. Let's not uh, be uh, fooled by or mistaken by the fact that we have a, a Gita Press Gorakhpur, printed Valmiki Ramayan, we have printed Mahabharat. But rem rem remember, they are all metrical texts, metrical. So when they are metrical, they are meant to be sung. They are meant to be performed. Shravya Preksha. They are Shravya Preksha literature. It's not a literature to be read in an armchair with a light on your left and a cup of coffee on your armrest. Our Indian literature is not meant to be read. It is a literature which is meant to be participated in. You participate in it in various ways. So we have to be very clear. Okay, we are talking about a certain section, a certain section of society, a certain section and a certain body of literature when we talk of world. If the world to bada bada lagta hai, world. But I, I think I'm, those who are dealing with it, they know that uh, uh, the idea of uh, a satisfactory composition of world literature is almost an unattainable ideal. It's very difficult to attain that ideal, because every nation has its own world literature. Agar Pakistan mein world literature ka syllabus banega, to wo India se alag banega. Hamara world literature alag hai, unka alag hoga. So there is nothing like an uh, impersonal, detached, defined 
world literature. Hey, nee. World literature, the very notion of uh, this concept of this discipline, it's a very new discipline, very recent. I think uh, I'll come to that a little later, but first I must attend to the second question of literature. You see, literature is also a problematic expression. When you say world literature, for example, will you include uh, Bhartri Hari, Zubakya Padiya in world literature? Will you include uh, uh, a philosopher like Plato in your course of world literature? Plato, because Plato, is basically everybody says he's a philosopher, he has written dialogues, he has written prose, but as you know, uh, Shelley and others, they said that uh, Plato is in fact, although he exiles the poets from Republic, but he himself is a poet. His prose is poetic. His images are poetic. You remember the image about the Cratylus and the image. Huh? So will you include Plato in literature? So that, def that problem also has to be you know, dealt with when you are defining or when you are trying to set up or formulate a syllabus of world literature. So world literature itself, uh, a problematic uh, conjunction. It's a world, uh, it's a kind of a composition. It's not, a, not even a compound because uh, you don't know whether you mean uh, it is a kind of compound but not one that modifies the other. Not then modifies the other. What we mean is literature of all the countries in the world, world literature. Also, where selection kaise karna, those are later problems. So this is one domain. You know, Shankaracharya, for example, Adi Shankaracharya, Sundarya Lahiri. Is Sundarya Lahiri a poem or is it a philosophy? Or Bhartri Hari is a Vakipadiya and his beautiful image of a banyan tree being there in the seed, you know, in the seed, or uh, a pravaha of a river being either, you know, absolute or just bhavaharic. So those are, they are, they are poetic expressions, poetic. So is he a prose writer or is he a poet? So this distinction will be very difficult. What do we include? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Will Guru Granth Sahib or Rig Veda form a necessary part of literature or not? Is it metrical literature? It's metrical literature. It's, uh, they, are not really, they are not really sacred books in the sense that, uh, uh, that you know, if you, if you do some impiety, people will cut you off. In India, there is nothing sacred. We don't have a sacred literature. Vedas are not sacred. The Vedas are not sacred in the sense that you can, you can uh, disagree with the Vedas. You can even abuse Vedas. In fact, they have been critiqued from the day they were composed, Vedas were. So, this is the caveat that the world literature ko pehle hum thoda uski domain ke bare mein bhi sochna padega. Now, I want to give you some idea of the series that, you know, where literature has been crossing the boundaries. Because later on, as you know, the basic thing is, how do you define, uh, how do you include uh, a particular composition in the body of world literature. Kaun se parameter hai? Kya criterion honge that will help you put a particular composition in, uh, in what you call world literature, world literature. To usme, the, there are very clear instances in, our, in the history of mankind where you find literature or bodies of literature crossing the boundaries. I gave you the example of Greece, for example. Philosophy, poetry, huh? art, they crossed boundaries. Uswakat ka jo world tha, learned world tha, wo Greek ho gaya. Followed by them, Alexandria school and the, and the Romans. Uh, Romans, Romans uh, were uh, not uh, dramatic people, they were not epic people, they were rhetoricians and they were people of civil management. They made roads across Europe. They were men of law, laws, Roman law, and you know, Roman rhetoric, Cicero, Cicero, for example. 
and historians like Plutarch, Plutarch, whom Shakespeare used, you know, several centuries later for his Roman plays. So Plutarch. So uh, isn't with the, their kind of work? We can take we can take some under, draw some understanding from how why certain works crossed the boundaries not only of space but also of time. In fact, for any work to be to to reach the masses masses, irrespective of the boundaries, whether of time or space, a work has to have certain qualities, something that endures. Addison, Joseph Addison, an English uh, 17th century, 18th century prose writer, he says that, uh, you know, there are some works which endure. You can change their language, you can change their format also, but they endure. And they endure and they subsist in different climates, different climes, different areas. For example, Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad, you translate in Punjabi. I have, nobody has done it. But if you do it, I tell you it will be the most popular poem in Punjab because it suits the Punjabi temperament, you know. Ek to ladte rehna. Every day you get up, aaj main usko nahi You know, if those who have, have read Iliad, Every morning the warrior gets up and says, today I'm going to see him. Then, take the other girl to take the prize money. The prize money. That was the prize money. The Agamemnon, the Agamemnon, the prize money. They take it. Then, there's a fight on that. And in the Rig Veda, your Rig Veda, which people think is a very sacred book and uh, very religious, in fact, Rig Veda is all about three things. Water, water, Women and war. Teen cheese. Abun ki hymns for ye. Water women. Are the goddess, goddess of uh, like Usha, dawn. So lagega ki dekhoji devi ke upar hai. But it's a beautiful description of a beautiful woman. You know, usha of goddess ke alo kush ke alo. So this is basically about this. And this, this, uh, this kind of, this kind of composition, universal. It is universal. In great works, uh, I am reminded that uh, in uh, and that Helen, Helen of Troy, you know, the, the entire uh, Iliad, Iliad, nowhere is the beauty of Helen described. But there is only one small instance. The war has gone on, many people have died, it's night time. Three elderly Trojans, elderly, they are standing on the rampart. And outside, you know, the torches of the Greek camps, you know, like the whole sky has come down. That is the Roma, that is the Homeric simile. Homer is famous for his similes. Homeric simile. Uswaka, three old men are standing. And they see the, the funeral fires burning all around. And they say, all for a woman. Was it worth it? At that moment, Helen comes and passes. They look at her and they say, yes, it was worth it. <laughs> this is the only description of Helen's beauty. And Rajneesh ji was talking about suggestion of literature, you know, suggestion in literature. So that is done. So Romans, Roman me Cicero, at that time the learned world, Puri Byzantine Empire ka jo area hai. Pura Europe. Europe. You see, it was, uh, it was inspired by, by Roman, Roman literature, Roman history and all that. So ye cross kar gaya, cross kar about it. Come then to, after that we can come to, uh, you see, let's say, the French period of, uh, ye jo, in, in every boundary crossing, there is a language empire. We must remember this, language empire. For example, the Greek, the Greek literature. That means the Greek language went across, you see? And with the Romans, Latin. Latin went across. And if, Lat if Roman empire had not been created, your modern European languages would have been different. Your modern European languages are a product of Latin. Latin say romance languages ka sara jo growth hai, Latin se hua. So Latin, Latin, uske baad, 
there, there was a period of the French dominance. As you know, French was the dominant language before English became the dominant language. Because right up to 1780, French was the official language of Russians. In the Russian, you know, and, uh, and uh, perhaps we all know that after the Battle of Hastings, Battle of Hastings, French was the official and cultural language of Britain. England ki jo language samrant bhasha thi, it was, it was English. It 350 years passed before the Englishmen passed a law in English. It, they were doing everything in French, art, administration, governance. So French was the dominant language. And with that, at that period, Europe, Europe got into, you know, that uh, if in 19th century, you have the art movements, like Impressionism and other things, it's because 16th century onwards, the French literature and French language went across, went across. Uh, it didn't, uh, in the colonial period, did much impact on Asia, on Asia, it didn't. But in Europe and other places, it did. And then you have your, this great English language, hmm? the English language period, English language hegemony, which in fact, your, your world literature was created to perpetuate the English hegemony. The, this, this discipline of world, world literature is, uh, it was, it was a post-colonial, post-colonial, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Karl Marx calls it literary market. You see, it's a literary market, a, a post-colonial literary market created to perpetuate देखो ना पैसे पहले तो यहाँ थे पैसे ले जाते थे यहाँ से मर्जी ले जाते थे अब कॉलोनीज खत्म हो गई अब पैसे कैसे जाएंगे एक तो उनका प्रोजेक्ट हुआ ELT का English language teaching and those of you who are involved in English language teaching know that every five years the technology changed and the book changed the theory changed direct method structural method this method and along with that the books changed and books mein the, the nature of the book change pehle book hi hoti thi student ke liye then teachers book and the students book teen teen and then ek uske baad wo cassette aa gaye pehle cassette aa gaye fir tape aa gayi fir tape hat gayi fir wo cd aa gayi fir dvd aa gayi and your universities universities are full of unused or underused technology ko har teesre saal fashion badalta tha it was an economic enterprise ELT. In the same way, world literature was thought of, although the first time I will come to that, that but for Indian, Indian influence, the whole idea of world literature would not have appeared. I'll just say, show it to you. You see, the, it, was a, it, was, it was a method, kya hai? Ki bhi aapne a world literature ka course bana diya, world literature ra gaya. अब आपने कितनी ही कुछ चाइनीज लगाना है कुछ फ्रेंच लगाना है सारा अंग्रेजी के माध्यम से लगाना है तो वो इंग्लिश पब्लिशर वो पब्लिश पब्लिश करते हैं और अगर फैशन तो वहां से चलता है दुनिया का और सारी दुनिया हम फॉलो करते हैं उनको अनक्रिटिकली तो वो सारी दुनिया में किताबें बिकती हैं फिर किताबें ही नहीं बिकती फिर उनके एक्सपर्ट्स भी आते हैं हमारे यहाँ है ना इन ई एल टी ELT times, I am, an, I am an old opponent of ELT from day one. I was an opponent of ELT. Wo ke assistant professor kahi British universities ka aata tha aur humare bade bade professor saamne baith ke sunte the ke abhi English language kaise padhani hai, hai na? Unke saamne bade, pe, bade shraddha se sunte the. Wo bhi aate the, wo bhi unko bhi kharcha sara sara. Isi tarah isme bhi this disciplinary formation has a politics and an economics. There is a social economic dimension to this because social economic, social also because, because Karl Marx and Engels in Communist Manifesto, you know, they say, they say that uh, the bourgeois, bourgeois values, the bourgeois values are perpetuated by this middle class literature. Jitna ye nationalities ke literatures hain, they all, you know, have those humanistic values. Right? Now, humanistic values 
according to the according to the marxist theory the humanistic values stand in the way of in the way of what they perceive as justice and equality you know? so the french revolution all men are born equal which is the greatest lie ever told you know but everybody accepts it all men are born equal in fact not two persons are born equal but then at that became the slogan and you have uh, you have all this that follows revolution and conflict because as marx said the 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 duty of philosophy is not to describe the world but to change it and you change by conflict change jo hota hai wo wo sangharsh hai na tu khada rahe hum tere piche hain narendra ke aaj kal bhi matlab ke ha hum tumhare saath hain tum tum sangharsh karo hum tumhare saath hain ye sara wahi se shuru hua hai na sara ladai jhagda but whether it is successful or not it failed the experiment failed in russia completely collapsed and in india it things take longer time to fail but they fail but they fail later in fact when they fail outside we keep their remnants here unke remnants hum preserve karte hain when you remember that when lenin's uh, statue was brought down in uh, russia then the bengal west bengal government offered to take it ke hum laga lenge katora culture hai na hamari katora culture kuch bhi de do hum rakh lenge anyways to ye this uh, idea that communist manifesto ka idea that literature this from from nationalities from local and from all these you know the perpetuation of in fact the world literature must go beyond so that is why aapke hindi departments jo hai jnu wagaira ke wo bhakti poetry nahi padhate क्योंकि भक्ति पोइट्री में तो बुरजो वैल्यूज है दया क्षमा है ना और दया क्षमा करोगे तो फिर सिर कैसे काटोगे है ना और रेवोल्यूशन में तो सिर काटना पड़ता है सो so इसलिए वो नहीं पढ़ाते तो दिस 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 एंड बाय द वे कम्युनिस्ट मैनिफेस्टो क्लेम्ड टू बी अ टिपिकल एंड एट दैट टाइम ओनली टेक्स द वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर बिकॉज इट टॉक्ड अबाउट universal human problem it didn't talk about uh, the labor of france or labor of germany or the employment conditions here and there but it talked of you know the whole structure social structure that promotes welfare of mankind so communist manifesto is a typical and by the way i don't know whether rajneesh ji remembers or not i i had prescribed a communist manifesto in my 19th century course and i used to teach it as a moral document communist manifesto is a moral document although they play i i'm sure they'll be very unhappy marx and engel that i am calling it a moral document because they they called it a typical typical just egalitarian you know world world document not pertaining to any nationality because from local local and small nationalities emerges a certain kind of thinking and creation which becomes world class universal universal whether it happens or not i don't know but that is the claim but the fact that the subject matter of communist manifesto because there are many many themes you know parameters jab aap sochenge to aap uh, themes se jayenge subject matter se jayenge वैल्यूज से जाएंगे वैल्यू से जाएंगे कोई चीज आप लेके जैसे अरबिंदो जो था वो क्रिएटिविटी के हिसाब से वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर डिसाइड करते थे इमेजिनेशन टाइप ऑफ इमेजिनेशन टाइप ऑफ ओरिजिनलिटी यू नो दो फीचर्स विच आर वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू टू असेस बट देर आर अदर अदर पैरामीटर्स विच आर वेरी सिंपल एनी टेक्स्ट एनी टेक्स्ट विच गोज बियॉन्ड इट्स बाउंड्रीज physical temporal and cultural boundaries and travels across it's a, it's world literature it become world literature with the with the proviso i provided in the beginning that it still belongs to this the educated world jo log padhte likhte hain aur unka hai the masses ke liye iska koi india ke masses 
आप जितने मर्जी वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर के डिपार्टमेंट खोल लो वो जो बोटमैन है बंगाल का वो तो टैगोर के गीत गाएगा और जो पनवाड़ी है यूपी का वो रामचरित मानस के दुहे गाएगा आप जितने मर्जी डिपार्टमेंट दूसरे बना लीजिए पर जो मासिस हैं कोई भी टेक्स्ट क्या मॉडर्न लिटरेचर की कोई भी टेक्स्ट मासिस के पास गई है मासिस के पास दी सो कॉल्ड मेट्रोपॉलिटन लिटरेचर दैट हैज बीन क्रिएटेड इन इंडिया अंडर द इन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ द वेस्ट आई डोंट थिंक एनी टेक्स्ट हैज द रीच रीच ऑफ ए टेक्स्ट लाइक रामचरित मानस और ऑफ अवर यू नो ऑफ पृथ्वीराज रासो ऑफ आला उदल which are the which which are which are mass mass texts because they are sung they are and all that so dekhiye fir english empire as i said every crossing the boundaries of a of a literature takes place when the national nation that produces it acquires military power it is the military power which is followed by its literature is literature and english is the last example english empire bana the sun never set and the sun never set and so the english book was never shut hmm? it was always as you know on a single day on 30th april 1835 the, the william bending signed english education act and on 1st may it was implemented and from that day we were cut off from our own languages and arabindo says a community that loses its language loses its soul and we lost our soul our languages were assassinated by a single signature in one day and we are taken 70 years nine education commissions and so on so, and so many committees and all that and we are we still have not been able to bring our languages back so the, the there there is to be have we become world class by this by doing so much in english because if english is the if you have a world literature world literature course you will be depending heavily on english translation isn't it so english hegemony say but we are we are the we are pseudo english people you know all of us have we become world class a world we become part of the world thinking have we escaped our indian self i don't think so we cannot the identities the identities of people which are located in the soil to which they belong those identities do not shift by uh, disciplinary formations that come about all empires linguistic empires which carried the literatures they were created by force of arms but sanskrit empire sanskrit empire is the only empire godbari ji which was not created by the force of arms you will agree the sanskrit empire spread across asia northeast asia central asia southeast asia even iran up to iran you see it is was not created by force of arms other linguistic empires have vanished but the sanskrit empire still lives the sanskrit tradition i will call it a literary tradition you can call philosophical literary but by for me uh, literature has a broader meaning vangmay anything which is composed in language is literature so the sanskrit tradition is a donor tradition has always been a donor tradition and even today it's a donor tradition it's a donor tradition now let me tell you how this discipline of world literature was enabled by indian influence in 16th 17th century early 17th century dara shiko the elder brother of aurangzeb he translated 66 upanishads into persian with the help of a sufi saint in shrinagar in the, on a hill which is called these days pari mahal and they say in the night when you see there on the western side of dal lake eastern side of dal lake that hill aapko raat mein wahan kai bar lights dikhti hain you see people say 
But that was the place where Sufis had their adda, Sufi thinkers, Sufi thinkers, not, not Sufis the converters of Hindus, because Sufis were also converters of Hindus, but Sufi thinkers. And Darashiko went there, he conveyed, translated into Persian. That copy, it was copied by some traveler and it was taken to France. And it fell into the hands of Du Perron. Du Perron translated it into Latin in 1764, into Latin. From 1764 to 1800, it was translated into all the European languages. And by 1807, every university in Europe had a Sanskrit chair. The first chair was in the University of Copenhagen, 1795. And by 1807, every, every university had a chair in Sanskrit. And in 19th century, sir, every European young boy or a girl were doing Sanskrit the way our young people have been doing computer and commerce. Everyone was doing Sanskrit. And all the great minds of Europe, 19th century Europe, they were either Sanskritists or had studied Sanskrit. You see, Schiller, Schelling, Schopenhauer, huh? Nietzsche, Kant, you know, all of them show remarkable, you know, reflection influences of uh, the Sanskrit knowledge which now the, the Europeans took to Sanskrit, Indian studies. We took to English studies, rough about the same time. But the difference is that we took to English, but we lost our own ground. We did not stand on our own ground. We abandoned our tradition. Backward hai, obsolete hai, isse kya milta hai. Raja Ram Mon Roy, great scholar of Sanskrit, telling the British that Sanskrit has no knowledge. Aap Angrezi ke college kholiye. The man who said, I want to be buried in England, you know, Ram Mon Roy, and he was buried in Bristol. And then when Dwarkanath brought his bones to India, today he is buried in the Wilson Cemetery. Huh? This is how we have betrayed our own country and cause, you see. So we, this, I mean, the, 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 this, this transformation that was taking place in us in that time, at that time, the, I lost, <coughs> kya kya ra tha? Kya kya ra tha, Sanskrit was a dominant tradition. Sanskrit dominant tradition. And you see, in 19th century, everybody was doing Sanskrit in Europe. And we, we did not stand on our ground. So for 200 years of English and Western knowledge, we have not produced a single thinker. We have not produced a thought stream, thought stream, and we have not produced any 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 great literature, any great literature, sub average. English writing in Indian writing in English. Huh? There are only two persons who are, I think, who are, I think, world class. One is uh, our uh, R K Narayan, and the other is that Job. Oh, Masuri Wale. Huh? Ruskin Bond. Ruskin Bond and R.K. Narayan. Because R.K. Narayan's, R.K. Narayan's, uh, town? Malguri. Malguri. Malguri Tales. You know, you, you, Malguri Tales has been translated into 89 languages. And it has translated into Chinese. And it was transformed into a film serial. Uh, and in whatever format you put it, in whatever language, it's a success. That is crossing the boundaries, crossing the boundaries. And it, here is a case of not being sponsored by academicians. It was not sponsored by academicians. It was not part of the university syllabi, And it was not part of the anthology of world literature, nor was it mentioned in the encyclopedia of world literature, which is there. And yet, it went to the masses. It went to the, that's a true, true world literature. That is a true world literature, which goes to the masses without these interventions, without these interventions. So we did not produce anything. But Europe, when they took to Sanskrit studies, they stayed on their, in their own tradition. 
they did not give up. It is because of that, that they created through an interaction of their own tradition with the, the Indian tradition of thought, they created a new discipline, historical linguistics. They produced great minds, great minds. I mentioned some, I'll mention three more. And they're a, a, a kind of a new stream of thought. Ferdinand is sure, Panchanan Manti ji with apologies to him. I may make a mistake, my, my, I am a man of so many things, na, mu marta hu na, idhar udhar, pakka kahi bhi nahi hu. So, <laughs> is liye, uh, Ferdinand is sure, who is called the father of structuralism. Hmm? Structuralism? His PA, he was, a, he was a professor of Sanskrit in Geneva. And he used to teach three courses, elementary, middle, and higher level courses. And his manuscripts, he wrote down his courses when he taught. His manuscripts are still available in Geneva Library. And a few are in the Harvard, in Harvard. And he is the father of structuralism. Now, structuralism, structuralism to post, post, I don't know how many times, post-modernism, post, post, post-structuralism. That is the contemporary European thought is structuralism plus utilitarianism. Plus utilitarianism. This is the contemporary Western civilization. Now, who is the responsible? Sassior, who was a professor of Sanskrit and whose structural principles were derived from Ashtadhyayi, Panini's Ashtadhyayi, if somebody examines the meta language of Panini Ashtadhyayi, you can see the Advaita, the kind of non-dualistic principle through intra-inter-hierarchy heredity, uh, heredity uh, going right up to one principle, you know, the Shabda Brahma, Shabda Brahma, to right up to the multiplicity of sounds, multiplicity of sounds. The, the Sanskrit grammarians, uh, one Shastra says, they went to the sea coast to get, uh, to, to get uh, these, what uh, kya hoti hai, sipiyan, sipi. Angrezi bhul jata hoon, haat tang ho gaya Shells, cowry shells. They went to get cowry shells, but they ended up by finding a pearl. Unko moti mil gaya, shabd brahma ka. You see, Bhatri Hari is uh, first, first, Shloka, first Karika in Brahmakanda, Shabda Brahmaka. So this, uh, this, 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 this Sasurian intervention, Sasur's intervention in the Western history of ideas is called the phonocentric revolution. Agar aap unka history of ideas padhe, it's called phonocentric revolution. And that is, till then, they had believed that language is writing. It is Sassur who told them language is sound, speech. And the, the logos, the idea of logos, the written word with a meaning, fixed meaning, was destabilized by this notion of language being speech. Because speech is temporary. It comes and goes. It comes, it, there is a temporal existence. It doesn't exist in space. So it's there. And, and there, this destabilization led to the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg and the uncertainty of the post-structural thinkers who said that the linguistic meaning is uncertain. There is, and they led to all the reader response theories, you know, how you create meaning and all that. And so you know, in science and all that, uncertainty. Uncertainty, the very, it, they already suffered Western civilization from anxiety. They suffer from anxiety of second coming, of Armageddon, Christ to Added to that was this uncertainty. And this uncertainty. And that's why the Western civilization is a constantly destabilized civilization. Har vakat larte rehte hain. Hamko kehte hain peace. Hamko kehte hain human rights. Khud drone chala ke, roj bees aadmi maar dete hain. So you see their own self, their contradictions, but they, but they teach us. Hame human rights se khate hain, jabke humare jain dharma mein 
जीव के राइट्स हैं जीव के ही नहीं सृष्टि में टू टू नॉट टू अलाउ अ रिवर टू फ्लो नेचुरली इज वायलेंस नॉट टू लेट ए प्लांट और ए ट्री ग्रो नेचुरली इज वायलेंस अकॉर्डिंग टू अवर फिलोसफी और ये हमको ह्यूमर ही सिखाते हैं एंड यू नो अब ये सब तो तुम्हारा थाट था बट वी आर बिकम दी एडमायर ऑफ दिस जेनोसाइडल वेस्टर्न सिविलाइजेशन जेनोसाइडल 1940-45, million Jews killed in factories, but we are their admirers and followers. और उनको देखते देखते हम यहाँ हमारे सिविलाइजेशनल ट्रीज होते थे बड़ का पेड़ पीपल का पेड़ जामन का पेड़ और नीम का पेड़ ह्यूज आजकल हम बोनजाई बनाने लग गए है ना बड़ के पेड़ को इतना सा कर देते हैं बड़े को छोटा करने में हम स्पेशलाइज करने लग गए Our civilization also has become a bonsai civilization because we are imitators. We derive our ideas, everything from them. So this Sanskrit is. Abhi to Sushil bataya. The second parent of structural European thought is Roman Jakobson, the formalist. And Roman Jakobson is a PhD. You know, Sushil's PhD was on what? So Sue's PhD was on the sixth case in Sanskrit, Shasti, Sambandha Karak. His PhD was on Sambandha Karak. And Roman Yakovson's PhD was on Vedic mythology. And the third parent was Trubetskoy of Praha School. He was a Praha School of Phonetic, Phonology. His PhD was on Rigved. These three sources are contemporary Western thought. Ke. And they all come from Sanskrit. Now, in logo ne, in se kya hua? Yeah, we are talking of crossing the boundaries. You see, literature. Uh, then, what happened in 1890? 1890, Harvard University decided to translate, translate 123 Indian texts into English. ट्रांसलेशन से ही होता है ना वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर एम आई राइट के रॉन्ग मैंने तो यही सुना दो दिनों में कि ट्रांसलेशन से ही होता है तो दे ट्रांसलेटेड इन टू इंग्लिश दे डिसाइडेड टू सो फार नाइन्टी टू हैव बिन ट्रांसलेटेड अभी वन ट्वेंटी थ्री नहीं हुए हैं दे ट्रांसलेटेड दे आर इंडियन टेक्स दे इज वन पर्शियन टेक्स इन दैट एंड देर आर देर आर टू और थ्री टेक्स फ्रॉम पाली एंड प्राकृत द रेस्ट आर सैंस्क्रिट यू सी पर संस्कृत पाली प्राकृत इज इंडियन इंडियन हेरिटेज तो उसको उन्होंने किया एंड देन एट द सेम टाइम मैक्स मोलर ये मेरे बोलने से हुआ करंट लगता है बोलने से कई बार ना एनर्जाइज हो गया सो यू सी सेम टाइम मैक्स मोलर Sacred books of the East, fifty volumes, but seventy-two books translated into English. One twenty-three and seventy-two, one hundred and ninety-five Indian texts were translated into English, which were then within the next few years, few years, ninety-two plus fifty. कहिए अभी वो ही हुए one forty-two were translated into all the European languages, European languages. और उसमें आपके पोइट्स भी हैं फिलासफर्स भी हैं इसी बिकॉज लिटरेचर की डेफिनेशन यू हैव टू बाइडन यू कांट यू कांट हैव क्लासिक्स अनलेस यू आर ए सीरी आर अविंदो जो कि सावित्री ही लिखेगा और आप भी पोइट्री ही करेंगे बट गीत कथा कथा आपको पता है वेद को भी कथा कहते हैं वेद को कथा कथा इज फ्रॉम कथ कथ मीन्स कहना एनी थिंग सेड इज लिटरेचर Anything said is literature. You see, sahitya, shabdarth, sahito, kavya. You see this. Then you know this. This uh, uh, incipient dementia. You know, you know, suddenly you lose the track, track of the argument. It's better to write your lectures. You know, then you can read and sound very cogent. Anyways, I was saying that. these texts have been translated into european languages now would you say 
won't you say that the world literature, by your definition, the whole idea, it is given by this Indian intervention? Another example, it is Gaite, who for the first time in 1827 said that we should go beyond our national literatures. Do you know why? Because he read Shakuntala in translation. He read Shakuntala. And from there he moved into that we should go out of. And then there is a whole history. The debate was picked up. National boundaries say nikal ke. And, and it became a large movement when the economic interest, you know, joined it in, in 20th century. In 20th century, 1922-30 onwards, there are many thinkers who start talking about this. But there is a small section, small section of thinkers who are against this concept of world literature because they say that it is not possible. It is unattainable. Even what you call world literature is only a selection, small selection, from uh, say a large body. And your literature also needs all written literature. You don't go into, for the African societies also have very rich oral literature. We have very rich oral literature. I mean, you have uh, the Gond epics, you have Sthal Puranas of small places, you know. They are all, no, they, are not, they are not written down. They are sung, they are meant to be sung. But we don't include them. So the whole notion of world literature is, is more, and, and it is an enterprise. It is an enterprise. Ek to jab ye ek discipline ban jata hai, to ek department ban jata hai, usme teen, teen assistant professor, do associate professor, ek professor, phir ek building ban jati hai, hai na? Ye bhi, after all, psychology was part of philosophy. Then why did it come out of philosophy? Because some very senior people were not able to become professors, so they divided the department. Or psychology banadi, or usme wo professor ban gaya. Language was part of the English department always. Hai na? English may say language nikal di, phir language may say linguistics nikal di. Hai na? I say how disciplinary formations take place. But anyway, I am not against. I am not against reading the best that has been thought or written in the world. You see, all, all of us, all of us have read what was best written and best thought in the world. I can offhand, you know, I mean, count the books which I cannot forget, count the writings which I cannot forget. I am a particular admirer of Russian fiction, you see, Russian fiction, like Virginia Woolf. I am a great admirer of Russian fiction, of, of Tolstoy, of uh, Dostoevsky, huh? of Pushkin, of uh, that uh, storyteller Ranga, that Chol Chekhov, 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 you see? And of course, the French, uh, the, the finest experience I had when I was very young was when I read Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, you see? And uh, in this way you can go on, Emily Dickinson in America, Confucius, if you go into Confucius, or the axioms of Lao Tse, Lao Tse, and in our own, in our own large body of literature, not only, you see, I think we must also, I must also draw your attention to the fact that Indian literature, in fact, is world literature in a way. Because Indian literature is like the whole body of European literature. Hamari hmm? itni heritages hain, you know, our languages mein, our language literatures are so rich, you know, so rich. I mean, they are older than English in history. Maharashtra, Prakrit, Marathi, Marathi, in the Marathi Prakrit, in the first century, you composed Gatha Satsai, 700 quatrains, all dealing with women, all dealing with women. Great work of poetry, first century AD, in Marathi Prakrit. So Marathi literature from that time, Kannada literature, Bangla literature, and Gujarati literature, we have massive bodies of these. You, uh, they are, uh, Nehru tried to make them nationalities because he had read the European political science, state, nation, nationality, ek language hoti hai, ek, ek race hoti hai, ek religion hota hai, so wo bhe, bhe, ek nation ban jati hai. So he was, he was led by that. But otherwise, these are not nationalities because the entire 
body of uh, communities in India and the language literatures. They are all bound together by a unity of consciousness. What I call Gyan Janit Chaitanya Ki Ekatamta. Gyan Janit Chaitanya Ki Ekatamta. You see that unified consciousness which is generated by a shared body of knowledge, which began with the Vedic, vast Vedic. People have no idea. Vedic mein log sote char Vedi hain. But you know, it's such a vast body of Vedic literature and it has sciences. Vedangas, the six Vedangas are coterminous and they are necessary in order to read the Vedas. They are all sciences, six sciences. And the, uh, you know, from uh, text Veda to Samhita, Samhita se Yajur or uh, variations and the corresponding Brahmana, corresponding At uh, Aranyaka, corresponding uh, Upanishad, corresponding Pratishakya, corresponding uh, Dharma Shastra. You can imagine the vast body of literature that is our heritage because Indian civilization has been knowledge centered from day one. We have the world's oldest book, oldest poetry, oldest prose, oldest book of mathematics, oldest book of grammar, oldest book of phonetics, oldest book of sociology, oldest book of astronomy, and you can go on and on and on. And we are in fact the Manas Gangotri of world knowledge. World knowledge, you see? The zero, concept of zero. The numerals, one to nine. And Unqua, the British told us Arabic numerals. But what do the Arabs call them? Arabs kya kehte unko? Hind se. Hind se. They call them Hind se. Hind se. And uh, the value of pi and calculus and uh, algebra and the concept of infinity, you go on. Without these, no modern knowledge is possible. So, having been inheritors of all this, I think our Sanskrit tradition which Sanskrit empire, which was not created by the force of arms, but by the force of ideas, continues to be the donor tradition. As I said in 19th century, 195 books of yours, they told us Sanskrit is a dead language. Hey and they started using it. Or hum maan gaye. Hum kyo maan gaye? Because language doesn't die, people die. Because we are dead people. We are dead to the language. So we accepted it. We accepted it. And one after the other, you see, things now, there are, there are in the Vedic, Vedic literature, there are names of 202 sciences. 202. 18 nigamas, 120 agamas, and 64 extraordinary sciences. Divya Vidyas. It is those 64 sciences which now the West is trying to understand because they have reached the threshold of their mechanical science. Mechanical science. Or Jabbi Ham Merikal Me Abibi, Jabam Koi World Literature Kabi syllabus Banai. So the best that has been thought and said, of course, but I think a large segment of it has to be our own literature of all our languages. All our languages. Thank you very much. I think that uh, 
we had a wonderful lecture absolutely it is such comprehensive and such analytical uh, still i think that we would be having many things in our mind so i just you want to meet us so we can agree on that so whatever questions that you would like or there is in your mind i think i we will welcome those questions now so uh, my question will follow a comment also so uh, the first things are uh, no words to give an appreciation for such a nice delivery delivery is like a talk that you have delivered today and i want to say he who has given your name as kapil must have envisioned for like hard hard the forecast like you know seen that this person is going to be a sarvagya one of one of any time why i am telling this is because when shankara criticizes rajnesh ji knows kapila in his brahma sutra bhashya he says sarvagya bhashi tatvat shraddhasu shraddha cha tesu he says kapila is a sarvagya and you have proved today shankara says kapila is a sarvagya he refutes him but he says that he is a sarvagya so starting from socrates through sosur i don't know i am talking the word properly <laughs> till that all the the flow of literature you have that you have told with like the by giving preeminence to sanskrit is a wonderful uh, like you know discourse for all of us on behalf of our vice chancellor and all of us here like we have no words to thank you one thing that i would like to say before i i have no questions you this this is this the the vocalization the the speech vagmaya is a great contribution of india and this starts with the vedas the vedic rishi thought that if you write the vedas the sense will be lost and this is exactly what is reverberated repeated and resonated in socrates and plato plat socrates plato said if you if you speech if you sp yes and if you speech the meaning may be if you write the meaning is lost only in the speech therefore the oral tradition has been the tradition in our country i'll take just one sentence i would say sir this is the reason why the reading the whatever accumulation of knowledge whether you read or you do one thing whatever is in our tradition is called as shravana shravana is the term for reading when you read a book you listen to the thinking of the writer and this is resonated in buddha also buddha never wrote anything buddha never, sir nirgrantha tradition our tradition is the nirgrantha tradition sir wonderfully expressed everything no the asking a question only you will be by you know, expressing my foolishness thank you very much for coming here please do you, keep I, coming i like to add uh, i like to add that uh, very nice sir thank you very much gobri ji i am a very great admirer of yours as you know we have known each other for so long uh, you know uh, avadeshanand ji you know avadeshanand ji juna khada wale he is now the head of the akhadas please please uh, he said in a, one of his early morning discourses that vedas are not meant to be read they are meant to be heard you see dhvani because otherwise it will never become a mantra the written shloka cannot become a mantra mantra it can become only with sound only with sound so it's meant to be shravana shravan hai and uh, you see for example my <laughs> sunny kana chahiye ravinder singh is son of my friend jagbir singh ji who is elder to me by 3 4 years and i can remember ravinder singh was telling mrs kapoor that she says what is it you are writing so much he says he is writing all these things which he will not speak 
<laughs> and he said, I, I know him. He is write, he, what he is writing, he will not speak. So he writes down all that he is not going to speak. So <laughs> it all comes from uh, that, you know, uh, kind of the conflagration of ideas. But, uh, yes, and you see what, unfortunately, our education has degraded memory and memorization. Ratta fication, ratta karte hai. But the same people, when they go to buy a computer, they want large memory. In computer, they want large memory. But in their own case, they don't want to remember, remember 5 into 7 is equal to 35. Then they need a machine. Okay. In Sir. fact, this was, a, this was a strategy to weaken the Indian mind because the Indian mind has been so creative, so creative. You know, once the Prime Minister of Israel, we were earlier one came, and he said that the Swiss, they invented time. The Swiss people. The Swiss invented time, and we, that is the Jews, we invented eternity. Eternity. And I thought to myself, I said, then we, we invented infinity. Anadi Ananta. Isn't it, sir? Anadi Ananta. We invented infinity. So this is all, uh, tradition is very different. I met Peri Sujanan Shastriji when he was 80, 84 year old. Everything he had here. Uh, he had everything here. Seventy nine Kannada. Uh, Hindu Shekhar and uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 okay, uh, sir, uh, can we take questions, sir? Because there is one question here on our live chat. Uh, on our live chat, sir, may I just uh, read the question on our live chat? Uh, 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 so, on uh, the, the YouTube streaming, we have one question. Uh, sir, you referred to some documents signed by William Bentick on April 30, 1835. Which document was it? The English Education Act. Yes. But I kindly inform him yeah. that I may, I may have a little wrong notion about the Governor General. I think it was William Benting, but maybe it was not. But it is English Education Act. The English Education Act, it is a one-page document, and you can download it from internet. And that is, the, that is the education policy, which is still being followed today. 188 years have passed, and we are, our education system is run by that one-page document. It is a very interesting document, you know. Policy. I remember that this NEP, there was a doubt whether it is national education policy or new education policy. And then, you know, one person said that it is national education policy because we are going to have international universities. You see? The proposal to have campuses of international universities. Now, 482 pages, sir, this policy document. At late stage, when some of us got associated, it has been reduced to 60 pages. And if whatever suggestions were made even then had been accepted, it would have been reduced to 15 pages. But so much of chaff, waffle, 422 pages, you know, the, because policy, there is, I, I remember I picked up the 482 page document in a CABE meeting. The CABE is the Council of Central Advisory Board of Education. And then every secretary, education, government of India, states is there, 400 people. And I took a document and I said, Sir, can anyone help me to give me the page number on which there is policy? There is no policy. It is all instrumental scale, quality bada denge, education ki excellence kar denge, grades bada denge, bathrooms bade achche honge. Ye to Sam Petroda ne knowledge commission ki report mein likha tha. Ke jo humari universityya banengi, 
उनके बाथरूम्स इंटरनेशनल स्टैंडर्ड के होंगे नॉलेज कमीशन यू नो तो दिस काइंड ऑफ थिंग यू नो बाफर बनाता और अभी भी आई हैव सेड इट एंड आई थिंक पीपल आई मीन आई डोंट नो दे मे पीपल टेक बट वेन आई इट्स ट्रू रीड दी एन ई पी केयरफुली वट डिड एटीन थर्टी फाइव डू फर्स्ट फर्स्ट सिक्स पॉइंट आर देयर फर्स्ट पॉइंट इज पॉलिसी वी वॉन्ट टू प्रोड्यूस दोज पीपल हु आर इंडियन इन अपियरेंस बट इन ओपिनियंस वैल्यूज मॉरल्स एंड इंटलेक्ट आर ब्रिटिश टिल टूडे यू एंड आई belong to that class you see then how who are these people they they will be our interpreters now there are two words in hindi for interpreters translation exercise deepak two words dalal <laughs> or ek aur dusra shabd hai bicholia dalal aur bicholia ye log jo honge ये रूलर्स के और मासिस के बीच में दलाल और बिचोलिए होंगे उनको बेवकूफ बनाएंगे अभी भी क्या होता है पढ़े लिखे लोग दिल्ली से जे से दिल्ली डी जाते हैं ना गांव में हम अब हम आए हम इनको डेवलप करने ये बड़े बैकवर्ड है यू नो बैकवर्ड है लोग तो उनको हम डेवलप करेंगे यू सी दैट के डेवलप करेंगे वहाँ की जो गाँव की जो बूढ़ी औरत है उसे तो दस आठ आते हैं टेन वो अचार बना लेती है वो कढ़ाई बुनाई कर लेती है वो वाटर मैनेजमेंट कर लेती है वो कितना पानी घर में लगेगा उसको पता रहता है कितनी बीमारी के लिए वो दवाई दे देती है और ये जो हमारी जो पढ़ी लिखी लड़कियाँ हैं हो जाती हैं अच्छा वो उसको उपले भी बनाती है उपले भी बना लेती हैं वो खाद भी बना लेती हैं उससे गोबर से वो मिल्क भी कौ को मिल्क भी कर लेती हैं सब करती हैं How many of these arts? So I told my social sciences करके जो social work करके गई थी teacher लगी थी मैंने कहा well, I am going to take you to the village, but not to teach, but to learn. And I started uh, inviting old women from the village to come to the university and lecture to the girls. You see, so this is how this is the bicholia pan. You know, हम आगे जी अब आप तुम्हारा विकास करेंगे. तो एक गांव में क्या बोली जी अब हम आ गए हैं अब विकास होगा तो कहते हैं बहन जी बड़ी मेहरबानी अभी तक तो लड़कियां ही होती थी <laughs> अब विकास होगा तो यू सी आई मीन दिस इज ए लाइटर साइड ऑफ दिस थिंग देन अच्छा देखिए हम ये बिचोलिए पैदा कैसे करेंगे सी सेकंड पॉइंट we will not teach them in their languages you see and that is the day your languages were assassinated you were distanced from your own self hum aapko language nahi padhayenge kaun si language mein padhayenge some international language and which is better more international than english to english padhayenge third kya padhayenge हम संस्कृत और पर्शियन के ग्रंथ नहीं पढ़ाएंगे हम वेस्टर्न लिटरेचर पढ़ाएंगे वेस्टर्न लिटरेचर अच्छा फोर्थ तो जो पैसा हाँ तो जो इंस्टीट्यूशंस हैं और जो पैसा इंस्टीट्यूशंस पे लगता है उनका क्या होगा जितनी इंस्टीट्यूशंस ये स्कूल्स तोल पाठशाला मदरसे जो हम फंड करते हैं और जो फंड हम पर्शियन संस्कृत की किताबों को छापने में लगाते हैं वो सारा बंद कर देंगे ऑल दैट मनी विल बी यूज टू प्रमोट इंग्लिश बुक्स एंड इंग्लिश लर्निंग सर हो गई ना पॉलिसी क्लियर अभी तक चल रहा है ई ई ई इंग्लिश एजुकेशन एम्प्लॉयमेंट वी आर नॉट ब्रोकन इट और आपकी एन क्या कहती है बड़ा शोर मचा हुआ है ना कि मदर टंग में होगा तीन साल तो हो गए पॉलिसी बने है ना और तीन साल में तो कुछ कहीं मदर टंग नजर नहीं आई अभी एक भाषा समिति बन गई है बहुत बड़ी और 
उसका चेयरमैन गवर्नमेंट से बहस कर रहा है कि मुझे कार मिलनी चाहिए एंड इसी बहस समिति बन गई पर एनईपी वट डज एन ई से प्लीज रीड वेयर एवर पॉसिबल वेयर एवर पॉसिबल The children will be taught in the mother tongue up to class five, maybe eight. ये है the great कितना बड़ा change आ गया है कि no Indian languages will be used wherever possible. English is possible everywhere, but your language is wherever possible. Wherever possible का मतलब क्या है? It will not be done because because in any class small class class 1 there will be some people who come from karnataka there will be somebody who will be there to wo kahenge ji hum kaise hum kaise ye uh, bhojpuri ya bhasha jo hindi hai kaise padhenge ha ha ye bada so let us form a committee hai na abhi bhi committees you have no idea kitni committees ban gayi ek steering committee bani hai fir unhone curriculum committees banayi hai fir unhone sub committees banayi hai है ना तो ये बहुत काम हो रहा है तो वो बच्चा जिसने पूछा बच्चा या बच्ची जो या एडल्ट के भी वो है दी इंग्लिश एजुकेशन एक्ट 1835 उसकी मैंने चार पांच क्लासेस सुनाई ये एक और बची हुई है वो उसके बाद कम दी स्टोरी इज कंप्लीट थैंक यू सर एनी एनी अदर क्वेश्चन प्लीज Russian Good evening sir Good evening uh, my honorable professors my dear vice chancellor sir uh, yes sir sir i'm roshan roshan yadani uh, from school of language and literature uh, sir actually like my uh, the the dean sir already said i also have no questions uh, i want to use a word that i am feeling right now that is mantra mukt Uh, that i am i am a present condition i'm kind of i was last 10 minutes i was speechless i was only thinking of you and your uh, speech i thank again my university and my professors my school to arrange such platforms where we get opportunity to listen to you it's i have said it's my lifetime opportunity sir otherwise <laughs> Yes, uh, you sir. You are from Rajshahi. Sir, uh, sir, I am basically from Dhaka. I was living in Rajshahi uh, before coming here. Sir, uh, I was thinking that if I can continue listening to you the whole night, I will, I will forget everything. My sleeping, my eating, I need not anything. I can listen to you. Thank you uh, very much. That's Thank the way I am Kusha. feeling right now. Kusha. And sir, only one uh, request, or sir, I, my, uh, what should I say? I request. I will say. like the people like us who are still on the way of learning we, we, we think that we have a long way to go uh, my my vice chancellor is sitting beside you he has regarded as young scholar i don't know you will be like that or not sir my we are still very confused sir i want to give you a situation where some of my own professors with due respect to them they are also in, encouraging us to go to west go to west ah. and learn from them otherwise we are feeling uh, sir uh, aside we are feeling separated we are not feeling even we are not regarded as learned enough until or unless we learn from the west yes sir but the trajectory you have presented us the knowledge topography you have showed us today uh, that that doesn't uh, make it obvious that we need to go to them to learn where they are learning almost from us Uh, i am dare to say so in front of you i'm sorry sir so sir what is your advice for us the people yes, who are yes, still yes, confused yes, where yes, to go yes, where yes, to yes, learn yes, who what to do thank you very much well, sir you know, thank you very much thank you very much roshan chitaro blessings to you and uh, the, because you are questioning yourself i'm sure you will not fall a prey to this because you yourself questioning this you know I, we used to say in jnu that if you want to become a professor you need three qualifications hmm? one you should have a phd from america number two you should have a foreign wife 
And number three, <laughs> you should have Marxism as your ideology. So these are, this is the recipe of success, you know, success. West, you know, I have very great reservations because uh, this, is, this is when we say colonized mind. You see, we have become so used to this. We are a subverted, uh, subverted minds and we have not rid ourselves of this because we have not, we have not really studied them. They have studied us very closely, you know. We have not studied them. If we study them, at present, at present, the West for us, mind you, doesn't mean Europe much, no. If, if we do say Eurocentrism, but it is not Eurocentrism. It is Anglo-American centrism. I wish it were Eurocentrism. Then I would have read some German literature, some great French literature, you see. But it is Eurocentrism. I would have read Icelandic sagas, if you know Europe. It's not. So Anglo-American. Now if you go to Anglo-American, it was Anglo, it became American after World War II. Right? It's become American. They, but they, they, are, they don't have their own knowledge culture. They have borrowed everything from Europe. That is, uh, that's true. Now if we go into the history, let's say history of America, you know, they eliminated 17 million Indians, Red Indians, by introducing the a sexual disease and by using the gun. Gun. But those people were the bow and arrow people, 17 million. The Spaniards, when they went to Mexico, they eliminated 36 million Mexicans. Population was 37 million. Now only 1 million Mexicans, you see? Okay, you can say this is old story. Uh, look at the wildlife. In Canada, America, the feed, there are billions of bisons, bisons, you know, those bulls billions. Now you find only their heads in the rooms, dining, dressing, dining rooms. They have been eliminated, killed, you see, whole species killed almost. And so many species have been killed. And if this is old story, then 1940 to 45, six million Jews killed by setting up factories. This is the Western civilization. If you want to learn from it, you are welcome. I don't want to learn anything from them. Hmm? Okay, sir, there is one more question from our uh, uh, audience at large. There is one more question from our audience at large uh, across India and abroad. Uh, this is uh, from Ritu. That Namaste, sir. Is there any theoretical text in Sanskrit to apply to literature as nowadays it is compulsory to analyze a work in theoretical framework and most of them are foreign to our culture? Well, uh, not one. We have a whole tradition of literary theory, texts and thinkers, beginning with the Natya Shastra, second or third century BC, followed by Bhama, then uh, Vaman and uh, and then, uh, I mean, your whole series right up to 1795, Nagesh Bhatta. Huh? You see, you have a whole series. So there is, a, there is a tradition of literary thinking. Seventh century Raj Shekhar, Kave Me Mamsa, very modern text, very modern text. And uh, if, if literary theory interacts with philosophy as it does and grammar, it does. You see, even uh, uh, that uh, Cambridge professor says the India, uh, uh, Western literary theory should go back to rhetoric, you know, which was the original definition of literary theory in the West, Aristotle's time. So the, it interacts. Then, you know, Shlokvartika, Tantravartika, which are philosophical texts, but they deal with issues of epistemology and ontology and contrast with the you perspectives of Buddhist thinking on literature and Indian and so on. So, uh, who was this person? Uh, some Miss Ritu maybe. Ritu is the Haan. only thing written. So, isko ko beta, ek nahi puri tradition hai. 
and you, you can note down should i mention the book indian literary theory acha nahi lagega meri hi kitab ho no no sir 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 that i will mention uh, sir uh, no sir indian literary theory nahi literary theory indian conceptual framework Haan, literary theory indian conceptual framework that is one text you can refer to and that is only and one and it will give you all the ideas no no and there are other articles other books for example sir as uh, professor kapoor our speaker esteemed speaker just now said that uh, the till 1795 no in 20th century also there is a man born known as professor kapil kapoor he has uh, uh, analyzed poems in panchakosha siddhant of uh, shankaracharya so there are several texts that's why i request professor godavari ji to interact more with me at least if not our school so and try to analyze the texts yeah i don't mind <laughs> so and professor rajnish kumar mishra is here uh, that's where i be uh, in the beginning today when i had introduced buddhist theory of meaning and shaiva literary theory because entire uh, work on uh, literary texts uh, is related to aesthetics somewhere aesthetics whether we talk of rhetorics or anything in some aspect of rhetorics so you can refer to the uh, 20th century uh, thinker professor kapil kapoor and his text and his publications so sir it doesn't stop in 1795 <laughs> it continues so are there any other questions no So oh, thank you very much. I am uh, Gordana Jovanović. I am professor of psychology uh, from Serbia, which is a remnant of what is called uh, former Yugoslavia. Uh, I am here uh, as a student uh, in the program of Hindu studies. I am very grateful uh, for such experience of <coughs> listening to a lecture of a learner even though you made some critical comments to the learner i'm grateful <laughs> that you presented learner in the best uh, uh, way uh, i would have many questions but i would like just <coughs> to focus on one you stressed uh, rightly the importance of oral tradition and oral way of uh, acquiring uh, knowledge uh that's certainly very important but in my understanding this is not just a question of epistemology even though verbal testimony is neglected in western epistemology and i think this is one of contributions of indian thought to introduce that into one of the means of uh, of list of uh, of uh, means of acquiring knowledge in my understanding this presupposes a different uh, a way of understanding other people which then means understanding differently communities and finally societies so in my understanding in order to protect us from uh, uh, so called soft form of colonialism we need to change uh, many deep powerful structure which made something or which makes something possible or include and which at the same time excludes so many ideas uh, ways of communication values beliefs languages societies so in my view even you were critical about uh, philosophical uh, uh, request to uh, to change the world i really do believe that we that we need a different world a radically different world and i hope a better world thank you so much i am critical about what different world uh, uh, about the request to change the world so you quoted uh, uh, the uh, the uh, what philo philosophers uh, were done by marx of course Uh, is to interpret the world but the question is how to change the world i understood that you were critical about that wow. yeah thank you very much thank you i i i share your uh, some some your uh, these i share your uh, these uh, thoughts that you have in your mind let me explain because there is not time to go into the details the fact is that indians are still oral people 
you know our culture is still oral in the sense that i gave a very gross example it's a gross example if you go to an indian office ordinary office and you take a written application and put it before the clerk he will push it aside and say what is the matter you see and in europe i have experienced it in germany that when i started talking the lady pushed the paper before me and said put it down put it down you see so it's a very gross example but oral also if you open the television in the morning in india channels you will find 30 40 50 channels where people are giving pravachanas you know they are giving expositions of various texts of various ideas and millions of people listen to them millions kapil kapoor only 30 40 here fine but those people who give oral communication orality is an alternative knowledge culture it's an alternative knowledge culture in the sense that the knowledge is created in the mind by epistemologies which are slightly different in the sense we believe this tradition believes in seeing things with eyes shut seeing things with eyes shut that is chintan and manana chintan and manana it's more like they will see just one one act event thought and they will sit down and they will create a whole universe around it that is why at a time when there were no presses no writing system I mean, no pens and all those things writing we it is not because we didn't we didn't have the scripts because ashoka's inscriptions come in five scripts 400 bc five scripts and panini nastadhyay has seven times used the word lippi script but it is an alternative way in, in fact it is a very economical way imagine it it uh, if you create knowledge in the mind and uh, transfer it by word of mouth by inscribing the knowledge in the mind of a your bright student inscribing that is how it and disseminating also by word of mouth as is done in the morning in fact this technology is absolutely fit for our oral because it is shravya preksha you know it's oral and visual the massive body of literature that has been created in the vedic one my it would have been possible only in this oral manner and if you look at the texts of our texts uh, not that they were not written down we know that when a thinker thinker came up with a idea or a text or a or a theory uh, he would give discourses on it and people from all over india the learned people gurus they would send their brightest disciples to them to him and that person would stay there for a year listen to the discourses understand the theory and then write down a pandulipi manuscript he will put it down in a only when he understood and that is how in 7 8th century from 8th 9th century when we started looking for the manuscripts of abhinav gupta we found them all over india all over india and you know we didn't have access but i'm sure that we will find them in central asia also we'll find them in kabul we'll find them in lahore but we didn't have access we could not go there so the text if you look at an indian text it is very abbreviated text the yoga sutra the, the source text for the cognitive philosophy which is yoga cognition and cognitive philosophy it you can write down in four pages like this in four pages that's all the whole text is in four pages so it is easy to remember memorize so it is kept in the mind and storage in the mind is most dependable every other external medium is subject to decay and damage that is why you see 
I say that Shakespeare's plays were written when Caxton Press was there. But in 20th century, largest scholarship was authenticity of Shakespearean texts. But Rig Veda has come down to us intact for 5,000 years by systems of metaremy and you know all these system sciences which we developed, phonetics, etymology, morphology, and uh, the memorizing systems. You know they they used to permute the text. Let's say the text is A B C D. They will one text is A B C D. Another is A B B A B C C B C D D C. Third will be A B C C B A B C D D C B. Fourth will be still more complicated, like this. And a, a separate permuted text would be memorized by a, another different bright one. So at any given time, you could reconstruct from the body of students the authentic text. Now, Max Muller, 19th century, he is on record, he says, if all the copies of Rig Veda are lost, if all the copies are lost, you can reconstruct Rig Veda from the mind of the Brahmins. You can reconstruct. So it is still there. And why? We have now so many Vedic universities, we have Vedic institutions, but, but nobody, the effect that Vedic knowledge had on the society and the people, it is not there because they are not meant to be read. They are not meant to be read. They are not meant to be written and read. read. And you saw me, I, I didn't refer to any paper. Did I? No. And when I was in Europe once, the, the professor <laughs> who invited me, he told it was a Europe, a Europe a function. Tha. He said, you are going to see a miracle. Professor Kapoor will come. He will come rustling a few sheets and then he will start in a hesitant manner and then he will start get going and you will, you will wait. When will he look at the paper? He will not. This is an art that we have lost. That's what he said. This is an art that we have lost. So you see, even today, with some people like us, it is still oral tradition. And if you ask me now to write down what I said, I can't. I can't. But thankfully, your technology, <laughs> Western technology, is there. They have recorded. <coughs> Somebody can sit down. But I cannot, I, I am not able to recall what I said. So I think, but then, I think your more important part was changing the world or changing the script. You see, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Western mind also now, there is a, uh, there is a cha shifted appreciation comparative of the script and the spoken word. As you said, uh, or you, Prince Godbury said, that Plato says that speech is primary. You see, speech is primary. And uh, there is a shift. And that uncertainty that I said about, because this notion of logos, that fixed meaning, every word has a fixed meaning, there is a fixed something, it has been displaced completely. And this is truer to life, truer to life, truer to life. I don't mean to say, you see, with the, with the large number of students, with a massive body, not everybody having that caliber of mind, you see. But then, but then you know, uh, excellence in knowledge, creative knowledge, is not meant for everybody. It's not, for all the talk we do of equality and all that, you see, the moment you become a good scholar, you are an elitist. There are not many like you. Isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any other question? Yes, one yeah, more. Good evening, and uh, allow me to take 
raise my voice listening to your ideas. You especially hold about the Americans and the Europeans. I'm coming from Europe. I've studied there. I've studied England. Uh, old lore, very ancient Vedic lore, Buddhist studies, and so forth. So this young fellow asked you whether he sh you would advise him to go to Europe, modern day Europe. And you said, these old Europeans have killed millions of people. Don't go there. I wouldn't like to learn anything from them. Actually, sir, I'm from this Europe and have studied and learned many, many years in these institutions. And I've learned, yes, the past days of those Nazis are no more. You still say they are there, yet you accuse me of being a Nazi. I please respect you. Yes, I do. But I also request you to correct your historical yes, view yes, and yes, learn about the point. modern Europe, because this no. mentality yes, is yes, not flourishing and it is not taught at the universities. And if you try to teach it, you're eliminated. I we have, have I this, just a moment, uh -huh. just in order to correct you. We have the speech of freedom, but it is a freedom we have that co reflects plurality and it is a limited democracy we are practicing. So right. elements that go around and try to disturb our I'm constitution that allows for multitude of speeches is not allowed there. So uh, I think it needs some correction of your ideas that modern Germany is still a country of Nazis. Germany, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't name Germany. I didn't well, name Germany. You came very late. I didn't name Germany at all. I didn't well, name Germany. Listen. I don't think you listened to all the lecture. Let me tell you. No, let me respond. I, yes. I, I respect your. Uh, I respect your, and I think uh, there is some uh, some uh, uh, some wisdom in uh, your suggestion that uh, maybe I should modulate my language. You see my language, and when I told that young man not to go there to learn, because you don't have to go there to learn. I can learn. I have learned all the Western knowledge. I have been a. I've been uh, a good student of Western tradition with a great respect for the tradition, but I've done it all by studying here. I never went there to study. I went there to teach, much late, but I never went there to study. So you don't have to go there to learn, number one. Number two, his question was not only this, that uh, he can go and join a university. The point is the attitude. The attitude that as a, as a Bangladeshi national, he cannot become a respectable, self-thinking person unless he goes to an American university and learns. That's not true. That's not true. It's not true. I, I can, I can, I mean, I think, I think very many Indians, hundreds and thousands of Indians, have very great uh, respect for all the three sources of Western civilization. The Judaic, the Christian, and the pagan, the Greek. We have, and we've studied them. We have studied them, but I will not go there, there because it will add to my prestige. And then it will add to my, as, as if you know, it is something which I can't acquire on my own. That is one point. Secondly, I didn't say Germany, I didn't say Nazi, and I didn't use these words. No, you just I spoke was about talking the of, I was talking of the attitude to violence. You see, look at, look at the ethnic tribal wars from the 60s onwards, I have not, seen a year or two where somewhere or the other some western some people particularly are not fighting they are always fighting always fighting the fighting is going on and the crisis the crisis that the civilization contemporary we are a part of it now we are a part of your civilization because we have accepted it and we have in fact in the metropolitan cities we are perhaps much more western than many many, many. i know i have been to places where in the small towns and villages in our places. People live like, uh, you know, in East Europe. East Europe particularly is very, so very different from uh, Poland or Lithuania, Latvia, so much different from the Western Europe. May but I ask then, you, where did the whole May, one yes. moment, one moment. Let me, let me answer your this. <laughs> I did not say, that I did not say, I didn't say that today also they're German and Nazi. No, no, I didn't say that, not at all, not at all. Let me tell you. I perhaps missed that point that the Indian Renaissance, India's Renaissance took place in Germany. It didn't take place in us. 
I did say that. The scholars, you know, how much they have done. In fact, our the Renaissance took place in Germany. So total view. But I was talking about in Indian young Indians, our education instills in them a sense of deep admiration for the West at the cost of cost of inducing in them a sense of inferiority about themselves. That is what needs to be corrected. Yeah, then you must address uh, another issue. Ma I must, ma'am. Yes, sir. okay. I just want, I Holocaust is Holocaust. I would, no, no. Yes, the time is. Let I me know, just but uh, First you of spoke all, about the Holocaust. This, is, this is what happens when you join late in a meeting because you had missed the earlier part when the professor was telling about the, the contribution of the scholars. The he started from Greeks. He started from the scholars in Germany, how they propagated the knowledge and that particular knowledge of Sanskrit went to all the other countries. What he was speaking about was when it came to a university of a JNU, he, he said that three qualifications are almost like known if you are a studying in a foreign university in US, you have a PhD from there, or you have Marxist ideology and a foreign wife, then it is considered that you are a person who would be recognized somewhere I, I in the so you the you missed all that point, from and what? Greek to Roman to right up to Germany. And that is in that connection, the boy asked this question: that should I go to a university abroad? Because his teachers because tell him it is they have to go. You have to go to the west. Go to the west. I said no. So, so there's nothing. No. There's nothing about what you have I been. Didn't learn anything you about maybe okay. this. Thank, thank you very much. Now. And uh, there have been yeah. there has there has been no comment, and particularly you know the stature yeah. of the professor who is here. And you know that he is, yes, he yes. is a person who is respected all over the world for his I not only so. knowledge, but of his observations. He would never make a point against anybody. So please be assured, nothing was talked about what yes, could have so hurt him. Otherwise no, we must invite you. You had all praise for Germany. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about all the scholars, the philosophers, the, the translations that had been done. Okay, I think, thank you so much. So do we have anybody else who would be asking no, something? Okay, sir, yeah. uh, allow me, I, I would yeah, go. Most esteemed Professor Kapoor, Madam Kapoor, Professor Rajneesh Mishraji, Professor Ravinder Singh Ji, our Dean, colleagues, Professor Mohanti, Professor Mishra, Professor Sushant Ji, all the faculty members here and the students. I think that it has been my great privilege to be here, to listen to the wonderful exposition, the lecture, being educated with so many finer things I had missed over the years. It was also a big honor for me to sit, sit next to Professor Kapil Kapoor today. I really feel that I'm very fortunate it is the good fortune of Nalanda University that we have you here and Madam particularly visiting the Nalanda University and participating in this international seminar. The good days for Nalanda are here again. I, th I see your return to Nalanda also. Maybe sometimes in, in your previous birth you might have been here somewhere here around and now you are here for your visit. I think there would not be adequate words with me to appreciate your lecture as well as the wonderful interactions. I think that all those here have benefited. It is benefited it has been educated 
and if I use a very commercial word, profited. So the profit element comes here, the transaction has been very giving from your side and we have made the best of each word and each moment. Your words have come to us, they've fallen on our ears as mantras. So we have the mantra from you, listening to this shavan part of it has been the most beautiful part. They are resonating in our minds, all the aspects that have been touched. Somewhere I see now, today I feel very much convinced that oral history and orality that has been the part of us. I have very commonplace examples for that. When I see that man in somewhere, a common man in a train, in a bus, a vendor, when they have, they give the philosophical approach to their lives by a, some line from a film song, maybe a Raj Kapoor's film, like Jina Isi Ka Naam Hai, or sort of a thing, anything that Sanghar Shaita Jina, and they are the songs. Uh, I remember some time that the, one of those lyricists of Bollywood, Anand Bakshi ji said that uh, all the people have failed in for doing anything for Hindi. What I did, my songs are being, they, they, they are being sung in all parts of the country where they don't even know the language. So I think, as you said, the oral tradition over there. Most of the philosophies and the interpretations which are imbibed are in the pandals where the pravachans are happening. I see that they are, whether you call it as a motivations or motivational talks or maybe say simple religion, but that is also making a big impact and a comeback to philosophy. Uh, this was about the uh, oral tradition that you had mentioned. And the other important thing that I was like, you made me conscious of this is about the education and how it has come to us. It is, and the whole change of scene, particularly the English teaching as you had mentioned, sir. Sir, I would, I remember that even down to the point when what we know as the comics, it had come down to that where we find the pictorial with the dialogue, with the balloons giving the, the the dialogues, that was impacting us from our childhood. It could be the illustrated classics, those concise, expensive comics. It could have been Phantom, it could have been Mandrake, or it could have been anything like uh, Archie's. It took a long time for Chacha Chaudhary to come and replace it. After, after a great time, Pran, who was one of the finest person that Pran did it. Now, incidentally, it also comes to me that the, one of the art form supplements and somewhere keeps the art of the other form in its place. Like in, in the art of India, the ancient art of India, I think the, all the philosophy and all the, um, uh, the aesthetics are somewhere represented and that's a repository. It needs somebody to check it, just as we, today we go to a Q, QR code and something, we get it back. In the way that reminds of the art. We had a lecture here sometimes from a Korean professor who mentioned that all the Buddha religions, all the eight parts of his important events in his life are at one place. So we do a Tirth Yatra looking at the image of the Buddha. In the same way, we have fashioned the art aesthetics and the literary part in the aesthetics also we find there. So one can be transformed and has been kept and uh, it would like, I would think that we would think about it further now because you have awakened us to this idea. I also, uh, again, think that what I have 
taken from here is like somewhere a rethought about what is popular and what is classic. Because what is popular at one time becomes a classic at another time. And I think when Goswami Tulsidas Ji was the composing, I don't know, I don't think that he was thinking whether he's doing a classic or he's doing a popular service. I would use the word service. But, you know, it, it's a classic and a popular service both. It has stayed for so many years. So I think it is more on the content of the literature or the content that has carried it, given it the strength over the ages. I, I, earlier when we were having the, the Professor Mishra speaking there, early in the lecture, about the Leela that you had mentioned. I think that the Leela is again a very interesting thing. And uh, there's a Leela of time somewhere. The time plays a Leela. The forgetting something, of course, uh, could have been the, uh, what you say, the curse of the Rishi. But here, I think that the time also plays a factor where it, it, it may be indicated that over time people change, the, the recognitions and are affected by that. But then there's something, the commitment stays. The ring is a commitment. So the commitment is there, whereas faces and time, they make us change. And when we are reminded, the identities come. That commitment is a spoken word which, is, which comes up. The, the ring has a significance. Uh, Sita also, like, when she sees, recognizes that it is coming from Sri Ramji. Uh, so the commitment here is again a spoken word, sir. You know it. The, when we say Zuban Dena is that giving is, was enough. And what Megasthenes said that they don't write, they do their transactions, business transaction by word of mouth. That's what he, he was referring. Uh, so coming back, in a circle, I think that we, this is the most important aspect. And we somewhere, uh, because of the f requirements of these uh, legal requirements somewhere, uh, we have uh, given ourselves to writing and swearing affidavits, signing documents. Whereas uh, the, the whole, the same tradition which was an oral tradition also had its sanctity because the people were ethically conscious about what they say. And language, words, and the, the perfection even of the tongue, to, uh, the, the ucharan and everything, I think that, that's the reason we had been so many conscious because the uh, kum, uh, kumkaran suffered because of that, the wrong ucharan. So I think that is why we also, when we pray to the goddess also, we say that, uh, was, Shamasu Saraswati Ji ke Aradhana where it comes there. Right. Uh, I think that it has been a big treat for us, sir. It's a pleasure. It has been a great experience. And uh, this sort of experience in learning, I think that is the tradition of Nalanda. Uh, you have awakened us. You have not only awakened us, I think that you have given us so much good visions to think on and uh, we always will be indebted for this. I think I must thank profusely to the School of Languages, Literature and Humanities, the Dean, Professor Mohanty, and of course, Professor Sushant Mishraji for organizing this beautiful event. This event has all, I think, set the tone. We would surely be having more of such events and not only in the school of start on this uh, languages and literature but into other schools also very soon. I think we will follow with more events and to you sir and to professors who have uh, visited us prof uh, of course uh, madam was also there uh, madam Tripathi is also there uh, keep visiting Nalanda. I think that your visits would always enrich us. Thank you very much, all the students, everyone. Thank you.
So thank you, sir, uh, for giving us the opportunity to listen to such great scholars. I thank my vice chancellor. And uh, there was supposed to be valedictory and certificate distribution, but that uh, cannot happen uh, for one simple reason, that certificates are not ready, and that is also a very interesting reason. We have to resolve it. But the technical reason, since we have many people online also who would like to know about this when certificates are being given. So that is uh, something very important. And I would request my vice chancellor, I would draw my, the attention of my vice chancellor also on that. Though the text was approved, but uh, in the text I had written uh, Nalanda University, uh, Bharat. We had discussed, my, my, the person who worked with me, Pooja, is here. So since I had written Nalanda University, Bharat, uh, the administration has now detected that, that we sh whether we should write India because it is written in the act or we should write Bharat. They asked me to change. I said, no, no, I will not change it immediately. It must uh, be deliberated and then decided whether we live in, because I saw G20 also here also. In, uh, in this university, I saw that we were Bharat. So whether that uh, program was erroneously done in India or I don't know, or uh, in the university or whatever. So it must be resolved uh, because I told them that that is the spirit of the conference also. And that has been the spirit that uh, uh, I was reminded of a novel which Sir taught us by Dickens, Dombey and Sons. The empire goes to the world, but you can't even talk to your own daughter. For whatever desires that are there remain unfulfilled. So <laughs> that should not be our situation. We should be allowed to be in Bharat, but as soon as it is resolved, we will distribute the certificates. I am grateful. This is also a moment to thank everyone. Uh, those who are not here, our registrar, he has taken keen interest in his absence also. He has been present. So absence is present. Rajneesh, he always talks of it, Apoho. So through absence, he has been present. Uh, at everything, he kept his tab. Uh, whenever any requirement was there, he was available. Uh, electronically and he did provide us a full support similarly all the administrative staff where I faltered Aditya ji is smilingly sitting here he advised he will come and whisper something so Aditya ji Anil ji since they are sitting here so I am naming them but who whom to name my colleagues Kumudacharya ji is here Pooja is here and all those committee members uh, our my two colleagues Sismita ji and uh, Divya ji are here, Dr. Islam, who is not here, uh, Dr. Shrisha, who is not here, and several other colleagues uh, from uh, my uh, academic fraternity and my administrative colleagues, uh, functionaries of the university. Uh, two names I have mentioned, there are other names also, Ambika ji, who has been instrumental in taking all the approvals, and uh, I never made any papers, it is he who did everything. So I have no words to thank many persons, Sagar ji, Prasoon ji, whole day you can see him standing here. Our drivers, our technician, Sunny, he is uh, standing here right from the morning and telling me that, sir, more than 800 people have joined. Yesterday, uh, around 500 joined and I kept on uh, getting the request that, uh, sir, we are not getting the link. Because yesterday there was a confusion due to that online session. We sent the WebEx link and it, uh, so I can see uh, perhaps that is the impact, and they all have actively interacted. As you saw the, in the session today also, sir, that you got so many questions. So they all have been actively interacting. It is not just passive listening. Uh, that is a very important test, because I worked in uh, distance education and how, how the, our channels, educational channels, are being received. There are various parameters. So one parameter is here, the active interaction of the so many questions came. Of course, uh, here also I can see the the, the kind of debate that are generated. I hope these debates will be reverberated. And uh, if I have missed some names, I, I am very grateful to the students who have been there. And uh, I might have missed a few names because, you know, at the end of uh, the day, not only today, but I have been working for last few days uh, on some other uh, things apart from my regular duties related to the conference. Uh, so I may have forgotten some names, 
but I am generally thankful to all the administrative staff. Yes, sir? No, no, uh, I will not forget her, sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am not going to be Dushyant. So <laughs> uh, because forgetting her would be forgetting myself, that I said already. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, so all my uh, academic colleagues, all my administrative colleagues, I am grateful and as now that direction also. You see how meticulously my vice chancellor supervises me. It is a proof. <laughs> so I am thankful to uh, Jaya ji also. Uh, <laughs> thanks to her that I am here. <laughs> so, oh, uh, and then uh, if I have forgotten anyone, then uh, I express my gratitude and thank and want to Prince and such other old students. Again, I was forgetting. So my old students of this university, they have been very instrumental and everyone has been very encouraging and cooperative to me uh, for full semesters and every, at every moment, whenever I required anything, they are there to help me. So I am grateful, I am thankful. Uh, Heitman, she prepared such a, at a very short notice when I requested happening, she very enthusiastically took it and they all, uh, contributed in various ways, Puja and others, they all contributed in various ways to the conference. Uh, and uh, still if I am forgetting someone, then I express my gratitude and thanks to all those who names start uh, or end, or start and end, both with uh, the alphabets, the, the letters of the English alphabet A to Z. So <laughs> in case if I forget someone, uh, I am grateful, sir, that uh, Professor Kapoor, Professor Ravinderji, Professor Tripathi, Madam, and uh, of course, uh, I have, uh, see, I have forgotten my deans. See, I have forgotten, the, I, uh, I forgot to mention my deans. Professor Mohanty is, uh, has been always encouraging you. Whenever I went with any paper, he said, just go ahead. He, Maybe one word of advice was there, but he never stopped me at anything. Maybe not even more than two minutes. So at every moment, Professor Godavrish, sir, he has been there and whenever I went, Karlo, that's how he talks, Karlo. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes he, he has been so generous that I take liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, but uh, they all have been very, very um, kind to me and to the entire organizing committee. So I'm grateful uh, to all. Uh, I am grateful to registrar. I'm grateful to all the administrative and academic fraternity who simply whispered in my, uh, so is whispering an epistemic uh, uh, means of knowledge or not? I learned, yes, it is here. So, but just by whispering, they uh, changed uh, worlds. They <laughs> And uh, I, just as you, sir, I also realized the new meanings of the word protocol. So our protocol officers are there. <laughs> they have helped me at every point. And you know how meticulously everything, each and every moment was organized uh, by uh, the entire administration. And they helped us, our students. They helped uh, uh, all things very smoothly. So with uh, all, all, uh, and now we come to the closer, and I invite you, we invite you, they all have organized for tea. Prasoonji and others, they all are ready f with the tea. Uh, so we can join for the tea now. But formally, it comes to an end. Certificates we will resolve and we will give. Okay. So anything else that I'm forgetting, Radnesh ji, sir? We can go, sir, now. We can leave. Okay. Thank you.